Councillor Hamilton, just doing a quick test if you're on the Google Hangout. Me? Yeah, I'm here. Great, thank you. Um, are you already logged into eScribe? We're just doing a quick test before we get started. Uh, no, I'm not. Do you want me to yeah. do it now? Yeah, that'd be okay. great. Thanks so much. And Councillor Cartmell, I, I see you. Are you with us? I am. I am, yes. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Are you seeing a vote up on your screen? We can see you logged into the system. Uh, not yet. That was me. I voted for him. This tends to um, let me vote once and then I can't vote again without restarting the app. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, I'm, we're going to close the vote and just we're still waiting for the mayor. So I'm going to get Tracy to send out another quick vote. Councillor Cartmel, I'd like to see if your system's working because I imagine we might be using it a few, few times today. Well, like I said, it, you know, it works once and then it stops working. So I pretty much have to restart the app and sometimes reinstall the app between each vote to get it to work. Are you on an iPad? Yeah. Okay. Just confirming that I'm logged into eScribe and, uh, and I just voted. Yep, we can see you. Thank you so much. Eileen, do you see me? Voted. Yes, can, yes, Councillor Bing. So once uh, once you're all logged into eScribe, I get an icon beside your name. What we're testing right now is we've got a couple people in chambers just getting set up. So I just want to see if they're not set up when we start the vote, if the vote actually does pop up on their screen. The mayor's just Thank arrived, so we'll probably be doing roll call in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Well, I'm not seeing a vote, Eileen. Okay, we... We're just closing the vote. Um, I know that they just provided um, some updates with eScribe, so on my, I, my iPad's quite old, so I actually had to uninstall the app and reinstall it. Councillor Cartmel, do you, do you want me to get uh, Yasser to no, give you I, a call offline? No, I don't need, I don't need help. It just doesn't work. Uh, so I'll try uh, reinstalling the app. Okay. I think Yasser's in the room as well. We'll see if there's an issue on our end. I'm, I, it's working on my iPad, but uh, the mayor's just talking to somebody and we'll be getting started in a couple of minutes. Okay. What a week. And it's only Wednesday. So I will uh, call this. Did you have anything else, Madam Clerk? And we have a request to speak. And we have a wee speech for you. All right. Well, I will uh, call the December 9th and perhaps, perhaps not December 11th. We'll see how it goes. Uh, uh, City Council budget meetings uh, to order. Uh, I'll recognize that we're having today's council meeting uh, on Treaty 6 land, which is the traditional territory of the Cree, the Dene, the Soto, the Blackfoot, and the Dakota Sioux peoples, as well as one of the great Métis Nation homelands. Um, I will just uh, say, um, at the risk of uh, over-optimism, that my over-under is uh, Friday at 3 p.m. <laughs> so... Uh, I, I hope, uh, usually I'm, I'm wrong on the optimistic side, um, but uh, it is in our hands. Uh, you know, we have lots to work through here, um, but uh, there is a pathway to getting a decision this week and not having to come back next week. But ultimately, colleagues, that is in your hands. Um, I'll now roll call uh, to check that we have everyone here, I imagine we do. Uh, Councillor Zadig. Here in Chambers. Welcome. Councillor Essinger. 
Good morning. Morning, Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Morning, Councillor Henderson. Yep, I'm here. Uh, morning, Councillor Knack. Good morning. Thank you, Councillor McKean. Morning. Morning, Councillor Nickel. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Walters. Good morning. Indeed it is. Uh, Councillor Banga. Present, Your Lordship. Excellent. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Katarina. Good morning. That is a full deck. Um, so, I will now ask for a motion to adopt the agenda. There are several additions to the agenda, which is mostly recognizing other reports coming from other places, um, previously postponed, um, a couple of new items, just to tidy everything up. So, with all the additions, Councillor Essinger? I will move that the December 9th, uh, 2020 City Council meeting agenda be adopted with the following changes. A six point uh, additions for 6.1 uh, fall 2020 Supplemental Operating Budget Adjustment, 6.2 Planning and Development Business Model, 6.3 Proposed Fiscal Strategy, 6.5 Waste Fiscal Policy, 6.6 Waste Services 2021 Rate Filing, 6.7 Blatchford Renewable Energy, 6.8 Blatchford District Energy Utility, 6.9 Blatchford Renewable Energy uh, Capital Budget Adjustment, and 7.2 Bylaw 19494. Thank you. Uh, on the agenda as proposed, unless there are any questions, and with thanks to the Utility Committee for burning the uh, utility oil, I guess, last week. Please vote. Yes. We're phasing out home heating by oil, so... Councillor Hamilton? It didn't show up on my screen, but I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Yeah, same thing, yes. Thank it you, was Councilor working just fine when we were testing it. Councillor McKee? Same thing and yes. Thank you so much. We have all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. <clears throat> Agenda carries unanimously. No minutes. Uh, and no protocol items. However, uh, now would be a good time to uh, outline the process. Clerks have given me some notes here. So welcome to the um, first day of our budget deliberations on the fall 2020 supplemental budget adjustments. Uh, so just reminding you a little bit about the process. With the adoption of the agenda, Council suspended some rules under the uh, Council Procedures Bylaw. This means that one, a Councillor who moves a main motion may also move amendments to it. Two, Councillors may debate the merits of both the amendment and the main motion. Um, I'm going to say in certain circumstances. Um, and three, several amendments can be made and postponed prior to the vote on the amendments. We will begin the meeting with a presentation from administration that will cover the capital and operating budget adjustments and new inf any new information that's come up along the way. Uh, Edmonton Police Commission budget discussions are time specific today for 1.30 p.m. After the presentation from administration, the main capital budget adjustment motion may be put on the floor. We'll deal with capital questions and amendments. First, voting will be postponed until all amendments are on the floor. The vote on the main capital budget adjustment motion <coughs> pardon me, may be postponed until after the operating budget adjustment is also dealt with. We will then move to the operating questions and amendments, and once again, voting will be postponed until all amendments are on the floor. After voting on all amendments is complete, we'll vote on the main budget adjustment motions. A reminder that a procedure has been developed to pilot a hybrid uh, of the randomized draw process to deal with budget amendments. <coughs> Once all the amendments are on the floor, Council can decide whether we wish to use this process. I suspect there will only be maybe half a dozen to a dozen. Uh, and once we see them all, they, they may all have sufficient context that they may not require randomization. However, once we have given last call for operating budget amendments uh, and capital if there are any, um, we can uh, quickly pause to see if we wish to use the randomized draw process uh, or if we'll just go with them in the order in which they're, um, they're put. Uh, or if we want to sort them, uh, cuts first, adds next, or vice versa. Um, it's, it's ultimately all up to Council. 
Uh, I will just point out one more thing before taking some process questions, if there are any, which is that a reminder again that um, the four-year budgets were passed uh, two years ago. Um, and our purpose here is to modify those rather than relitigate the entire budget. Um, hence, having two days uh, set aside to do this, albeit um, 9.30 to 9.30, 12 hour days if necessary. Um, and to some degree, everything is on the table. At least that's the direction that we gave administration. And so I think they have looked at the whole table on our behalf. It's perfectly in bounds to ask questions about all of that and beyond to what they didn't propose. Uh, because we asked them to take a priorities-based approach and, and they have done that and explained that well. Um, but I certainly think several rounds of questions about that and, and uh, sort of flipping over all the couch cushions, as it were, is in order today. Um, but uh, just a gentle reminder that we are not starting from, uh, 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 from a blank sheet, as it were. We're starting from heavy modification to the previously approved budgets. Um, so so uh, with that said, I'll now check in to see if there are any questions on the process for today and Friday if necessary. Just a quick note that the suspension of the rules weren't actually passed as part of the agenda, so if somebody wouldn't mind moving them oh. at the bottom of your summary of agenda. So please. moved. Thank you, Councillor Nickel. Second. Seconded by Councillor Banga. Um, any questions on the suspension of the rules? Can we add that the uh, uh, chair not have to leave? If that is the will of council, we're happy to take that amendment. Well, it's just more committee style, so is that friendly? Okay. All right. Um, it'll just be faster. So, um, oh. okay. On, on that or on the... Okay, well, uh, or if it's on the overall budget, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. So we've just got suspension of the rules, your motion, uh, with the third bullet on uh, uh, chair doesn't have to leave um, during debate. So uh, any questions on suspension of the rules? Not seeing any, please vote. Yes. Is it coming up? The vote is live, Mr. Mayor. We're just waiting for a couple more. I'm a yes. Didn't show up. Thank Didn't you, Councilor. Didn't show McKee. up for me. Oh, here it comes. Um, it just as a point of order, if it's of use, um, I got it to come up by pressing the vote in progress flashing thing at the top. So it often comes up by itself, but it came up for me when I pressed that, if that's of help to anybody. Thank you. Are you able to vote, Councillor Henderson? <laughs> Didn't I? Said I did. It's probably on its way. And we're just waiting for Councillor Katarina. Uh, I tried Ben's suggestion but uh, and voted, but uh, yes for me. Thank you. We did mine come through? Uh, it just did. We took care of that for you. Thank you. It's that country <coughs> internet, Ben. Please uh, display the vote. That's carried. Thank you. Um, so, uh, pro additional process questions, Councillor Nichol. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Laughlin, last year I raised the issue of the bylaw regarding fees and licenses. Uh, I don't see that bylaw in front of us. Uh, so, what? Because last year, if we remember, I think we missed it. And so where is the uh, bylaw for the fees and licenses part of uh, the changes that we're making? Just give us a moment here and we'll see if we can get that for you. Can we put a pin in that question for a minute? Yeah, because I think we can come back to it because that's an implementation mechanism for all the decisions that, that are taken. Um, I just thought so administration should be aware of that. So we just caught it this morning, just asking the no, question. No, fair. Um, um, once we once we get into questions on on the items themselves, I think that's perfectly in order. Um, but thanks for the heads up on that. Any other process questions? Well, I just I'm wondering what to do with all the work that we did in the, in the utility committee. If there aren't any further questions on it, we could clear those out of the way. 
Um, well, what we'll we'll test that when we select items for debate. If no one selects okay. the utility items, we can approve them uh, at the outset. And I'll go to you for motions on those. But if there are selections for voting, we can still do them up early. If there are selections for debate, uh, then we'll we'll deal with them in the order that they're presented. Fair. Perfect. Thank you. Cool. Any other process questions? Um, Councillor Walters noted that the RTSC item is time specific for Friday. Um, uh, which means it, it uh, probably, yeah, it's a must be select councillor. So if you want to select that. And just to note, it can't be voted on today. It is time. It needs to be dealt with yeah. on Friday morning. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, let's, let's open the uh, speakers list for selections then. No selections? Okay. So I want to move <laughs> the whole package. I'm on the board. We got a Councillor Walters. We got a couple of nips and tucks to make here, I think. So, uh, Councillor Walters, what would you like? Well, I guess I'll take good old 6.1 and 6.3, uh, 6.4, just because it has to be selected. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nicol. Sorry, can you turn your microphone on, sir? Yes, I guess uh, we're all going to vote on 6.6 .6 through uh, 7.2, so that'll come to a vote, I guess. Okay, but you want those uh, sectioned off for voting purposes? Yes, please. So the utility items as a as an omnibus. Still? Yes, please. Okay. I would appreciate that. Thank uh, you, sir. Does anybody wish to select any of the utility items for um, anything other than voting purposes? Okay, and and w perhaps when we get to them, we'll see whether uh, p folks wish to. Does anyone wish to pull out any one of these specific, or are we okay voting on the utility items um, omnibus? I'll let you think about that for a minute. Well, well, because uh, when when we get into it, there can be a request to divide if necessary. So, but it sounds like so far there isn't. Uh, okay, so then uh, six two and six five have not been selected. Does someone want to move those? I'm happy to move them. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Second. Seconded by Councillor McKean. Please vote on the Planning and Development Business Model Proposed Fiscal Strategy in 6-2 and the Waste Fiscal Policy in 6-5. That's, that's intentional. Councillor Nickel. We have all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. It's a good start to the day. 13 nothing for that. Um, I'm happy to move 6-6 uh, six, six to 6-9. Six, uh, hold on just a sec before we get into the rest of those. We just uh, have a request to speak, if you yeah, wouldn't mind, yeah, possibly. Yeah, I, I want to deal with that. Okay. We did have one request to speak from uh, Laurie Cunningham-Shepley from the Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues. Uh, I would um, note that we heard from uh, her and from the organization during the budget public hearing previously on this. Um, but if anyone wishes to move to add a speaker, they may. Not hearing uh, such a motion. Um, we thank the EFCL for its continued interest in our partnership. Um, uh, and we'll follow up offline, presumably. Uh, request for time specific. The only one that was already approved with the agenda is that we will deal with 6.4 sometime on Friday morning. Um, uh, exactly when uh, we will choose 
uh, when we come to it on Friday morning, depending on what else is happening in the flow of our meeting and in the flow of their meeting. And just a friendly reminder, we have another item that we do need to add on Friday morning, but it's just not quite ready yet. Right, right. There, There's always a little bit of emergent business at the last meeting of the year, so stand by for that. Okay, uh, Councillor Henderson, you want to move 6-6 uh, six, six through... Uh, well, well, do you want me to do the bylaws first? Um, there are also both is, utility is committee order, bylaws. I can do them in matter. either order. Could we do the reports and then if reports and then bylaws? We'll I'll move, by move the reports then, uh, which are uh, six six through uh, six nine. Six to six nine. Yep. So and they're ex raft uh, seconded by Councillor McKean, I think. Please vote. We have all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Display the vote. Uh, that's carried 11 to 2. Uh, blessings upon the Utility Committee for that work last week. Thank you. Uh, and Councillor Henderson, um, first reading of 7 1 and 7 2. I will move first reading of uh, uh, bylaws uh, 7 1 and 7 2. Second. Thank you. Uh, please vote on first reading. Just waiting for one more. Councillor Walters? Yeah, I'm still waiting. Uh, yes. Thank you. We have all the votes, Mr. Display the okay. vote. Carried. Second reading. I'll move second reading of bylaws uh, 7 1 and 7 2. Second. Um, please vote. We're just waiting for one. <sighs> Mr. Mayor, we've got all the votes. Display the vote. It's carried 11 to 2. Move consideration of third reading for 7 1 and 7 2. Second. Please vote uh, on consideration. Good to go. Display the vote. That's carried unanimously. And third reading, Councillor? Uh, third reading of bylaw. 19406 and bylaw 19494. Second. Please vote. We're good to go. Display the vote. That's carried 11 to 2. Okay. So that's a good chunk of work done, but we still have plenty ahead. Let's now uh, hear uh, the uh, supplemental ad information from administration on um, the operating and capital. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, good morning. Uh, before we begin deliberations, we appreciate the opportunity to present an overview of the, the draft budget adjustments for uh, the capital and operating budgeted budgets. Uh, in chambers today, uh, Mary Pearson, our CFO, uh, members of her team, Stacey Padbury and Harm Rai, um, other members of ELT and other support staff are on uh, virtually. And a thank you to the executive leadership team, Stacey, Harm, and all staff that contributed to bringing forward a budget adjustment that we feel balances the need to adapt in the current environment and respond to the large shocks uh, from the pandemic with our commitment to achieve Edmonton's strategic goals and objectives. I would also like to thank the members of the public and stakeholders who provided their perspective on this challenging budget. 
these challenges are amplified further after yesterday's announcement of the additional restrictions and the resulting pressures that will be created for many Edmontonians. Bringing a 0% tax levy budget for 2021, which is comprised of approximately 56 million of ongoing service reductions, is needed. But we recognize that adjustments will need to be made and we look forward to that discussion with Council today. Mary's going to provide an overview of the potential of available ongoing funding uh, based on some uh, adjustments that could be made. She'll provide an update on the financial stabilization revert, reserve, um, other needs that have been identified, and an overview of the operating impacts of capital. Katrin will provide an overview of some of what we heard from the budget public opinion survey. And to end, Kim will provide an overview of the composition of our workforce and vacancies. And with that, I will now turn it over to Mary. Thank you, Adam. Uh, to build on what Adam was saying, there are two key financial frames being brought forward in 2021. COVID-related one-time costs and changes to the base budget to reduce the 2021 tax increase. For the ongoing reductions, the current focus is to achieve a 0% tax increase to recognize the fiscal realities of businesses and residents. This includes permanent reductions or reductions to evaluate then reintroduce programs until next, the next budget cycle. As a reminder, any ongoing adjustments require ongoing funding from the tax levy. There are some other potential ongoing reductions that Council could consider prior to deliberating the budget. First. The Edmonton Public Libraries has offered to reduce their budget on an ongoing basis by 2%, which is 1.1 million ongoing reduction to the operating budget starting in 2021. The EPL Board has provided a letter to Council discussing this potential reduction. We are extremely thankful to the e to EPL for considering this for 21 and 22 uh, for the corporate budget reduction exercise. Secondly, Based on decisions made by Council for funding of Explore Edmonton, there is a potential for additional ongoing funding reductions from financial strategies to contribute towards the 2021 ongoing budget reductions, ranging from zero to 1.75 million. Council could debate and pass these two items prior to deliberating the other fall SOBA, as they will provide additional ongoing budget reductions that will set the stage for the remainder of the budget deliberations. With respect to the one-time adjustments, on December 7th, Council approved the base one-time adjustment from the effects of COVID. This considers the one-time revenue adjustments and expense adjustments recommended as a baseline for 2021. With that, there is 53 million in the allocated FSR, but as well as some emerging requests, such as the Explore Edmonton one-time funding and the YMCA request. And these are for Council to discuss. We'll highlight there's also 49.9 million in combined funds available in the pay-as-you-go and neighborhood renewal reserves from the use of the provincial MSP funds. We have these set aside for COVID financial challenges and upcoming risks that were discussed on mon Monday, such as government transfers. Additionally, other one-time funds needed, not, not specifically related to COVID, could be managed through one-time funding sources, including the use of the unappropriated FSR and the 11 million in funding previously removed from the EPS budget set aside in financial strategies. As per the motion passed by Council on July 7th, the 11 million in funds can be used uh, for support of housing construction grants and to fund programs and partners within the community development, human services, and social safety net ecosystem. One-time funding, specifically use of the FSR, needs to be used with caution. As you have seen from past experience, COVID impacts can be difficult to predict and are subject to large change. So additional one-time funding may be required through 2021. So with that, on Monday, we reported that the year-end projected balance of the unappropriated FSR was 140.2 million. This would have made just under 25 million in one-time funds available before the FSR would fall below its minimum balance of 115.3 million. Based on more recent approvals, the use of the unappropriated FSR, as of November 30th, the year-end projected balance has been updated to 133.5 million, allowing the one-time of uh, 18.2 million. That said, there was also um, 
today the planning and development business model that was before City Council recommended 4.8 of the FSR be used over 2021 and 2022. So that brings that down to 13.4 million. But that said, uh, the year-end tax-supported deficit has not been reflected in the year-end projection of the FSR. So due to fluctuations in the number, we do not update the FSR balance until year-end results are finalized. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Owen, who will talk about the public opinion survey regarding the budget. Good morning, Council. Administration has proposed budget amendments that hold the line on taxes because economic indicators suggest that Edmonton businesses and households are struggling with the financial effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we sought to confirm whether the actual experience of Edmontonians reflects what the current economic data tells us. And to do that, we conducted a public opinion survey from November 5th to 15th of this year. We crowdsourced the responses through numerous communications channels, including social media promotion, invitations to stakeholder groups, and an invitation to the Edmonton Insight community members. And we received 4,400 responses. A large number of overall respondents, 42%, indicated their personal financial situation has become worse in the past 12 months, mostly as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Maintaining the current tax levy for 2021, that being a zero percent tax increase, is preferred by 45 percent of all respondents, followed by 31 percent who would like to see an increase to the tax levy, and a further 17 percent who would like to see the tax levy decrease. Breaking down the respondents into various groups, the highest level of support for a tax increase is among those who rent residential property, that number being at 39%. Those who own commercial property or own or manage a business in the city are most likely to support a tax decrease at 29%. I should note that the majority of respondents in this group own or manage a business. We had a small number of responses from commercial property owners. Also note that those who have seen their financial situation become worse are more likely to indicate that they would like to see a tax levy decrease. Back to Mary. Thank you. Um, on October 28th, Community and Public Service Committee passed a motion to bring forward funding for Alberta Avenue and Jasper Place revitalization groups for 2021. The intent was that this would be supported by carry forward of 2020 funds currently appropriated in the FSR. In 2020, there were 521,000 in one-time funds appropriated in the FSR to fund programs and resources needed to the revitalization groups. Grant applications received for November 15th intake deadline will use all of the remaining 2020 funds, leaving no carry forward funding to support the Alberta Avenue and Jasper Place revitalizations going forward. So based on current information, this funding will be fully utilized and no longer be available moving forward. From 2021 onwards, there's no longer specific funding directed to Alberta Avenue and Jasper Place revitalizations. They would continue to be supported by existing neighborhood renewal coordinators and grant programs available to all neighborhoods within the program. If Council chooses to fund Jasper Place and Alberta revitalization work for 2021, a motion must be brought forward indicating a source of funds and whether the funding is one time or ongoing. My last slide before I turn it over to Kim is to honor our request for the operating costs of capital. This table reflects the best estimates for operating impacts of capital for those projects that are in construction or have not yet started construction. To compile this information, we needed to make certain assumptions. Operating impacts of capital were assessed for growth projects. Impacts for renewal would be minimal or contained within the existing budgets. With the growth envelope, the assessment was completed on standalone growth projects. These are projects that are closer to delivery and we have a better idea of the operating impacts of capital. Many of the growth composites are still in the planning and design phase. Estimates of operating impacts of these capital will not be, will not be more certain until projects enter the delivery phase and are separated in their own individual standalone profiles. These are net incremental operating impacts of capital. 
Many growth projects have operating effects that will be managed within operating budgets and will not have new incremental operating impacts. The numbers shown on this slide do not include debt servicing charges for projects funded with tax-supported debt. The operating effects of capital for the LRT projects are mostly related to operators, transit peace officers, maintenance, and utility costs. The transit smart fare operating costs are for system operator fees and merchant fees. For Windermere Fire Station and Coronation, the incremental operating costs would largely be for staffing, maintenance, and utility costs. The other category includes various other growth projects with individually smaller operating impacts of capital. For road growth projects, including Twilliger Drive project, an assumption was made that the net incremental operating impacts of capital for items like increased road maintenance costs would increase by 1% of the total project costs. Again, as these projects get closer to their service dates, more refined operating effects of capital will be available. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kim. Thanks and good morning. In recent presentations to Council, we discussed several initiatives that impact our city workforce, each of which is independent, yet together they are aligned with the city plan, Connect Edmonton, and the need to achieve fiscal efficiencies within this budget cycle. Committed budget reductions. To achieve the previously approved 2021 and 2022 budget, Workforce reductions are required in each of these two years, totaling 103.2 FTE and resulting in a savings of 12.3 million. COVID-19 impacts. As you are aware, COVID-19 has reduced our revenue and increased our operating costs. It has resulted in more than 2,600 temporary layoffs. And as of November 6th, 1,324 employees cannot return to work as we are unable to resume full service delivery. The most recent announcement of additional restrictions will result in additional temporary layoffs associated with the closure of our rec centers. As we have previously discussed with you, we recognize that permanent layoffs may be required in the future. Next, we have the council motion in relation to supervisor reductions. This motion is associated with the city auditor's recent productivity audit. As supervisory FTEs are being reduced, restructuring is required to realign work to a 5% or 10% reduced supervisory structure. We have the 0% budget exercise. In order to achieve a 2021 0% tax increase, we need to further reduce 347.2 tax levy funded FTEs, which equates to approximately $34 million in budget savings starting in 2021. These FTE reductions result from all budget reduction strategies presented in the fall 2020 SOBA, not only the workforce strategies. These FTEs are included within the overall FTE reduction of 338 identified on page two of attachment three of the fall 2020 SOBA with further details in attachment four provided to council. Next, corporate realignment. The corporate strategy transformation program and other significant organizational design initiatives will create administrative efficiencies and assist in achieving workforce reductions. Next, reimagine services. Five service reviews are currently being conducted to ensure we are efficient in the services we provide. Enterprise Commons will involve a review of workflow management and will begin to provide associated administrative efficiencies by 2023. And finally, PBB the full priority-based budgeting process being implemented for the 2023-2026 budget will provide an opportunity to align resources and workforce to City Council priorities. The organizational design framework was developed after extensive research into best practices in other public sector organizations and in consultation with subject matter experts at the City of Edmonton. 
Senior leaders were also consulted and their feedback was incorporated. Based on stratified systems theory and best practice review, a maximum of seven layers should exist between frontline positions and the city manager as demonstrated on this slide. Equally as important as the number of layers is the composition of those layers. Of the seven layers, a maximum of five should be management. The City of Edmonton conducted a jurisdictional scan to determine the appropriate number of layers for like organizations, as well as the composition of those layers as between management and union employees. The majority of organizations recommend a maximum of five layers of management, which aligns with our protocol in the OD framework. Because every city in Canada has differences in the programs and services offered, we avoided cutting and pasting another city structure onto the city of Edmonton. However, I can advise we conducted extensive research to learn what other organizations and cities are doing. Highlights include a city of Portland study from 1994 notes best practice is no more than five layers of management. And at that time they had six. Ottawa's 2016 organizational design guidelines recommends no more than five or six layers of management. Toronto Transit Commission in 2015 reported nine layers as current state with a recommendation to reduce to eight. And the City of Toronto hired a consultant to review their structure in terms of non-union staff complement in 2014 and recommended no more than five layers of management. Of course, the number of layers may vary within business areas depending on factors such as the complexity and diversity of business operations, the size of the business area, geographical dispersion of employees, and or the structure of the union classification framework within the business area. Regarding spans of care, current practice consistently recommends that span of care should fit the type of service provided by the organizational unit. The application of one-size-fits-all ratios undermines modern best practice in organizational design. And in fact, McKinsey and Company's global consulting firm's 2017 report on the public sector states, quote, that there is no single magic number that fits all types of managers and work that they do. In fact, chasing one single number can actually reduce effectiveness, close quote. As a large organization and one accountable to the people we serve, the city should have the right number of employees per supervisor or span of, of care. To quote the January 2014 Building Permit and Inspection Services Audit Report, when there are too few supervisors, it's difficult to properly manage staff and workload, and this can negatively impact the quality of work. Where there are too many supervisors, it unnecessarily raises overall personnel costs and creates bureaucracy for decision making. As a result of this finding, and in particular in relation to that area, the city increased its staffing levels by 32 FTEs, enabling a greater segregation of duties between inspectors and supervisors and increasing the supervisor's ability to effectively monitor staff performance. A supervisor overseeing call center employees with very structured policies to guide their work can manage more employees than a specialized engineer who has a full workload of their own. Our 311 team leads supervise between 20 and 10 employees while many of our project managers and engineers who manage large capital projects have no direct reports. There are a number of factors that need to be considered when reviewing spans of care, the term we use at the city, including percentage of time dedicated to supervision, diversity of functions overseen, operational and shift work, knowledge and specialization required for the position, geographic location of employees, whether there are structured guidelines and policies to support the work, the degree of complexity and risk in the relationships the position manages and industry best practices. Based on these factors, most director positions at the city would have an appropriate span of care of between four and seven direct reports. We recognize organizational change is difficult on employees and their leaders. And to achieve the city plan, we will be balancing the tension between restructuring and ensuring consistent service standards. 
We, along with our sister municipalities, consistently balance the reality between innovation and consistency. And we have initiated a change community of practice to ensure that change practices are fully embedded with each and every organizational shift. I also finally note that the Tom Peters article from the 1980s that was referenced during the public hearing was talking about self-managing teams in a manufacturing environment. At the City of Edmonton, transit has some areas with spans of care within the 1 to 50 ratio reflecting the type of work in this area. However, most business areas at the city would be far from this ratio. This slide shows the composition of three well-known Alberta-based organizations in terms of unionized and out-of-scope employees, including the City of Edmonton by organization size. Before I speak to this slide, it's necessary that we take a cautious approach when using comparator data to identify or justify the proper alignment of unionized and out of scope FTEs in a particular organization. Many factors influence this ratio, including the type of work and services delivered, for example, homogenous versus diverse. And as you know, the city of Edmonton has 73 lines of diverse business and hundreds of sub services. Next, the size of the organization increases complexity and oversight required. Next, some public sector organizations may be supported by other government departments and agencies and an interplay of resources exists and can impact the ratio. And finally, pure public sector organizations are subject to different jurisdictional legislation, such as the Public Service Employee Relations Act, which designates HR, finance and IT jobs differently. And this could change the ratios by up to 5%. Considering these factors and in comparison, our workforce ratio does not suggest an imbalance. We have become increasingly rigorous and our expectations of our people leaders at the city of Edmonton, and we are so proud that our leadership competencies demand our leaders think about leadership style, how to motivate their teams and how to get results. We expect them to be courageous, inclusive, values-based influencers, collaborative networkers, systems thinkers, and creative, creative innovators. And we hire for these traits. We develop them in our teams and we evaluate based on the ability to work in these ways. These are 21st century leadership competencies to deal with the demands of a contemporary corporation in an increasingly complex world. And in addition to excellence on the front lines, we are proud of the many supervisors and managers who work long hours without additional compensation to ensure high degrees of accountability to our citizens. In terms of specific proportion, our workforce is distributed as follows. 87% of our permanent FTEs are in-scope unionized roles. 9% of our permanent FTEs are in-scope supervisors, which we call leaders of people, and 78% of our permanent FTEs are in-scope employees as leaders of service. The remaining 13% of our permanent FTEs are out of scope. 7.4% of all positions perform work associated with professional technical stream. 4.8% of all positions function as management leadership. And 0.8% of all positions are in the out of scope confidential classification group. Although our workforce composition has evolved, the overall proportion of out of scope to union FTEs has remained fairly constant during the 2017 to 2020 time period. In the fall, as you are aware, you council passed a motion requiring us to return within the fall 2020 SOBA as appropriate with two scenarios to reduce supervisor FTEs by 5% up to 92 FTEs and 10% up to 184. This, sorry, this slide shows the current positions identified for reduction representing 118.5 FTEs in relation to the OCA reduction targets. The two lines represent 5% and 10% as outlined in the report. Working in consultation with our colleagues across the city, senior leaders have reviewed each and every one of our supervisory positions. Positions identified for reduction are funded through a variety of sources, capital utility reserve and tax levy. 
FTE decisions are reflective of a point in time, and in this case, December 3rd of 2020. As stated on previous slides, it's important to note we are still working through the 2021 0% exercise, a number of significant reorganizations and translating FTE reductions into position impacts. And as we complete this work, this number will increase. Jurisdictional impacts of the proposed supervisor reductions are as follows. Management or out of scope employees account for the greatest share of, sorry, of FTEs identified for elimination totaling 69. Unionized super supervisory FTE reductions total 49.5. This represents an overall supervisor reduction of 8.7% of senior management FTE, 5.1% of middle management FTE, and 6.8% of frontline supervisor FTE. The balance of our supervisor reductions will be accomplished over the course of the remaining budget cycle including leveraging reductions from the existing corporate strategy transformation program, implementation of program and service review recommendations, already committed 2021-22 reductions and reimagined services review. And it requires mention mentioning also that arbitrarily targeting the remaining vacant supervisor positions for elimination could undermine existing and ongoing work. That's why we have taken a thoughtful fact-based and strategic approach to the reduction of supervisory positions. This slide shows how the proposed 118.5 supervisor FTE reductions align with the different budget strategies underway. We've leveraged an integrated approach to achieve achieving these reduction reductions inclusive of the 2022 budget cycle. As you can see, 33 supervisor FTEs will be reduced to meet council approved 2020-2022 budget reduction commitments. We're proposing to reduce an additional 49.3 as part of the 2021 0% exercise. And finally, we've identified a further 36.2 supervisor FTE reductions that are not part of the above mentioned strategies. Of note, 88.5 FTEs of these supervisor roles are currently vacant. And this aligns with one of our principles to minimize the impact to our employees wherever possible. <clears throat> Finally, the other category includes 36.2 supervisory FTEs with associated funding drawn from capital, utility, and or reserve. Some FTE reductions do not result in ongoing budget savings. Next slide, please. At the September 18th, 2020 audit committee meeting, the City Auditor's report identified 1,841 supervisor FTEs. As of September 30th of 2020, we completed a detailed review of the 131 permanent vacant supervisor positions applying the OCA's definition of supervisor. The visual on the left hand of this slide provides a summary of our findings, highlighting the vacancy status and jurisdiction. Details are as follows. 45 supervisor FDEs are held for an employee and not technically vacant. There are various reasons for holding an employee's home position, including contractual and human rights legislation, such as when the employee is on approved leave, such as maternity or parental leave, disability leave, or the permanent employee has accepted a temporary assignment elsewhere. As this data represents a point in time reflective of September 30th, 14 of these supervisory FTEs have been filled between that date and November 30th. 30 supervisory FTEs in this grouping have been identified for elimination and 42 have been assessed as necessary to the operations of the city. Of these, 10 are critical and inactive recruitment. And of the 32, remaining, many are temporarily paused pending the outcome of budget deliberations or a result of COVID service impacts. For example, the Muttart Rec Centre facilities attendant, which is paused until Muttart reopens. In order to achieve a 0% tax levy in 2021, 347.2 FTEs will need to be permanently reduced from the city's workforce. And these are included within the overall FTE reduction of 338 identified on page two of attachment three of the fall SOBA report. To mitigate the impact on our employees, we have used a number of workforce strategies before considering permanent layoffs. 
These include transitioning existing employees in positions identified for elimination to critical vacant positions, a workforce transition program that allowed more senior employees to voluntarily resign or retire, thereby preventing the involuntary layoff of a newer employee. Approximately 126 employees are participating in this program. Using anticipated attrition rates to prevent involuntary layoffs and eliminating vacant FTEs wherever possible. As you can see, the application of these strategies has allowed us to reduce the impact of involuntary layoffs to 32.4% of the original target. Of the FTE reductions identified that will result in an employee being permanently laid off, 9% are management or out of scope and 91% are union positions, which is comparable to the ratio at the city overall. From January 2017 to January 2020, the union FTE count has increased by 102.5, representing a 1% increase, which is entirely attributed to an increase in in-scope supervisors. And finally, to fully achieve a 2021 0% tax levy increase, we need to, to find an additional 33.5 permanent FTEs. And this will be achieved through corporate realignment initiatives, including the Corporate Strategy Transformation Program, the overall objectives of, what, of which include the need to ensure we have a centralized and coordinated approach to corporate strategy functions, thereby generating operational efficiencies and cost savings by removing duplicate roles. This slide shows high-level trending associated with vacancy management for any, before any of the proposed FTE reductions are applied. In summary, the corp vacancy rate has remained constant over the last two quarters at 7.1%. As of September 30th, there were 730.5 vacant full-time positions, 118 of which were management, 2.5 were out of scope, and 610 of which were unionized. 48% reside in city operations, which is expected as 47% of our workforce falls there. The duration of the vacancies is also uh, set out, 229 are 0 to 5 months, 289 are 6 to 11, and 202 are over 12. Of the 730.5 vacant FTEs, 20%, 20 have been identified for elimination to meet the 2021-22 budget reduction commitments, which leaves us approximately 570 perm vacancies, of which 98 are in active recruitment and the remaining are not being recruited to at this time due to the fiscal restraint initiative we have in place. Thank you for your kind attention. I will now turn it over to Mary. Thanks, Kim. So while I could see that targeting vacant positions for elimination could be an effective strategy to minimize the effect of permanent layoffs on our employees, it's important to note two things. So reducing this high number of vacant positions or the, the number of vacant positions reduces our ability to be agile, and responding to change or emerging corporate or council priorities. This would be particularly pronounced as we continue to address the effects of the pandemic. Secondly, administration already budgets for a natural level of vacancies as a result of normal course of operations through a personal discount rate that is used within our budget. The discount rate reduces our personnel budget that is presented to you. The rate is continuously adjusted to accommodate for a variety of personnel vacancies uh, vacancy factors. So this rate varies between 2 and 9 percent per branch. So to a great extent, the vacant positions are already considered in the budget. It is important to note this because any reductions here will not directly correlate uh, a vacant position removal to a budget savings as these are already considered in the personnel discount rate. With that, I'm turning it back to Adam. Thanks, and thanks for your um, time to provide that information. This information was requested at the uh, when we first presented uh, in November. Um, typically, much of this is presented in private, but because the discussions have been happening publicly, we felt it important to share this publicly in terms of the, the steps that have administration has taken in terms of uh, proposed reductions to accommodate uh, during um, the pandemic and also uh, to achieve the zero percent. Uh, so thanks for your time. Um, and I, if I could, I would just say to Councillor Nichols' question about the the fee bylaw. Um, it's on page 144 of attachment three, and those are are um, 
approved. Uh, the only reason the bylaw would come back is if there's any increases or decreases based on the budget discussion. Thank you. Um, so the bylaw is perpetual, not annual, and is amended as fees are amended. That's correct. Okay, so it will remain in place. Got it. Okay, that's helpful. Um, well, thank you for this. I think that it probably anticipates many questions that were had. It will lead to more, but they'll be really focused, so that's really helpful. Now, we've, we've got... Um, we can do questions on kind of all of it, or my suggestion would be uh, that we um, maybe digest that for a little bit on the operating side. And uh, because the order that we do things is uh, capital then operating. So that was a combined presentation on both. But um, my suggestion would be that we see if we can deal with capital, see how far we can get with capital, because the other operating discussion is police, and that's not till 1.30. So, um, and, and I sense there'll be some questions on capital, but that it won't be a massive discussion. So, so my suggestion is going to be that we put a pin in the operating questions right there and um, get the capital motion on the floor and ask the capital questions, take the capital amendments, um, and then come back to the operating questions once we have uh, uh, get the operating motion on the floor. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is the speaker's list that's probably partly reacting to, to the presentation and, and chomping at the bit to get into the operating. But if there are no objections, um, let's stick to the plan and, uh, and deal with capital. Would somebody uh, please put the main capital budget adjustment motion on the floor? Well, strictly speaking, Councilor Walters, you'd selected these items. Would you like to put the capital adjustment on the floor? Sure, I'll, I'll put it on the floor. <clears throat> okay. I'll second that. Seconded by Councillor Hamilton. Okay, so the capital uh, motion in 6-3 is on the floor. Questions on capital? We'll do questions, uh, then we'll take amendments, then we'll debate amendments, then we'd postpone it. So questions on it? Um, uh, Councillor Walters, go ahead. Thanks. So I was wondering, um, Mayor Adam, if you could just give us a quick, in my first minute or so, a quick refresher on the MSP, um, the money that the municipal stimulus program money that came in and what that, I think I understand it, but I wouldn't mind just a re-explanation of what that does for pay as you go. So we, we get that money, we use it for what we're going to use it for. And then the money we had allocated to those programs originally then go back to Pay as you go. Uh, Harm can answer answer what we've done with that. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so that's that's correct, Councillor. So we use those MSP funds to fund a few new projects and also to fund some neighborhood renewal and pay as you go projects that were we were otherwise cut. And those neighborhood renewal and pay as you go funds went back to their uh, respective reserves. So, okay. So, and what reserves are those? That would be the pay-as-you-go capital reserve and the neighborhood renewal reserve. Okay, pay-as-you-go reserve then. And we had done some goal setting on that reserve in the past in terms of how much money we wanted in there. Uh, and I don't, I don't recall if we did a policy around that or if we just had a discussion paper on that, but what kind of shape is that reserve in, the pay-as-you-go reserve, considering this latest infusion? So, Councillor, um, the pay-as-you-go reserve is is a reserve where we place unspent pay-as-you-go, allocated but unspent pay-as-you-go funding, or pay-as-you-go funding that is in and raised in the budget but hasn't been expensed or allocated yet. We okay. don't actually have a target for that reserve. Okay. I thought we had discussed that some years ago, but uh, no matter for now. So, okay, that's helpful. Uh, I'm going to go back to one of my favorite topics is my never ending pursuit of a few extra baseball diamonds. Uh, so Mr. Uh, Malifsta, if you're on the call, my understanding is there's two kinds of allocations for, 
for these amenities for baseball diamonds. One would be there's some renewal, there's some money in the budget now for renewal of existing diamonds. Correct? That is correct. There's approximately $3.3 million, of which that includes 13 different sites. Okay, so that's to upgrade or to, ren to renew sort of like for like diamonds that exist today. Yeah, and, and there is some aspects of enhancements. Our renewal program typically has some right. contingency so, to account for 10%. So oh, 10 up base level, base okay. level standards. Uh, and then if we wanted to, so then related to the diamonds that do not exist. Uh, so where we have school sites where we have, you know, a grass, just grass, uh, you put shale and backstops and that would be, so there's two capital profiles for new ones, one for planning and design, and then one for delivery of those. And that's about a total between those two things, about a million bucks. Correct. 75,000 for planning and design and 925 for delivery. Now we were chatting earlier. I was, I, I just wanted to clarify uh, my memory in the past is that that million got us about 20 new diamonds to a base shale and backstop. But our conversation earlier, you suggested that's actually gets us to seven new diamonds. So yeah, and I, I think the largest thing we're dealing with is that typically these enhancements are done through home base agreements. The city has actually hasn't done a lot of this ourselves. Um, aside from what we've been able to beg, borrow, and steal through um, our own uh, resources internally. So city operations, I know, has done some enhancements. But uh, so it could be anywhere. Um, it largely depends on the locations that are selected and what right. the existing infrastructure is at those spots. But it could be between 7 and 20. And that's really the best I can Okay, that's time. fine. So I guess my question is, is like, I could make two amendments today. Uh, one where we fund 75,000 for planning and design. And then I could make an additional one where we fund the other 925,000 for uh, the delivery of them all of pay as you go. Uh, but if I just did the first amendment, the planning and design one, that would give you some time to work with baseball organizations to figure out how many and where, uh, plus the home base agreements with it. Because the base agreements raise the money privately to do, so just to be very simple, we pay for the shale and the backstop, and the community groups, the home base agreements, or the baseball clubs would pay for the back or the dugouts and all the other uh, stuff that would be required. That's how it works, right? Right. So really, all we would need now, from a if if you wanted us to get going on it, is the seventy five thousand that would buy us approximately twelve months worth of work. And then we could revisit the, the request around delivery of the work, the 925, uh, when that planning and design work is complete. So that would be... You have to come back as a citizen and fight for the rest of it. Okay, great. Um, well, I will consider that, in, but I'm out of time for now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Henry. Yeah, my questions um, are about... Uh, Big surprise, the Wally Miles uh, Leisure Center, because I think, so I think, Mr. Melista, this is probably a question for you. We have put this off up until now uh, because we felt we still had time to get the design work done um, and still be ready for the, to have it available for the next cycle of funding could be, could be allocated. But I'm guessing we're out of that time now. Is that fair to say? Well, we've got... Um still a, a, a couple years worth of our capital budget left so we've got two years worth of work we're currently at checkpoint two yeah um, it to advance at the checkpoint three we we should be able to do that over the next two years if the funding was in place yeah but 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 we need to get you the funding in order to do that now I'm thinking or certainly within either either now or or, or at absolute latest in uh, in the spring if the anticipation is to start construction in 2023, yes, we would have well, to. Well, certainly to have it available and to understand what the what the specific scope would be and what, because I mean, there is still, if we're looking at doing something that is a kind of stripped down new, new version of a rec center, um, there is more work that would need to be done at design and to understand what that looked like and what the cost would be, correct? Correct. Um, and the other thing that is already at checkpoint three, but is on hold until we can get this sorted out, is the other piece of the Raleigh Mills Athletic Grounds. We really need to understand both pieces before we can go ahead with anything, correct? 
Well, and actually, the district park site is funded to Checkpoint 3. It's funded, but it's not. Yeah. But we've held back on actually using that funding, ironically, because we need to answer some other questions first. That goes all the way back to the previous capital budget, uh, yeah. 2015-18. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, if I was going to put this forward, uh, I, my memory is we don't actually have a number in here, but my memory is it was $2 million to do the design work. I'll ask Ms. Lattisour to confirm the value, but I believe it's a little, it was $2 million to get the checkpoint two. And to get the checkpoint three is... Uh, but it's at checkpoint two already. We've already gone to the checkpoint two. Correct. So we've, we've spent that money to get to that point, And now um, Ms. Lattisour can confirm the balance of the funding to get to checkpoint three. Uh, yeah. So, so the balance of the funding to get to checkpoint three would be $2.7 million is what we've estimated. 2.7? Okay. Um, all right. Um, and, um, and if I was going to do it, I'm guessing the most appropriate funding source, if I was going to make this motion, would be uh, the pay-as-you-go reserve. Is that correct? Sorry. Um, forgot I was in chambers and I have the mic at my right hand, not my left hand. I know uh, the feeling. <laughs> I have never made that mistake myself. Um, anyway. Yeah, I think that would be our recommendation. What I would flag is some of the uh, risks we flagged in private previously to council. No, I understand. Um, uh, but I, but I don't think any other sorts of funding would be appropriate. I mean, I think, you, I mean, I, I think, I think there's going to be some work done between now and then about a sort of uh, innovative ways to be able to to fund this. Um, I, I think there's some really active things that are happening at the moment, but, um, uh, but I think that putting it into debt funding, I think, would be inappropriate for planning money for design money. I would, I would argue, is that would, is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm going to make the motion then. I'll get it onto the table that capital profile CM 10-1010 uh, be increased by $2.7 million to fund design for the Raleigh Miles uh, Leisure Center with funding from the Pay-as-you-go reserve. Second. Um, so that will be postponed uh, now to uh, later in the process. Um, and uh, that one may get postponed to spring as well. We can we can discuss some options around that when we come to it. Uh, but uh, thank you for putting that on the floor, Councillor Henderson. I think those numbers are right. If I've got the wrong numbers, please correct it for me. I'll send it off to the clerk right now. Okay. Yeah, that's accepted. And now, Councillor uh, Henderson, uh, apologies, but the the number is three point seven. Uh, just to clarify that. Apologies, um, mistake on our part, but it's 3.7 to get to checkpoint three. Okay. Well, that number is quite a bit up from where we were at a year ago. I'm puzzled by that. It was 2.3, if I think back, to get to checkpoint two. Of which yeah, but that, that but checkpoint two was last budget, so that doesn't, but, and I know I had this motion has been sitting around for a while, and my memory was 2 million, but that's all right. I will give you. I'll, let's. We'll get it right, and if it obviously if it comes in less, that's a good news story. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Mayor. Just before we go to the next speaker, can I just talk to the people who are on the conference line? We've been migrating staff from the Google Hangout over to the conference line that's in chambers, and just to let some of our colleagues know that your microphones are actually hot. So if you're not speaking, if you wouldn't mind muting your phone the old-fashioned way, please, by muting it on your actual telephone itself. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we are getting a bit of background noise. Okay, that's better. Somebody's somebody's tuned in and tuned out, which is great. Uh, Councillor McKean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I wanted to ask about Oliver and its uh, recreation planning. Uh, I see the Oliver Rec Center planning is unfunded, um, which is uh, probably apt but uh, there was a sort of a recreation plan, a recreation options plan that was underway as I understood it too. Is, is that work continuing? Councilor Keene, it's Roger Jameson here. Yeah, that work's continuing. It's underway right now. The sort of the final phases of public engagement are happening. Uh, and that should wrap up sometime in January. Which may or may not uh, sort of recommend a, a a rec center. So this this is sort of um, 
uh, doubling down. So, okay, so that, that satisfies me on that. Uh, I don't know who to ask, whether it would be Mr. Seabrick or Mr. Melista. Uh, trees, uh, I see that we have an unfunded package for uh, tree planting. Uh, and I just wanted to double check, given the importance of um, trees for uh, community mental health, vibrancy, all those things, but also uh, for climate. Um, first of all, I don't see what the number is in that package, how much uh, that the cost of that program is. Uh, first of all, I think that would be my question, that unfunded package on trees. Councillor McKean, I, th I think we've got some more work to do to kind of rationalize exactly um, how we would prioritize any investments in, re in relation to that. So we're in the process of kind of building out our program and our priorities. I will remind um, both yourself and council that we did fund $1 million as part of the MSP program. And as part of that $1 million, we did, we've identified 1500 trees and approximately 20 acres of naturalization. So really when it comes to the tree canopy um, expansion, um, really there's, there's a lot of different choices around how you choose to invest in that. And really the, the value could be a, a really a, a broad sliding scale in terms of what you're looking for. But to give you a sense of scale, $1 million, which we have now approved as part of the MSP program, um, includes approximately 1,500 trees and 20 acres of naturalization. Yeah, I uh, and maybe uh, Mr. Mr. Malief or Mr. Seabrook, I, I would love to huddle with you in the new year because I know there was an offer of partnership with um, with the Forest Products Association, and maybe we could we could find ways to expand this with within the existing budget. But so we'll we'll be looking at this further down the road. It's coming back to us at some point. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Commonwealth Stadium upgrades were being proposed for a major uh, or a potential major uh, event. Can can anybody fill me in on the status of that and whether we're okay not funding those upgrades? Uh, Councillor Rob Smith here. Uh, Councillor, um, we'll bring back report either in the spring or, or next fall once the uh, proposal to host those events um, gets a little bit more uh, in, into council for for decisions. So we're, we're okay to pause that decision at this point in time until we have a, more information from from FIFA and from uh, from the province. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, Oliver Poole. Uh, sorry, Oliver Arena. Uh, we had uh, Hockey Edmonton before us. Um, I certainly wasn't uh, going to jump on this, but is there any work underway already with talking to them? Because they sort of said, we'll step in and run those arenas for you. What would be the status of that? And do you need a motion during these deliberations to get that uh, further analysis done? Uh, we have not pursued anything from when that, that was raised, Councillor. Um, we were waiting for decisions today or over the next couple of days on, on that item. Our recommendation is that at this point, as you're well aware, is that, is that that facility does get closed. And if council, you know, redirects that decision, then we, then we will huddle internally to see um, how that could move forward. And just so, so councils are well aware as well, there have been other um contacts made with administration in terms of uh, other potential operators as, as well. So we, we, we would probably be duty bound to do a request for proposals rather than just work with one potential um, nonprofit. And the other, the other quick, quick point counselor is the, um, the, we would continue to operate those arenas for the balance of the winter season they would not close January 1, obviously. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you. I think my time started late, so I'll jump out. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Banga. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of points for uh, clarification. Uh, the scope changes, they're 
all, I guess, uh, uh, reduction in cost. And uh, recosting is increase in cost. Is that correct? Um, rescoping, I think, is is more clearly defined. What's in a profile, Councillor Benga? Uh, mm -hmm. re recosting is either up or down on the basis of performance of a project as it advances through the various gates within the project develop and deliver model. That's generally how it's treated. So, does recosting ever brings the final? build down? Well, at times it does, yes. And certainly when we reach the end of projects, there is adjust there are adjustments that happen where savings are returned to the corporation. Okay, so uh, in the, my next question is about MSP. Uh, this MF, uh, MSP funding of 65.7 million that was not known to us, I would say, a month and a half ago, was it? Councillor, I believe it was. It, there was a motion. Um, it was very fast money that had to be spent, and we came to Council with the recommended spend of the $65 million. Uh, but then we did some, essentially looked at some programs we were thinking of cutting and funded it as well, and therefore that's what creates a bit of a a relief on the pay as you go now that we're hoping to be used for for future pressures okay um uh, then the emerging items uh three of these that are listed on on top of the list they are 50th street new school park site and northeast pedestrian bridge uh could somebody tell me that 50th street uh, CPR rate separation, that was, uh, it's just not new, is it? That's correct, uh, Councillor Banga. The emerging projects are typically reserved for projects that have been previously approved by Council. So essentially there's an interest on behalf of Council to be able to advance the work. But for, um, you know, things outside of either admin, admin's control, um, those priorities or funding have shifted. So the school sites with Keswick is in response to a provincial funding announcement. The Quarry Bridge is in relation to funding from the RVA. And then the 50th Street is still in relation to ongoing, um, you know, negotiations largely with CP and, and that, that those funds came from the federal and provincial government before we'd actually advanced any design work on that project. Okay, so the 50th Street one is... Uh um, do we have a contribution from both provincial and federal? We do. We, we have the federal contribution agreements, the provincial uh, contributions. Um, right now, we're still working through discussions with CP Rail in terms of what their contributions will be. And that's why we've still, we're projecting a delta of $18 million on the basis of no contribution from CP. Our hope is to be able to reduce that value um, you know, through those negotiations as much as possible. That said, the work is continuing. The project is still advancing. Land acquisition is underway. The design work is underway. We've hired a construction manager. Um, you know, things are starting to shape up and, and we'll start to see work, um, you know, pending the funding being confirmed. Uh, work could start as early as uh, later next year. So my time is ticking really fast. Uh, for the Northeast uh, Pedestrian Bridge, um, emerging item. Is it this item associated or stipulated to any other funding that would go away if we don't do it? So that the basis of the funding contribution through a memorandum of understanding with, with our partners, with the RVA as well as Strathcona County is that the city would contribute one sixth of the overall cost, um, half of one third when the other two thirds coming from the federal and provincial government through the RVA. There is a, a, a grant uh, timeline associated with the contributions from the federal and provincial governments of, I believe it's the end of 2024. 
and basically all our billings have to be in place by spring or the first quarter of 2025. So essentially, if we're not able to um, spend that money within that time frame, there is a risk that that funding, that two thirds funding from the province and the federal government would would uh, would be lost. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bang uh, Councillor Essinger's next. Thank you. I'd like to talk about, I know you'll be surprised, the Coronation Rec Center. Um, because of the current space, um, we needed 36 million additional dollars uh, to build to scenario two, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, I've heard loud and clear from the community, as well as we've heard from the partners that Everyone is interested in scenario two, not the bill to the dollar. That's the other option. That's correct. Um, our intel through conversations with the community, our stakeholders, um, and you heard it during the the, non uh, the public hearing process, is that there's an interest in advancing scenario two. Although it breaks my heart not to keep going on this project, $36 million at this time seems large. Um, so if we do nothing at this point, if we don't get the extra $36 million, please tell me how this project still moves forward or where it goes. It, it doesn't, um, essentially, and that's where we've reached a point in the project where we're um, at checkpoint three. Um, so essentially, we've, we've concluded the planning and design components of the project. Um, we really need some direction from council. Um, some design direction around which which of the scenarios to proceed with and then really the two intervals or gates that we need to be able to establish from a funding perspective are an additional three million dollars to get to checkpoint four and then that would uh and 36 if we were to get to checkpoint five so it was three million dollars to get to checkpoint four that's correct based on from where we are today it's three million to get to checkpoint four and then another 33 for a total of 36 to get the checkpoint five. Getting to checkpoint four would bring this project in a similar um, circumstance to what we were contemplating. It's a similar approach to what we were doing with Lewis Estates Rec Center, where that one is funded to checkpoint four and that work is, is continuing as well. Okay, then uh, to do that, Mr. Mayor, I will do a motion to use, uh, to get uh, option or scenario two and the 4 million, was it 4 million? Sorry, 3 million. 3 million to get to checkpoint four and I will draft something on that. Thank you. Uh, we'll come back to you for that once you have the wording. Councilor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so just quickly on, on Lowe's Farms Rec Center, the, there's a separate report coming February 3rd uh, along with uh, alternative financing options. So that's where we'll deal with that one because we're wrapping up checkpoint four, correct? That's correct. Perfect. Okay. So I won't bother asking any more about that. Uh, I, when is the report scheduled for the targeted roadway upgrades? So I know in, in Unfunded, we have things like uh, Winterburn Road included, but, but I want to talk about the more broad report. When's that coming back? Uh, perhaps Ms. McCabe can confirm, but I believe it, I saw it on uh, on one of the previous committees recently, the network performance indicators, and it was being, um, it was recently, I think, um, rescheduled for the spring sometime. But perhaps maybe Ms. McCabe can confirm. That's correct, Jason. So we're going to have a conversation on spring around what that looks like to, to address targeted roadway upgrades, you know, turning bays, different things like that. That That's the report that we're talking about. And we'll have a, a clear indication of what's required citywide, not just in, in one specific area. Is that That's my understanding of the report? That's correct, is it would take a holistic look at what's in the toolbox. Um, it wouldn't have a full analysis of every single uh, area of the city about where you could apply that, but it'll have um, some component, uh, some components of what's in the what's in the toolbox and where those tool tools could be used. Okay, and that will have um, some type of financial component that we can start to to think about at future capital uh, adjustment areas. Is that right? Yes, it will. 
okay, great. Then I'll, I'll again, leave that one until that appropriate time. Um, noting that we'll have that conversation soon. Uh, let me just go through here. Next one was the, uh, uh, West Summit Mall Pedway. Uh, my understanding is they're not quite finished. Uh, the work it was hoping to be finished here. We're, we're going to be finished early in the new year. Uh, this would be coming back in the spring, uh, supplementals, correct? That's correct. Yeah. And, and, and that's to checkpoint three as well. Perfect. And because this one ideally is going to have uh, a, a majority of the funding coming from other partners, um, we don't need a motion to bring that profile forward. That, that's that's going to be presented as part of a, a future item there. Is that or do I need to do any motion related to that one? Might have to defer to Miss Pearson to answer that, but I, I believe that uh, the project would then just move over onto the unfunded list that uh, is our, our living document of unfunded priorities that we share with council at every SCBA. Okay, so it's already on the unfunded list, I believe. I just, so I just wanted to know when that work is done and, and assuming we're gonna be receiving uh, funding from the associated landowner, at least one of them, potentially two of them. Um, I just don't know if I need to ask for that one to be specifically brought forward so that it can be moved forward with that or if, or if I wait to spring or what the right tool would be. So if most, most of the funding is being paid for by other folks. I just want to not lose that. I think Councillor Knack um, and apologies, Miss Pearson and I were um, chatting on something else and we missed it, but this is the West Edmonton Mall Pedestrian Bridge. Correct. I, yeah. um, I think once we get clearer on the outcomes of those discussions that you alluded to, um, we would bring that forward um, for consideration at, a, at an upcoming council meeting. Um, but, okay. if but if your comfort level is to make a motion as such, you can. But I think as we get through this, we would bring this forward for consideration. Okay, I'll, I'll think if I want to just formalize it just to make sure it doesn't get lost, but, uh, but, but I'll, I'll figure that out separately. Thank you. Uh, then I think one other question that I can probably get through in this round here. I noticed in the unfunded that there was reference to transit pri priority upgrades. So, you know, traffic signalization where a bus can jump the queue or, a, you know, a bay that would allow them to, to get advanced um, movement. Uh, currently, that's at essentially checkpoint zero, it says. I'm wondering with the approval of the bus network redesign and the approval of the city plan, is that going to be, it shows as a low priority right now, but I'm wondering if that might shift based off the approval of those two documents and, and what we need to do to start preparing uh, for the, the next budget cycle, because we might not be able to do any large scale projects in the next budget cycle, but there might be opportunities for a lot of target pieces. So is that is that already on our radar? Councillor Nack, I, I think um, perhaps maybe um, having it as a lower priority is a misnomer to some degree. It is a priority. It's, it's just that given the state of where we're at with, as you mentioned, the bus network redesign, the city plan, that there's more work to be done before we can, it's just not capital ready. Mm -hmm. um, because we haven't identified specifically what the sites or locations are. There's still more work to be able to understand based on the routing, where some of the pressure points are, where we might be able to gain better efficiencies. Um, so there's more analysis that really needs to be done before I'd say it's at checkpoint one. And that's why you see it at checkpoint zero is that there's, there's another step required to really kind of refine the work that's happening from being our tested out, see how the operations works. And then from that, come forward with a list of locations. And then from that, we can formulate an estimate for what, what it would take to be able to do the planning and design to add some of those operational improvements, like, like you mentioned, signals or bus lay by lanes and things like that. Okay, I'm out of time. Thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Carmel. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, attachment 10 to this report. Uh, and the proposed facility closures and savings. There's a chart there that shows um, for the various facilities a breakdown of revenue expense and renewal costs. Uh, is that information available on all of our rec centers and all of our facilities? Certainly from a, the deferred capital or renewal work, like we do have a, 
depending on the um, location and it might vary in terms of its uh, current um, information, but we do have for all of our facility assets, we do have uh, an assessment of some sort um, that identifies specific um, infrastructure requirements for each facility. So I might need a bit of advice here, but maybe that's uh, information I can request in a, in, a, in a counselor inquiry or would it be a report? Do you have that information at hand? So are you asking for the building condition assessments for all 950 facilities or just the, the, <laughs> the subset of <laughs> story? Well, that sounded kind of snarky. No, I was just talking oh, about no, the uh, just the rec center facilities. Yeah. I'm just teasing you, Jason. It's all good. I, uh, just the rec facilities is what I was interested okay. in. Okay. Yeah, yeah so we could track that down and uh, share that if that's something... Uh, so one, one option I'll just flag there procedurally would be a subsequent motion asking for a memo with that information to be circulated at whatever level of, um, uh, of detail uh, folks want. Um, and that could, or, or a report, but, um, but subsequent motions, we can't make memos out of inquiries, but we can make memos out of motions. And subsequent, you can pretty much move any subsequent you want at budget is inbound. So, so just an option for you, Councillor. I'll, I'll give you some extra time. No, that's fine. I appreciate that. I kind of thought you might say that. Um, um, and I should qualify. It'll take a bit of time. It's not something. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. My second question is just uh, following up on Councillor Knack's question about the report coming in February about Lewis Farms Rec Centre. And there's something to the effect of um, alternative funding scenarios. Will that report include alternative uh, operating scenarios? Or just just capital funding. Yeah, I, I want to manage expectations here a little bit to some degree. The, sure. the project is largely an update on the work that's done to be able to advance and deliver the work to get it to checkpoint four. There is a separate report, not the Lewis Farms project um, report, that uh, Mr. Smythe's group has been working on that speaks to more broadly, not Lewis um, specifically, but other scenarios using the example of Rolly Miles actually to look at different uh, delivery or our, our project financing and, and operating and maintenance scenarios. Yeah, it will, it, Council, it will deal with both capital and operating, everything from lot levies to naming to other sources of funding potentially that are not tax levy based. And when is that coming, Mr. Swain? Same time as the Lewis Farms report? Or? I believe it's at the same time in February. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple questions about the operating cost of capital. Do you want me to save those for operating questions, Mr. Mayor? Depends if they're about uh, projects that might be f funded uh, to inform debate on funding a particular project. Um, but if they're more about the, the general operating impacts of things already approved, I'd, I'd leave it till the operating budget. Okay, I will do that then. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Um, Councillor Paquette on the first round. Yep, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, a little off the beaten path here, but uh, this has been coming in from residents uh, recently, especially uh, last night after the provincial announcements. And that is just sort of uh, some of the infrastructure for our off-leash areas and, uh, and also just uh, parks in general. More and more people are going to be uh, outdoors uh, getting their exercise and of course here we are in the middle of winter and the nights are extremely dark and so uh, for a lot of folks who've been emailing me, women in particularly, uh, it feels unsafe. And so I'm just wondering uh, if, uh, if because I didn't see it in the budget, any sort of allocation toward lighting for off-leash areas or parks um, you know, in keeping with the pandemic situation and I don't even know if we could do any of that in the, uh, in the coming winter uh, months or if this is something uh, that's more long term but uh, any any thoughts on that? Councillor Paquette, I, we, you're right we do not have a specific project or an initiative that looks at uh, lighting within our parks. Um, I would suggest that lighting is looked at on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the park and as part of the overall park design process. 
Um, so we do um, typically try to make sure that areas are, are well lit where they're, you know, like our playgrounds, community halls, things like that. Where, um, but we don't um, generally try to provide a lot of um, broader lighting throughout um, the park sites. And a large, large amount of that just comes down to context and what we hear back in terms of the engagement um, that we do on a site-by-site -site basis. So it's a design right, configuration okay. less than a park. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah. That makes, I'm just looking at our public health and safety uh, chart here. Apply 2.5.1. Apply crime prevention through environmental design principles to promote user safety and positive site activity for new or existing OLAs. And uh, um, I guess, I guess the the question here would uh, would it be helpful if uh, I asked for a report and maybe an unfunded package to come to the next budget update? Uh, to increase options for lighting in parks and uh, along paths. Uh, Councillor Paquette, I think that's something that you could do. I, I just want to emphasize what, what Mr. Malivsta said, which is as we go into parks and do the renewal, that um, policy reference that you made is a consideration in the design efforts that the folks make. But if you would like a broader investigation of what that would take and what would that um, cost and time to do that. Um, that's that's a motion that we would respond to. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's just this is definitely in keeping with uh, um, Councillor Hamilton's motion earlier this year about uh, making a, a safe city uh, for women through uh, you know the way that we're designing and also uh, through obviously Councillor Esslinger's ongoing efforts. To make a safer city and we know that uh, um, after 5 p.m. a lot of these areas are just basically unusable so uh, yeah appreciate that appreciate and, that. and that crime prevention that through environmental prevention. design lens is applied when when we go into uh, renewal or new park implementation okay well thanks I might sw uh, swing back around with this uh, I'll just I'll figure some things out thanks Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. There we go. Um, I wanted to ask about the Collingwood Twin Arena rehabilitation project. You have, it's gone to checkpoint three and it says it requires approval for delivery um, for uh, $6.18 million, million. Is that correct? Uh, a little bit of a nuance there, but essentially it is, it is funded. Um, okay. All we're doing is requesting approval to create a standalone profile. So it's part of our renewal funding. Yeah. And just based on the budgeting principles that council approves, typically when a project that's greater than $5 million in costs, yeah. we extract that from the composite and we create a standalone profile. So that's really all we're asking for um, permission from council uh, at this stage is the ability to create a standalone, but it's self-funded already through the approved funding in the renewal composite. If that makes sense. Great. Yeah, it does make sense. So you don't need you don't need a motion on that. That's just part of your sort of okay, great. Yeah, we were just talking about sheets of ice here. So so I wanted to make sure that that, uh, that was going through. All right, that's all for me on that one. Thank you. Uh, any other questions on the first round on capital? Uh, can I get a motion for second round? So moved. Thank you, Second. Councillor Nichols. Seconded by Councillor Zadek. I'll seek unanimous consent. Any objections to another round? Questions on capital? Seeing none. Uh, Councillor McKean on the second round. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And this will be pretty quick, I hope. Mr. Malifsta, oh, with does this budget really change the schedule of Jasper Avenue refurbishment in Oliver? Has there been any delays to the project? I've been asked to ask. No. No, not at all. In fact, that's one of the brighter lights in terms of progress from this past summer. Um, they've made tremendous um, headway with that work. Um, they're further ahead than we thought we, they would get to by the end of the year. And really, I think uh, we heard from council before about the, the hes hesitancy around having that work proceed and slipping it in, so to speak, before the West LRT project got underway. Um, we think that we're in really good shape to be able to do that. So the, the certainly the stage between 109th Street and 114th Street, um, it's proceeding very well. 
And and the next stage, 14th to 24, 124th, is it being delayed at all because of uh, this these budget pressures? Uh, it has less to do about budget, I think, more to do with council's appetite. And certainly there is a, a budget part to that, but we've never actually established or confirmed a schedule for the balance of the work from 114 to 124. Because it's never, we'll been, be, it's never been committed publicly, and it's really just a, a, a product of council's uh, decisions when you're ready and when you think you have the funding. Um, but we are not looking to recommend anything as part of the balance of that work, probably until the end of the West LRT project being complete. Right, exactly. That's that's the uh, that's the issue. Would be closing off two major routes into the downtown at the same time. Yep. No, I get that. In the first stage. Um, because I look out over it, uh, looks fantastic. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Walters. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Melissa, the, just the last question I had, the transit prioritization uh, money, the, and I, I just want to confirm this. That money was put aside. That the, I'm talking about the money for Ellerslie Road and 111th off of the Heritage Valley Park and Ride. Which uh, did that open? The Heritage Valley uh, Park and Ride and Transit Center is open. It's open. That's right. Tells you how often I leave my house these days. Uh, the um, it's a sad story. The that those okay. transit prioritization measures though were put. That's Funded and set aside. Correct. It was five point nine million, if I recall. Okay. Um, we put aside the civil work and the horizontal road work for the time being, pending a decision on whether or not the capital line LRT extension gets approved. We are advancing the traffic signal upgrades along that corridor. That's right. Okay. Um, to help with the service, the bus service that happens between Century Park and Heritage Valley. And the advancement of the South LRT project, that's all just, we're just waiting. We submitted our business case uh, per our commitment to the province by the end of August, and uh, we're waiting to hear back. Okay. Uh, and then the the quarry, br the RVA bridge, that's, that's in this budget, in the recommended packages as per our commitments to the RVA. Correct. It doesn't require a motion. Um, okay. It's already put in there. Right. The only thing that's not funded is the delivery side, and we would come back to you um, once we're done the planning and design. Sure. And I know I know there's other count. I'm not on the board, but I just thought I'd ask what was on uh, for uh, my own interest. Uh, okay, that's all I had. Thanks. Um, thank you, Councillor Walters. Councillor Henderson. Um, yeah, just to do a check-in on something to see where, where we're at on it. I know Ms. Person and I had a chance to talk about uh, the the, the carve-out um, for the active transportation uh, from the federal government, which sounds like in the current uh, um, sphere is not going to be available to us in the short term. But I'm presuming that there are some projects both that are funded and some that are unfunded that if there was going to be another tranche of money like that, we could look at fairly quickly, correct? Councillor Henderson, that is correct. I did confirm after our talk that uh, there is no funding for us during this first tranche, but we are um, actively uh, engaged in ensuring we can be considered for other forms of money should they arise. Great, because I, you know, I think there's, there's probably a reasonable chance that there may be another piece there. And I'm, and I'm thinking there are some projects that we have underway because we actually have the, 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 the pedestrian connection as part of the uh, Twilliga Drive project, I think, that probably would qualify under something like that, would it not, that we already have funded? Uh, it depends on the timing and others, but that's what we are looking at. There, is, there are a few programs out federally that we are trying to align to see if uh, we could use that funding instead of something we currently have. We're actively Great. pursuing that. And and that, that could either free up stuff for other things or free up more money for other active transportation pieces. The, the one piece I wanted to ask about, um, because I think there's some interesting work that's happening in collaboration with some of our uh, partners in the community, is the Saskatchewan Drive piece. Um, 
but which is a really heavily i mean it's it basically we're called we call it a multi-use trail but in reality what's there right now is a side is a very narrow sidewalk that is being shared like a multi-use trail and i know there was some interesting work being done having a look after from some of the lessons that we learned um uh from from the the temporary closures this summer that there may be cheaper and easier ways to address that problem and i'm just wondering where that's at or if 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 anything needs to happen to allow that kind of thinking to, to, to at least be explored. Councillor Henderson, we're certainly aware of, of some of the interest that's been brought forward by uh, Paths for People. And uh, we've had discussions with them around what that looks like, certainly as it relates to the timing and the criticality of advancing the work on the Duggan Bridge, we have advanced that work um, in isolation there, there is a bit of a broader discussion that needs to be had around um, as it ties back to the city plan and, and the transit priority network long-term impacts to White Avenue corridor and what those, that corresponding Im impact and effect might have on Saskatchewan Drive or vice versa. Um, we certainly do think that there is some, some opportunities to, to collaborate on what that looks like. And uh, certainly as we advance the work on Saskatchewan Drive and more specifically the enhancements to that shared use path that you refer to, we do think that uh, there's probably something that we could come back. But I will be clear that through the public engagement that we did when we advanced the concept plan for Saskatchewan Drive, we did table the idea of reducing lanes on Saskatchewan Drive. And we were met with a lot of some resistance to that effect. Although uh, perhaps maybe the learnings and experience from this past year might perhaps change people's perceptions of what that means. Yeah, it'd be interesting because I suspect we have some real numbers now of demand. And I think obviously how you feed in coming off the bridge and how you feed out at the other end are the critical pieces of that, whether or not we need. And, and I think what we heard back was the parking was important to hold on to there. But I, but I think it's an interesting idea that actually the drive lane itself may not be helping flow of traffic as long as you can have the input and the output work. Um, and, I, and I guess that raises the other question around that of, of where we're at on having a look at that whole intersection that that's at the south end of of uh, of high level bridge because that's part of the piece of the puzzle that I think and it it sits between a whole bunch of projects that are currently underway and I just wanted to do a check in back on that as well. Perhaps maybe I'll ask uh, uh, Miss Latisur to answer that question if she, if she's available. Yes, thank you, uh, Jason, uh, Councillor Henderson. We are planning to look at that intersection as we uh, progress through the renewal work on the high level bridge. And so right now for the high level bridge, we've completed uh, the really initial phase of condition assessment concept planning. And so we would be looking to uh, progress that through the remaining kind of years of our current budget in advance of uh, presenting options to council uh, to look at the bridge and the intersection at the same time. Great, good, because I think all these pieces go together and I think there is some new learning we got over the summer and it'd be just to make sure that those pieces are in, in flow right now. It's something I'm prepared to add in, but I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Essinger. Thank you. I just have the motion now ready for the Coronation Recreation. Do you want me to make that now? Sure. That the Coronation Community Recreation Project in Capital a profile 15215801 proceed up to checkpoint four as outlined in the scenario two build to program option as outlined in the August 31st, 2020 integrated infrastructure services report CR 7047 community uh, coordination community recreation center project design progress update to the completion of design work to a tender ready status and report back at the fall 2021 supplemental capital budget adjustment second thank you uh that is uh accepted and postponed until later in the process so um councillor katarina is on the first round here for uh, capital questions go ahead uh thank you and uh Jason, maybe a clarification of that, because uh, I know we're, we're transferring back and forth uh, some items, uh, specifically neighborhood renewal. Is that a source of uh, funding available for uh, to transfer to operations, uh, savings or reductions in scope, that sort of thing? 
or that's out of the question. Uh, I need to know if that's a possibility there to, uh, if we find some changes or scope changes that uh, um, reduce uh, those budgets, whether they can be applied to, uh, um, to operating. The source of funding for the neighborhood renewal program is from our tax levy. Yeah. I will okay. remind uh, you and, and as well the council that you've approved a policy that essentially states that whatever money gets saved goes into a reserve account, which Ms. Pearson already shared. And if there is a decision or a broader interest by council to be able to use that funds for some other purpose beyond neighborhood renewal, it will require a non, uh, non-stat or statutory, I can't remember, public hearing essentially to have that funding redirected. So you wouldn't, able, you wouldn't be able to do it today or, or this week. Okay, so that's not part of this. Uh, this is, what, is, is there a name for that reserve? Uh, just so I, what would what, what we refer to? Uh, to, uh, to be honest, I have to ask uh, Ms. Padbury probably knows. Uh, it's uh, okay. referred to as the Neighborhood I, Renewal Reserve. Um, okay, okay, that makes sense, I guess. All right, uh, that's fine. Okay, but that that's not on the table for uh, for this week. That's correct. If, if we were to make uh, choices or decisions like that, you, you could create a motion, um, but it would be to basically re redirect any kind of decisions like that to a statutory public hearing process. A separate meeting would have to be called and probably something uh, in the new year. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Banga. Thank you. Uh, Question about item number 83, Parsons Road, widening from uh, 19th Avenue to Ellerslie, four lane. Uh, if I am looking right, uh, this is uh, has been funded to checkpoint three, but it has only been completed to checkpoint two, and that's been for quite a while. Could you be able to tell me what is the hold up there? Uh, Councillor Banga, there, there's no specific hold up or anything particularly holding it back. It's the project is is advancing to checkpoint three. Um, it's it's not a generally difficult project to be able to advance. It's a pretty standard arterial winding project. Um, so the project is I believe already at checkpoint three um, if it states it's at checkpoint two that might be an oversight on our part but I, my latest um, report is that it was at checkpoint three we had previously funded this actually going back I think to the 2012 to 14 capital budget okay and then uh, it is still listed as priority low could you tell me what would it take to raise it to priority medium or high? I, I think a lot, you'll s probably see a pretty consistent theme as it relates to a lot of the road widening projects um, um, with similar priority and that's um, more a reflection on kind of the the goals and, and vision that we've set up as part of our city plan, as part of Connect Edmonton. Um, the work that we've done, and that's where I think um, Councillor Nack's previous questions around trying to get a better understanding of the priority within this subset of, of road improvement projects and the work that we're doing on the mobility network improvements and enhancements that UFCSD is, is leading. So you'll see a report in, in, I believe it's the spring of next year, where you'll start to see more information about the relative priority of various uh, road segments, not as they relate back to the city plan, or Connect Edmonton or Council's goals, but more as they reflect to each other in terms of uh, operational pressures and things like that. All right, and next uh, question is about Charles Ward's fire, fire station. Again, it's uh, been funded to checkpoint three. And uh, so I presume this is uh, in progress to uh, going to checkpoint three, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. From one? Yeah. Sorry, Councillor Banga, that the Charlesworth Firework Fire Station was approved as part of the 2019 to 22 capital budget, but the funds were held in abeyance. Um, so the, the funding was parked and I believe subsequently released. Um, it was 
um, held in abeyance subject to a conversation with council around the use of offsite levies and whether or not that specific piece of infrastructure would be better aligned um, to be funded through through other funding sources or funding tools. So for now, it's a no-go, you would say? There is no active progress or, or work happening on that project um, at this point in time. When the fund is uh, held in abeyance, um, why does it usually uh, get released, like in this case here? from three to, it was already at checkpoint three. Like what What has, it triggers this? It would, it would require a decision by council to release the funds um, held in abeyance. And I, and I believe at the time council decided that they'd be held subject to further discussion around the use of offsite levies and other tools that might be used to fund it because a funding source wasn't identified for the work at the time that the budget was approved. Okay, and uh, going back to Parsons Road, could you be able to tell me what would be the cost going from checkpoint three to checkpoint four? I'd have to dig into that a little bit and find out that value, and I'd, I'd have to get back to you if that's okay. Please. Okay. Okay, and uh, I have one more question. I would then sports park. Phase three. It's been uh, uh, completed to, um, I guess, checkpoint one, and uh, or funded to checkpoint one. And uh, what kind of cost are we looking at uh, to make it to checkpoint two? Sorry, just to confirm, that's phase three of Iverdent Park. This is yeah, a, a park. parking lot, uh, I think it's parking yeah. lot expansion. Um, I can find out what that exact figure is and get back to you. Yeah, if you could send me those details, that'll be great, thanks. Thank you, uh, Councillor Walters. I'll, I'll move a third round for Councillor oh, Walters. I think he's just on to make an amendment. Oh, sorry. Or do you have more questions, Councillor? I do not, but thank you, Councillor Nickel. That's very kind, Anybody? but not, not required. Uh, I will move the following amendments uh, that capital profile CM-30-3030 be increased by $75,000 in 2021 to fund planning and design of new baseball diamonds to checkpoint three with funding from pay as you go. And I'll hold my jets on the uh, larger delivery ask until after this PND is complete. I'll second that. Seconded by Councillor McKean. Okay, are there any other capital amendments at this time? Going once, going twice. All right, so... Um, Mayor, is this the last opportunity? Generally, uh, I didn't say going thrice, so yes. Okay, um, because I would like to have more information on those two items uh, that I did talk about, but I don't have the, the I guess, final numbers for that. Councillor Banga, I'm working as fast as I can, but Iverdent Phase 3 is 1.55 to get from Checkpoint 3 to Checkpoint 5. And I'm just waiting on the Parsons Road one. I'll get that hopefully in a few seconds. Why don't we take a two, three minute recess here to tidy up those numbers and allow clerks to uh, assemble all, because we'll actually move into debate and voting on the capital amendments here. So we'll let um, the final one be built uh, or ones be built for Councillor Banga here, and then we'll have the list in a few minutes. So is that helpful, Madam Clerk? That would be so helpful. And can you give us five or ten minutes? Because prior to com, prior to Council voting, I'd like to make sure that the public has this and they're not all online just okay. yet. Okay, so, so let's pause for five to ten then, and we'll see how far we get before lunch. We may or may not, you know, we'll, we... We might get one or two done. We might get them all done. We'll see. But let's give clerks time to set it up so it can move smoothly. So get a coffee. Uh, uh, hmm? 
Mr. Mayor, just just really quickly, uh, the clerk, the administration uh, suggested a slight revision to mine that it be split into two years. So just so we get it out correctly, we've got um, it, Councillor Henderson. Okay, and that's yeah, the way I'll, it'll show up. I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll, I, I'll just double check that there's no objection to the restatement when we get it, but you can bring that forward once we've once we've got it. If there's any other cleanups to the motions, please liaise with admin now. Let's take a few minutes. Uh, try to come back. Let's say at uh, eleven forty, we'll check in on where we're at. Thanks.
make sure we have every. Present. Thank you, Councilor Hamilton. Present. Thank you, Councilor Henderson. Yep, I'm here. Thank you, Councilor Knack. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Councilor McKean. Still here. Councilor Nichol, I can see. Yes, my present, own two sir. Eyes. Councilor Paquette. I am here. Great. Councilor Walters. Present. Uh, Councilor Banga. Definitely here. Thank you. Councilor Carmel. I'm here. Thank you. Councilor Katarina. Yes. And Councilor Zadik is on deck. Yep. Okay. That's everybody. Um, so we could do a randomized for these or we can just go through them in order. Oh, Councilor Banga. Councillor Banga, do you yes. have the Mayor, wording for I yours to make it? And then we'll two, close them off. I got two profiles. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, Parsons Road, widening to four lanes from checkpoint three to checkpoint four at a cost of zero point eight million dollars. Okay. Seconder? Second. Councillor Nichol seconds, okay. And the other one is uh, um, phase three of Iverden Sports Park uh, from checkpoint three to checkpoint five for $1.55 million. Second. Thank you. Moved and seconded. So now administration has all of them. They had the wording for that previously. So um, the yeah. Do we have a funding source yeah. for those by any chance? Oh, thanks. Good catch. Yeah. I I guess uh, administration is working on them for the, on the possible funding sources. No, you have to specify one, counselor. Otherwise, they're out of order. You can say the pay as you go reserve. Uh, as a placeholder, and we can debate the merits of that. Well. Or you can raise taxes. Pay, it's up to you. <laughs> no, pay, pay as you go. Okay. Okay, Thank so the, the source of funds for both of those will be the pay as you go reserve. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so we have now how many? Five? We Six? have five amendments. Five amendments. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, we can uh, randomize the order of them if you want, or we can just plow through them. Does anyone want to, uh, on a point of order, say that we must, because that's the process that we laid out, or just roll with it in order? Okay, then we'll do them in order. Process question, Councillor Nichol? Yes, on these amendments, are there any associated operating costs of capital that need to be assessed as well? Uh, if not, then it's not a consideration, Your Worship. They may be small, so uh, it's each, just a question. Each capital ask. profile has has that information at a high level, I think. But um, so so we can flip to that in in uh, debate and refer to it and ask questions about that as part of the debate on each okay. by each. Thank basis. you, Your Worship. What I see from these, though. Um, they're predominantly taking to a level of design, not the full commitment to capital infrastructure investment leading to the large operating. Just wanted to be clear. So they actually find IIS, fund IIS positions. <laughs> In the meantime, they're beneficial to the capital or to the operating budget, I would say. Um, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Councillor McKean. Thank you. I just want to make sure that I'm not making a mistake. I'm interested in motions in regard to our arenas and pools and I, I want to make sure that that's more relevant in the operating portion of these discussions not capital correct thank you okay no problem so we will come back to those so uh, what's the first one up I can't remember the order in which they came sorry we're still trying to get the other one we got cap one is is uh to do with Rolly Miles. Okay, Councillor Henderson. 
Yeah, as, as you'll see, um, uh, it has been broken up into two years, uh, 2021 and 2022, um, to get us through to uh, uh, checkpoint three. Uh, it's two different levels of design, so that's the way the motion stated, if that's all right with everybody. Um, Is everyone I, I okay with the restatement? No, I mean that, the new okay, ones that thank we you. don't have yet. So, um, you know, I'm, I think we've spoken about this quite a bit. We heard about it pretty extensively at the public hearing. Um, this isn't new, as you know, I've been, you know, it was one of the things that probably would have been passed two or three years ago, except uh, it just came up late in the, uh, in the order of, of motions that were in front of us. Uh, the, we, the, although uh, we're, we're talking about Scona Pool here as, as $16.1 million to renovate, no one has ever suggested that that was money well spent or should be done, because I think that facility um, is, a, is getting close to the end of its useful life. But it's all we have in the area right now in an area that is, I think, the second densest in the city. And um, uh, if you, you know, basically between Garneau and Strathcona and Queen Alex, it's an area where we have approved a huge amount of new high density development, um, even in the last two or three years. And I suspect there's more coming. And, and it's an area where we have the highest uh, um, um, mode share of people using uh, transportation other than the automobile in the city. So this is exactly the kind of neighborhood that, that has committed to the kind of new vision of the city that we have going forward. And yet what we're talking about doing is taking away uh, their one and only recreation facility in the area uh, with Kona Pool. So, um, so I am, um, you know, I, this, is, this allows us as well, I mean, the community has been really, really fierce that they don't want a bells and whistles kind of project. They want a small local uh, um, uh, system, very different from the kind of way we've been approaching rec centers in the past. I think in some ways it can be a pilot for the way we can go forward with rec centers, which is why I think moving it forward at minimum to the next design stage so we understand what that looks like and what those costs can look like are important. If, but if we don't do it now or if we don't do it in this next a couple of years, we are pushing this project off probably for six years. I think it's a model that is probably very similar to what the other really high density neighborhood where we again have a lot of people that are making the option of living without automobiles. Uh, uh, the Oliver area that I think Councilor McKean will be aware of, very aware of that probably the same kind of challenge is there. And it's another neighborhood ironically where we've had facilities that we're now talking about pulling out. So these are exactly the kind of communities we're trying to build for the future. And, uh, and what they're looking for, I think, is, is a different way of moving forward on, on replacing the facilities they have so that they can live the, the, the kind of existence that is called for in our city plan. So um, this doesn't commit us to building it. Uh, there are reports coming forward, I think, that are, that are looking at, at uh, novel ways in which we could do funding. Um, I, interesting enough, I had a conversation with the folks at IDEA the other day um, who are, this is one of the areas where a lot of their members are very active and they, they brought up the point that they're very interested in seeing ways that we can move this forward because it helps them uh, build their products and move their products forward. Uh, we're getting a report back uh, in February on exactly that. A lot of work has already been done with the community. I had hoped we would have it last week so we would have that to deal with. Um, so, so how we ultimately fund uh, the, the build of it, I think, can be very different from the way we funded the build of these kind of projects in the past. But we can't do that if we don't have a design. We can't do that if we wait another five or six years to even understand what the project looks like. We've already got it to one stage. We've, we've, we've funded it up to uh, checkpoint two. This would allow us to do the next level of design so we can understand specifically what this new kind of rec center would look like that I think will be the model that we'll be needing to use in the future for how we serve the neighborhoods of the future we're trying to build that are described in city plan. So I'm hoping we can finally get this going onto the next stage so that we can have it available for the next council um, to, 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 to move forward, um, hopefully using some, some new uh, methods of funding as well. So that's all I have to say about it. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Councillor Carmel. Uh, thank you. I support just about everything that Councillor Henderson just said. I, my one question is, I believe pay-as-you-go is essentially uh, tax levy funded. 
So my question is, is there room to absorb these and perhaps some of the other ones that are on the list in the current pay-as-you-go uh, fund? Uh, and I'm sorry if I missed this earlier, or is this going to require uh, some sort of um, operating budget increase uh, in the next conversation? So, Councillor Cartmel, currently uh, we have a negative balance in the pay-as-you-go fund, but that said, with what we did with MSP, uh, there is some funding that would be available. We were hoping to hold it for some of the um, pressures we would see next year, but it is available for this. So it would not be an increase to the tax levy right now. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm, I'm just going to uh, move postponement of the motion on the floor to the spring supplemental capital budget adjustment and speak to why. Um, uh, so, and, and I've, I've spoken to Councillor Henderson about this and, and heard loud and clear from the community. I, I guess I need a seconder for postponement. Second. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Uh, so I really want to proceed with this work, but I also want to see what sort of um, bloodbath is waiting for us in the, the budgets that are uh, yet to come down from senior orders of government, which will be a mix of some cuts we're hearing in certain areas to discretionary infrastructure funds like MSI, uh, but also stimulus. And I think that just because we have a little bit of flexibility in, in uh, pay-as-you-go right now, whatever flexibility we have, I, I'm going to argue strongly that we should keep in reserve uh, for the spring supplemental capital. When after uh, the federal stimulus program and the provincial fiscal reckoning that we hear about uh, both hit, then we can reconcile those and prioritize accordingly. So, um, But the other thing I'll say is, is that it's actually with optimism that there might be another funding source for this work precisely available to us by then. Because some of the conversations that I've been having um, um, uh, with folks uh, at the provincial government about uh, what additional tools or offsets might be made available to us uh, in the event that there are, and we understand there will be cuts to MSI. So we're going to have to absorb some amount of... Um, hit to our basic infrastructure funding and projects that are currently funded. We can reasonably anticipate that. So I think we shouldn't take any of our available flexibility and use it to fund anything extra until we see what those budget impacts are, but also see what the, the trade-offs uh, and, and new tools are, because there is some hope there, particularly around CRLs uh, or tax increment financing that I think could be very useful. And I've used this project I've used Winterburn, I've used uh, st uh, station uh, um, uh, and linear uh, capture uplift, um, uh, uh, as well as potentially a funding source for new rec centers and libraries that would not be um, an off-site levy, but instead uh, uh, an amortization-based um, financing strategy using using land value capture and and. Uh, tax increment financing. So I, I think that there's some big uh, financing pieces to work through over the next couple of months. One hit on the discretionary grants, but also potentially some new leverage tools that would help us with this project and potentially others that we may yet debate uh, today. Um, and so uh, be, uh, I'll make a different argument when we come to coronation because that's being fo uh, financed differently. And I think that uh, getting that to shovel ready makes sense to make it eligible for stimulus and then perhaps the top up there and I, I realize I'm speaking a little bit out of turn here I'll call myself back to order uh, uh, that the top up there maybe works with these uh, tax increment financing mechanisms too so all to say on this one I really want to do this but I really want to do it with um, a clear sense of what our uh, fiscal situation is, what our toolkit is, and I think by the spring supplemental, we'll be in a much better position uh, to, uh, uh, to advance it um, with a more confident strategy that we can actually have line of sight to build it too. Because a general tax increase to build it um, the way we've built other rec centers is going to be a tough sell, but a TIF for all that density um, uh, around the neighborhood that, that Councillor Henderson described, uh, I think is, um, is something we can work with the neighborhood to advocate for and unlock a bunch of stimulus activity that couldn't happen otherwise, probably. So 
Um, so so uh, apologies for the postponement. I know the community would love to see this signal, but I think there's too much uncertainty about capital funding right now for us to uh, move this ahead just yet. I would like to be able to do that much more confidently at the spring supplemental. Um, hence the rationale for postponement. Uh, Councillor Knack was the seconder. Yeah. Councillor Henderson on postponement. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to do this because we've postponed this many times. Um, and, uh, you know, part of, part of me would like to tear off the Band-Aid and, uh, and just move forward because I've always sensed in this, ironically, um, good support on Council for this project. Um, something which, ironically, we've never been able to test. Um, but, but people have always made very supportive and encouraging noises about this for, I think, good reasons, and I appreciate that. Um, I, I don't think an extra few months is going to kill us in terms of timing, uh, but anything beyond that, I think, will have a dire consequence. So with huge reluctance, um, I think I'm prepared uh, to let this play out this way right now, uh, but I don't think that window to postpone it further in the spring will be there for us. Um, I, I, I don't think I'd be prepared to, to, to look at doing that another time. So um, with some reluctance, I mean, part of me is very tempted to let this just play out right now, but, uh, but I think we can wait until spring without harming the project. Um, but I, I think we need to recognize in spring we have to make a call on this or we will lose five or six years and, and that will have an impact on what happens in the development of these neighborhoods, uh, which is another thing that we need to keep in mind. So um, I, will, I will very reluctantly support this. Thank you. Please vote on postponement. To spring scuba. I'm a yes. Thank you. That's noted. Yes, for me as well. Thank you, Councillor Carterina. Yes, for Tim. Thank you, Councillor Kurtmel. Councillor Henderson. Yeah, it's coming your way, but clearly not quickly. So I'm a yes, reluctantly. Thank you. We just received it, and Councillor Paquette. Yeah, I've got the. Thank you. We have all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Display the vote. Carried. I hear your reluctance loud and clear, Ben. We'll keep working on this. Find a way. Um, okay, so we're at noon now. Let's pause. Uh, and then at 1.30, we'll have uh, police on operating. Uh, once we're done with them, we'll, we'll excuse them. We'll return to the capital debates. Uh, and once we're done with those, we'll go back to operating questions, then operating motions, then operating debate, uh, then happy Christmas. Plus a few other things that we still have to tidy up. So see you at 1.30.
and the live stream. Good afternoon from Council Chambers. Uh, Chief McPhee, can you hear us okay? Can I get a thumbs up, a hello wave? Oh. Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you great. We're just going to let Mickey in as well, and we're just going to do a quick test so that our EPS colleagues can hear. Hey, Mickey. Hi, Mickey. Can you give me a wave if you can hear me? We just want to do a... Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thanks so much. Councillor Katarina, were you trying to get in there? Sorry if I cut you off. Aileen. Oh, hello, Councillor McKean. Um, my iPad in trying to get into eScribe has, is now telling me I need an updated password, which I don't have. So I think we're working behind the scenes to try to get me that, but I won't be able to vote or get onto eScribe okay, until is, that. Is there, so we're just broadcasting live on the web, but I think what I'll do, I'll talk to Yasser. I believe that uh, when it asks for the updated password, it's time for your monthly reset with your three and three. So uh, I'll get Yasser to get in touch with you because we can probably try to reset that behind the scenes. And once you've reset your three and three within the city's internal network, your eScribe password will automatically update. That's what I suspect too, but I just, I don't know where I go to update is my point. So hopefully you guys can figure that out and let me know. Thank you. Yeah, I'm in the like same boat. If you would like to give me your private login information, I'm happy to take care of that for you. Yeah, uh, I'll reach just, out to your just the steps on how to do it be helpful. Uh, it just happened uh, during the lunch break. I'm sorry, Councillor Biquette, I missed that. What what happened? Uh, the same thing as Councillor McKean over the yeah, lunch break. It's, now I, yeah, it's that time of, um, it's that season where I think people have to reset their uh, their passwords, their three and three passwords. So if you happen to be logged into the city's network. You should be able to do that, but I'll take it offline and I'll send all of you a quick link. You should be able to reset your password remotely and that'll update eScribe automatically. But uh, give me a couple of seconds and I'll see what I can do for you. Aileen, is it, Hi, is it your suggestion is, that we do not curse right now without our mics off? We don't curse ever, Councillor McKean. I, I know you don't. <laughs>
So, counselors, we've just got our friend Daryl here is going to give us a hand. Counselor McKean, are you locked out of your devices or you just need to reset your password? I'm locked out of my eScribe. Are you locked out of your COE email, your Gmail account as well? Uh, you know, I think they're working, but I haven't tried that. And I think they're working. Okay. Councillor Paquette, are you locked out of your whole COE network or are you just locked out of eScribe? Just eScribe, but I'll try it again if Councillor McKean got in. I'll just give mine a shot. Okay, we've got, uh, we've got our friends in OCT are working behind the scenes to get some direct support. So in the meantime, if you're needing to vote, you can either text me or send me your votes and I'll enter them into the system for you confidentially. Thank you. Good afternoon, it's Councilor Zadig. As Acting Mayor, I'm just going to do roll call, but hold off uh, for the Mayor for the next item. Councilor Banga, are you there? Yes, sir, I'm here, Mr. Right. Deputy Mayor. All right, thank you. Councilor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councilor Katarina. Yes. Councillor Esslinger. Good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Councillor Henderson. Yep, I'm here. Councillor Knack. Yes, good afternoon. All right. Councillor McKean. Present. Councillor Nickel here in Chambers. Want to say anything? Still here. Okay. Councillor Paquette. Yes, sir. Councillor Walters. Present. All right. So that's all of council. Don't have a visual on the mayor just yet. We'll, we'll hold out, though. So I th we might be getting started shortly. So the speakers list is open on item, is it 6-1, Tracy? Item 6-1, and uh, the first item up, Councillor Zadig, is questions of the Edmonton Police Commission. 
Thank you. Yes, having established attendance, I will call this to order uh, with the understanding we'll just uh, proceed with questions right now. So on item 6.1, the speaker's list is just being populated. Feel free to click on. No questions? <laughs> Going once? Going twice? I think we might be out of here before Friday. Noting there's a lot of e-scribe issues that I've heard about. Um, make your intentions known if you want to speak. I'm, I'm a little bit interested in the process here. Were we not hearing something from the police or are they just here to answer questions? He, my understanding is uh, it's our opportunity to ask questions right now. I, I can confirm if there's a presentation though. Madame Clerk, are you aware of a presentation? Or? Uh, no, I believe they're just here to answer questions. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm, I, I didn't want to proceed past questions without the mayor, but I guess I would take a, entertain a motion. Yeah, so there's really nothing we can do at the moment. Do you want to just take a couple minute recess and I'll see what I can do to secure location the mayor? Sure. Uh, come, if everyone could come back at uh, 145, if you don't go far, we can assume the same attendance. I don't want to do re um, the roll call again, hopefully. Thank you. Till 145.
Or the, the mayor is still not with us at the moment, and it's unclear when he will be. Um, he's, he's on a, a phone call, I think that's fine to say, that's my update. So next would be, so I, I, we can let the police go, given that there still has been no question, no one's on the board to speak to the police, so I would thank uh, the police for may, having made themselves available on the commission uh, right now, but we won't need to hear from you. Now, the next thing that we would do is proceed with the amendments. CP2 on coronation is next, but I do note that the, near, that the mayor indicated a desire to speak to it, um, and not only to speak to it, perhaps he had some thoughts around it that I think it might be prudent for him to uh, be present for that. And also noting our debate around not randomizing the, the amendments, I'm at a bit of a loss, but I do want to proceed here because a lot of people are waiting for this. So. I would, if anyone wants to click on and, and make a suggestion for hearing um, one of the amendments in a, a different order, I'd be able to entertain that. Councilor Zadig, is the, my amendment's up third, I believe, isn't it? Uh, yes, yours is CP3. So I'd be happy to proceed to CP3. I think that might require a motion, though, just because we, we're going to do this in order. And, and Councilor Esslinger, do you have any objection to us uh, skipping past CP2 right now? Uh, no, I don't, but I can make a motion to move CP3 forward. Okay. I, I don't believe uh, uh, that we need motions, Madam Clerk, to move this, this item up. Could you, could you explain the process to us, please? Sorry, the process is up to, it's up to the chair and up to council how you want to handle this. If you want to just um, wait on CP2 and move to over C, CP3 and there's no objections, okay. please feel free to do so. Are, Thanks. Is, are there any objections to hearing uh, CP3 right now, the, the motion from Councillor Walters? Okay, not hearing any. Uh, there's two people on the board. Sorry, I, yes. I thought it was supposed to be going to be randomization of all the, all the CPs. So, it, it, no. thank you, Councillor Banga. It wasn't going to be randomized after uh, a discussion we had and we were taking them in the order they were received, which is how we got this current uh, numbering system. But the clerk just informed us that it's up to the chair, who is me at the moment. Um, so I, I'm comfortable going to CP3. Do you have any other questions? Councillor McKean, you're on the board as well. Councillor McKean is en route to City Hall at the moment. Okay. He got locked out of his system. So with, with all that out of the way, let's start with uh, CP3, Councillor Walters, if you want to make that motion and, and uh, introduce it. And I do note that Councillor McKean was the one who seconded it. And if he's not able to second it, we'll have to look for another councillor to do so. But go ahead, Councillor Walters. No, he's okay. He seconded it. It's, it's before this. He doesn't have to oh, okay, be here. Ha okay. Okay. So just to introduce this then, uh, this is... You know, a small part of a larger motion I've made at a couple different, uh, you know, at the main capital budget, uh, four-year capital budget, and that it's supplementary last fall, uh, where we just didn't get around to the larger ask, which was around a million dollars to put in uh, somewhere up to 20 uh, new diamonds, uh, baseball diamonds in the city of Edmonton, which these amenities for this sport, I think, uh, are performing a little a little more lackluster than some of our other amenities for uh, some of our other team sports. Uh, and, you know, it's also worth noting that many of our teams, uh, leagues and clubs are uh, being forced to book practice time in communities in the region outside of the city of Edmonton. Uh, so we're not even able to provide the sufficient uh, baseball space for the number of kids playing and the number of leagues and teams that we have. Uh, so this seventy-five thousand is just for the planning and design. So I'm, you know, not gonna, not gonna swing for the fences on this one, uh, but just to get us to first base, so to speak, on understanding where these uh, uh, diamonds can go, uh, what enhancement or uh, to what level they can be built, and gives administration a little bit of time to work with the community uh, to to figure all that out. Uh, you know, this is. You know, simply part of our overall live active health healthy city strategy and goal, but uh, certainly something I've raised a couple times over the years, and I think this is a reasonable request at this period of time. So I'll take any questions people have. <laughs> Thanks for that. We have actually Mayor Iveson was okay. Um, 
Councilor Henderson, questions? I, well, it's hard. This is really hard to do the way we're doing it um, without, you know, because I, you know, clearly the mayor had some thoughts on timing of all of this. Um, and I'm, you know, having having agreed to the postponement of, of SCONA, this is a similar, and I, I support it. I'm, I'm in the same boat. Um, but I don't know. I guess my questions are about urgency or whether this is something that can also wait um, uh, to the to the spring um, SCBA. Well, I suppose I could. This is a very small amount to just do some planning and design work and some engagement work with the community, uh, with the baseball community. Uh, I suppose this can wait perpetually, uh, but you know, and I, I know you're I hear you on that. I mean, I, I, I feel, I feel for you because that's exactly the situation I'm in. Yeah. I just, I don't know. You know, we have a whole package of things here, um, uh, and different rationales for each. I think, well, I think the rationale on the choices that we were making was, was to move the things forward that having them shovel ready for the spring might be of advantage. Uh, well, I think this um, is small, this is a much smaller draw than some of the other asks, but that's why I think it's reasonable for it to proceed today. Okay. Well, those those are those are my questions. I'm I'm um, okay uh, because I you know this and, uh, you know with looking at the whole list. I mean, we're you know there anyway. Okay. Thanks. Any further questions? Um, Councilor Henderson, I just want clarity. Do you feel uncomfortable with uh, proceeding uh, for the vote right now without the mayor present? No. Okay, what I propose that we do is we take this vote and then I will entertain um, operating budget amendments um, and, and then the mayor will be present for, for votes after that. Uh, but I do see that Councillor Hamilton just clicked on. Uh, Councillor Hamilton? I, I know that this isn't going to please Councillor Walters, but um, uh, I, uh, I'm i going to move postponement on it to the spring. This be postponed to the uh, spring budget. Okay. Is there a seconder? I'll second that. Okay. Debate? Uh, to introduce it, I you know I I respect that Councillor Walters really wants to see, uh, uh, and it's not a lot of money. Um, he wants to see some planning go into this. Um, I think we might have a better idea of what uh, loose change we have for capital in the springtime, and I'd be really happy to support it at that time. Um, it is really important that we you know, develop a robust love of baseball in the city. Uh, and I know that's important to the councillor, so I, um, I, I want to see the, that uh, development of those sites as well. Uh, I just want to make sure that we have uh, the capital, at, you know, to, to, to do that with. Thanks. And, and get it all done at once. So. Thank you, councillor. Uh, councillor Walters, questions? Well, I'll just speak to the uh, postponement motion. Okay, go ahead. Uh, you know, we do not have sufficient amenities for the demand in the city right now for this sport. So it's not unlike the previous one where there, you know, pending what happens in the operating budget <laughs> later on, uh, there is a there is some recreation space in that community. Uh, you know, I'm supportive of the last uh, the Rolling Miles project moving forward as quickly as possible as well. It's a much bigger draw on pay as you go. And there's other opportunities. This this is simply we're so far behind here because we didn't invest in these small little neighborhood scale amenities for years, potentially because nobody was championing them. Uh, but the, you know, there's just no need, in my opinion, to wait. Uh, this is a small, very small draw just to get going, and then we know how many of them we can actually build in the spring. So. You know, it's not the end of the world if this gets postponed, but I just don't think it's necessary for something that we've identified long ago is we just need a few more of these because we're actually chasing our own citizens out of Edmonton into Strathcona County, Sherwood Park, Leduc, Spruce Grove, St. Albert to use their ball diamonds. We don't have enough of our own. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks. Councillor Katarina. <clears throat> 
Um, and this is for uh, Adam. Uh, Adam, uh, can you uh, uh, restate uh, the pay as you go? I, I, my concern is the source of funding for a lot of these pay as you go. I, I think I understood that uh, we are in the minus position at this point in time. So how does that square with uh, a funding source uh, for the pay as you go uh, asks? Uh, apologies if I if I was uh, not clear on that. Um, what we've identified, our recommendation from administration is holding the pay as you go that came out of the MSP swap because okay. um, um, because of some of the pressures that we've articulated previously or potential pressures. Um, but based on the MSP swap, we have thirty two point nine million. Um, I'll just confirm here. 32.9 million is in the MSP swap, but we are in a negative position of 7.5 million. So you're looking at about 25 million that we had recommended as administration hold for the, the spring. Okay. And I think that that's what the mayor wanted to speak to as well, too, on some of the strategy. So I, I, I just needed a clarification that actually we shouldn't be, the, the re suggestion is we shouldn't be using pay as you go as a funding source at this point in time that's to be held so okay that that's just a clarification i needed uh yeah even though it's, it, it could be available if that's a decision yeah. we want to go down that route okay that's admin okay that's admin's recommendation that was what we had in the report and we had a previous deficit deficit of 7.5 in pay as you go okay and i think that's where the mayor would like to speak on the strategy as well too so i okay that that's clarification for me and I'll welcome the mayor back into chamber and return the chair. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we, we skipped over CP2 um, out of deference to you, thinking you would want to be around for that. And we're um, entertaining a motion from Councillor Hamilton on CP3 about deferring this item to the spring operating supplemental budget adjustment. And CP3 is the ball diamonds one? Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, thank you for getting things started. Apologies. I was on an intergov call there that went a bit longer than originally scheduled but um, hopefully that will pay by the spring supplemental <laughs> capital budget so uh, uh, with your indulgence okay so uh, next up on postponement uh, is Councillor Cartmel thank you uh, my question is about timing perhaps to Mr. Melista if uh, this funding was to proceed would that allow actual work on on diamond development to proceed uh, next summer, and uh, and I guess to the contrary, if funding doesn't proceed, does that mean that we cannot do any diamond development next summer? Uh, if we were to postpone this to the spring, uh, it'd be very unlikely to see anything happen in 2021. So if it happened now, um, there's a reasonably good chance that we could at least get started. I, without really completing that work on the planning design, it's hard to say if we'd finish, but. Uh, We'd certainly get a start on it probably next year. Okay, thank you. Um, what do we have left in council contingency for 2020? One moment. We have um, 148,000, and I have a report coming forward on Friday asking for 75,000 of that. Uh, for that, for that, that thing. thing. So there would be 73,000 left. Was it seventy-five or seventy you were looking for? You said there, seven. You said some seventy for that. that. Okay, number. so here's here's my suggestion for this one because this is an opportunity to um, to do a bit of design work to get something literally shovel ready for this year. And if some stimulus funds come and we have some flexibility to do some shovel shovel ready projects, and that's going to be the condition for twenty twenty one stimulus is shovel ready. If we spend 75 from contingency now to be shovel ready to build some of these diamonds in 21 with some of those stimulus dollars, um, then we wouldn't lose the construction season. So I'm, I'm going to um, suggest we don't postpone, but that we swap the funding source. Uh, then we can stay true to keeping out of the pay as you go uh, by using a current source of really an incidental amount um, to get some uh, construction projects ready to go. 
uh, between now and spring SOBA if funds are available. And if they're not, then the design's ready for down the road when, when dollars are available. So that, that would be my respectful suggestion is we not postpone, but uh, swap the funding source. Um, next is Councillor... Uh, Councillor Henderson, are you on the first round on postponement, or are you on from before? Yeah, no, I'm. I'm I would be asking about postponement, and I think, and I think, in some ways, you know, the questions that I asked from before were similar, and um, uh, and I, I think you, I think, in some ways, my questions being answered. But I, if one of the templates is to get things ready that we could actually do in the spring, and if this is one of them, then that um, I think changes the picture for me. Um, if this would make it possible to have a project to, to do the planning over the winter so that we can be ready to go in spring. Mr. Melista, you're saying that is possible? Yes, it, it, these are relatively small locations. We're thinking that the 75,000 would allow us to do engagement with the baseball leagues to help them help us understand what locations and what scope of work would be included. And we think we can get that all done by the spring, which is typically May, um, May 2021. So if we had the funding affirmed by that point, we could tender it over the couple of months and then start work probably in July or August of next year. Oh, okay. And so having, having heard that, then I, you know, my original question I think is, is answered that this seems to me to fall into one of those categories of something that there is, there is a useful urgency to, to having it ready to go in the spring. So um, I'm not sure I'd be prepared to support postponement under that circumstance. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Thank you. Again, um, question to Mr. Mleef, sir, uh, is uh, do we really know with this amount of money how, how many diamonds we are going to be able to establish in the city? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think it's it's something that we need to be able to sort out. And without spending this initial 75000 I I couldn't put a number on it exactly. It's largely dependent on the scope and scale of the enhancements that are anticipated at each of these. So it could be as little as seven, it could be as high as 20. And that just goes to um, whether or not we want to do um, a high scale of enhancements on a few locations, or if we wanna do smaller scale enhancements over many locations. And that's really what we need this, this time to do some engagement with the, the baseball community to get a sense of where they, they think it would be better spent and invested, and then we can come back to council with a more informed package of what that looks like. Okay, so as we go into the engagement process, how, how soon can these fields be brought on, on, on stream? I suspect we'd probably be targeting the 2022. Um, I, I'm not a, a baseball player myself, but I imagine they play in the summer. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I think next year would be focused on construction um, and, and establishment of those fields. And then the work would carry over into the spring and then it would be ready for the summer. Okay, and uh, $75,000 uh, wouldn't uh, be able to get, get as much. Would it be? Well, it's it's only the planning and design amount, so it's not for the actual physical, tangible construction. So it's it's really a, a a relatively small effort on the engagement side to work with established groups and, and community groups that are involved in baseball programming. So really targeting our engagement to those groups exclusively, and then it's establishing a prioritized list of locations, and then from that it's just scoping what those enhancements might look like. So it's certainly not a lot of a design effort. Um, it would be fairly high level, but it's enough to at least provide council with um, informed information to allow you to make a decision in the spring. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hamilton. Um, I think finding another funding source addresses sort of the bulk of the issue with the original motion. I'm happy to withdraw the postponement if Councillor Walters, if it's amenable to Councillor Walters to change the funding source. Absolutely. Okay, so um, uh, with consent, can I withdraw this? Certainly. Are there any objections to the withdrawal of postponement? 
Hearing none, uh, thank you for that, Councillor Hamilton. Uh, uh, do you want to make a motion to swap the funding source then? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion to swap the funding source from pay as you go to council contingency. And I understand that there's some flexibility in terms of how much we need left in council contingency, and we may be able to pull from next year's contingency as well, if need be. Uh, right, that, that expenditure will actually be a primarily a 21 exercise anyway. So yeah, we'll, we'll figure out the timing on that. So okay. it would be to draw the 75 from the 2020 council contingency on a one-time basis. That's a friendly, Correct. that's friendly to me. Any objections to that swap? Okay. All right. Then that's amicably amended. Okay. So the, the motion as amended, uh, uh, cap three is before us. Um, any further debate on that? Councilor Walters to close. Uh, no, I'm good. I think let's, before we spend any more money on this conversation, let's, uh, let's move on. I'm ready to vote. Please vote. We're just updating the motion and the amendment is on its way. Yes, from Councillor Piquet. Councillor Cartmel. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Katarina. Uh, yes for me and uh, voting's coming up, up three times now. So. Thank you. Councillor Henderson. Uh, yes. It says it's submitting. It took a while to come up and now it's submitting. So yes. Thank you. Councillor Paquette, we've already recorded your affirmative, and Councillor McKean. I'm a yes. Thank you. We have all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Display the vote. Carried 12 to 1. Okay, let's go back to um, uh, to uh, Cap 2. Councillor Essinger. Thank you. Uh, this motion really allows the Coronation Rec Center to select Scenario 2, which was to build a program. We don't have the additional $36 million at this time, but by moving this motion, we're able to get it shovel ready and uh, reconsider it in the fall or when we have future dollars. So as hard as it is to not to be able to go forward at this time, this is the prudent action at this time to keep it uh, ready to move once we do have dollars. That's it. Thank you, Councillor Essinger. Questions on this? Councillor Zadig? Thanks. So this money would get to checkpoint four for build to program, right? So then the debate about build to program or build to budget is kind of occurring right now, I suppose. Is that correct, uh, Councillor? Yes, the community and the partners have all wished to build the program. The community is pretty strong on if they're going to have it, they wanted to have the uh, program as presented. So they're willing to wait to get that. Okay, thank you. No more questions. Councillor Banga. Thank you. Uh, to the mover, uh, my question is, uh, please remind me, what is uh, uh, option one and what's option two? Option one was to build to budget. We had budgeted 100, uh, set aside 112.3 million for the project. Um, and it would just be uh, the rec center portion for the community. Option two includes uh, space for the velodrome to do bicycling and the ITU, so it's a joint effort and it would combine the two buildings. Right now the pool is a standalone uh, there and so it would bridge that gap. So that is all part of option two. So option two, what does it 
uh, I, how big a dent it makes uh, to our uh, to our finances right now. We were told in the report it's thirty-six million dollars additional to the hundred and twelve point three to build to option two. So that you're not uh, advocating for all this money now, are you? No, I said I would just go at this point. It's about three million to move it to checkpoint four, and then it'll come back in the fall so about or fall SCBA for us to have a future discussion about it. This gets it shovel ready. So three million is the ask right now. It's part of the money that we've set aside. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Yeah, just to be clear, we're not adding the money to, to, to do this. The money's already in the budget parked, correct? So this is really just about giving you permission to spend the money on this bit of design, correct? That's my understanding, yes. Yeah, yeah it doesn't add any. It's what actually, add, that this money is already in the budget and has been for three years, four years? Uh, at least four, but yes, you're correct. Yeah, okay, great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, um so I'll just speak if there are no further questions. Um, so that, that was the point I was going to make, uh, is that as opposed to drawing from the pay-as-you-go, um, this is different uh, because uh, the, the funds are already there and they're specifically appropriated to this capital profile. Again, um, this is actually a bit of, of stimulus and job creation to do this kind of work with the consultants who will do this. And I just made the case uh, in, in the conversation I was having with uh, the finance minister that, because her question was, what can we do, just as with the ball diamonds, what can we do to have shovel-ready product projects ready for stimulus? Um, and I, I made the case at that point, I said, you know, even just pulsing a little bit more of the gas tax to municipalities of all scales across the country right away would give us a chance uh, to, uh, to do some more engineering and design work to get projects ready to be actually shovels in the ground um, for 2021. And so this is another case where we have the opportunity to keep the work going on the consulting side. And it doesn't mean that it will get green lit in, in against all other priorities for funding for construction. And there is still the matter of the top up uh, to build to program. However, further to what I was saying earlier on um, uh, on Rolly Miles, I do think we're going to get some different tools in the toolkit to do some of these kinds of projects. And when it comes time for construction financing, uh, we may be able to look at some of the catalyst effects of something like this and see if we can capture and earmark some of those. And that wouldn't cover something as large as coronation on its own, maybe, uh, with these levels of density uh, in, in the surrounding neighborhood. But um, as the mall gets reinvested and, and other sites around it get redeveloped at, at medium to higher density uh, and create uh, further demand for these community uh, recreation uh, uh, facilities, the top up to keep it at at um, at full scope, uh, so that it actually meets all those community needs and keeps the partner funding at the table. I, I think there might be something there. Again, we won't know more until the spring, um, uh, but uh, I think if we can keep the work uh, trucking along, so that if that all works out, we could. Uh, and, and ultimately the next council would have the opportunity to move ahead with that. Um, I think this keeps it in the mix without having to draw down any um, uh, flexibility in the pay-as-you-go. So I'm going to support this um, on, on the basis of all of that. Um, anybody else wishing to speak? Councillor Esslinger? To close? I think it's self-explanatory. I just think we're keeping it alive um, and getting it ready to the work in the fall. We can have that future conversation, so please support. Thank you. Uh, please vote on OP2. Yes for me, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. It's just on its way to you now. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. I'm a yes. Thank you. We got your vote. Yes for me too, please. Thanks, Councillor Benga. 
Yes. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel, and we're just waiting for one. It's not coming up for me at all. Yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the vote, please. Carry 12 to 1. Okay, cap 4. Councillor Banga. Thank you. So, uh, uh, I don't want to sound like a broken record here. Uh, this Parsons Road widening. I think this is the fourth time I, I'm bringing it forward for Council's uh, consideration. Uh, this portion of uh, the road, uh, it uh, used to serve Ellerslie, Walker Lake and Summerside, but now we probably have the biggest uh, neighborhood uh, that is orchards and pretty dense neighborhood too. Uh, that is built and uh, this portion of the road is so congested uh, that uh, my office hears uh, from people almost on a daily basis. Um, this portion uh, of the road uh, is a four lane already through developer initiated construction uh, south of Ellerslie, however, uh, the missing part is from 23 Avenue to uh, south to Ellerslie Road. Uh, again, uh, it is not just uh, uh, south uh, south of Anthony Handy that it serves. It also serves South Common and uh, all the development that's uh, south of Anthony Handy and eventually uh, even trail to 41 Avenue. Uh, so, needless to say, this is, uh, uh, I know times are tough. This is, uh, I'm not asking uh, that we build it today. All I'm asking is uh, that, again, uh, if it is, uh, there is work being done on it, at least uh, uh, it would be, uh, again, if not shovel ready, at, at least close to be shovel ready so that just in case we have uh, infrastructure uh, money available from uh, other levels of the government, um, we have this project ready. And uh, again, uh, this is probably the fourth time that I'm bringing it forward. Uh, uh, again, uh, I'm, if for the eventual construction, I'm, uh, I'm counting on the stimulus from other levels of the government for now. I just want uh, to see that uh, that the citizens uh, know that we're actually doing something rather than postponing it, uh, I guess, budget after budget. So I'm uh, asking all my council, uh, council colleagues to uh, please support it. I, it's uh, pay as you go. And uh, again, uh, the motion is uh, that this is a uh, profile CM999000 uh, uh, be, uh, I guess, approved and uh, uh, to move the project from uh, checkpoint 3 to checkpoint 4 to pay as you go. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Melissa, just wanted to ask, do we have, or Ms. McCabe, do we have an actual date for that report in the spring that's coming back on prioritization and road upgrades? Uh, Councilor Knack, it'll be in April or May. April or May, okay. Uh, so it would be in advance of uh, the, sp uh, the spring capital budget adjustment. Is that fair? It should be, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. That's a, so then maybe just on a, on a prioritization piece, um, because I, I think the challenge that I run into is that, you know, I, I had brought forward, um, in late 2018, a motion to fund the next design work on 215th street. And that was by reallocating existing funds from an existing project and council said no. Um, so we don't have a, a clear indication yet of, uh, of where this falls overall in all of the road priorities right now, correct? Hey, Mr. That's correct. Right. In absence yeah. of that work, um, 
um, coming forward yet. We we don't have a prioritized list of any kind yet that we can present council. So yeah, we, uh, there'd be no way to know right now if Parsons Road would be over top of Winterburn Road or below. Uh, likewise, all of the other arterial roads that we're responsible for, because we have about $250 million worth of work of, of our own inventory. So the spring report is going to say, if you want to take a different approach here are the right turn bays you might put in. Here's the turning signals you might introduce that might allow for more targeted improvements across the entire city um, using a smaller amount of money trying to reach more places. Is that sort of the goal and intent? That's correct, Councilor Knack. And what I would say is that um, with the approval of the city plan and alignment of the city plan to our capital budget in terms of the prioritization process, we would see limited number of roadway widenings suggested um, in the future. Yeah, okay. I, I know the mover probably doesn't want me to move another postponement, but but recognizing a, an element of fairness uh, for all members of council that have arterial roads, I will move that we postpone this till uh, the spring so we can have that other conversation first. Second. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knack, seconded by Councillor McKean, to move postponement of this uh, motion on the floor to the spring scuba. Um, and I think you articulated the rationale why, though you could speak for up to five more minutes if you want. No? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that I is think wise. I've said enough. Thank you. Good self-governance. Uh, Councillor Henderson is next, though. Yeah, no, I, uh, uh, Councilman Nack asked most of my questions. There's only one more. I'm noting, looking at the chart that we have, that it's already funded up to checkpoint three, but we've actually only completed up to checkpoint two, um, unless the chart is wrong. So, so there is work that's already funded to continue on this, correct? Uh, Councillor Henderson, I think Councillor Benga uh, identified that through the first or earlier round of questions already in it. It is, I, I believe, an, an oversight on our part in, in terms of the information in that chart. The project is at checkpoint three right now. And it's completed to checkpoint three. Sorry, okay, I'm, I apologize that I missed that before. Okay, thanks. Um, any other questions on postponement? Speaking to postponement? Hearing none, Councillor Knack to close on postponement? No? Okay. Yeah, said it all. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Please vote on postponement of CAP 4. Yes. We've got your vote, Councillor Paquette. Yeah, I, oh, there it is. Oh, it came and went. I'm a yes. Thank you. We're just waiting for one more. We have all the votes. Display the vote. Uh, that's carried 12-1 uh, to postpone. Okay. Um, uh, cap 5. Councilor Banga. Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, with your permission, uh, I am withdrawing this motion, if that's okay. Uh, it is. This was to go from three to five, right? Three to five. Um, I, and, I've, uh, I've actually got a, I, I'm, I might agree to withdrawal, but I actually just have one question about it before we do withdrawal, if you don't mind. No, no, no issues with the question. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. Well, it's actually for administration, which would just be, what does it take to get it to, as we've talked about, um, checkpoint four, so that it might be shovel ready in the following year. I'm going to have to break that apart and and get back to you fairly quickly here. I don't have that broken down on my fingertips here. But construction would be 2022 anyway. I, I suspect for this work, this would be more challenging. It's primarily the scope relates to the parking lot expansion um, and some of the hard surfacing work. If there's a good reasonable chance like the baseball diamonds that we could get it tendered in the summer or um, and get a early work started in the fall. But I think we'd be hard pressed to have it complete um, certainly by next year. 
So that it wouldn't be eligible for the MSP dollars then, because we have some dollars that might, this could maybe fit into in the parks and open space development, or would this stretch we're, the five categories that we have? So our MSP submissions have already gone into the province, and the scope of work that we've identified, um, that we've shared with Council earlier, comprises of, uh, it's $6 million altogether, uh, made up of two um, separate envelopes within that. One that looks at playground redevelopment in some of our um, older communities where um, communities haven't been able to access or leverage the MPDP funding. So looking at redeveloping some of our older playgrounds that exist within the city. And then the second part of that is an envelope around um, the tree canopy expansion, which um, includes 1,500 trees and approximately 20 acres of naturalized so um, we probably have to work at reapplying or readjusting. We'd have to go back to the province to okay. adjust. No, our yeah, no, we don't want to do that. We don't. We don't want to do that. Um, I just wondered how wide those composites were and whether there was room to gather up something like this in those composites for MSP. But this might be a good candidate if there are again some more uh, composites that with low operating impacts. Uh, some of those other kinds of things that come forward under stimulus. And that, so I'm wondering the same thing about what does it take to get this one shovel ready to go when when those come. But but I think maybe what we'll do is if that's not likely to be 2021 construction anyway, then I'd just encourage Councillor Banga to look into what's needed to keep this one going uh, and then perhaps look at a checkpoint four design motion or eligibility for some stimulus when we come back in the spring. Uh, so if he's prepared to withdraw it, I'm, 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 I wouldn't object to that. Um, and then I think we can look at this, look at this one again. Um, Mr. Mayor, I would, uh, if I can amend my own motion uh, to check point four. Uh, I don't have all the details yet, uh, the ones you asked, but uh, I would be more than happy with that. And then I would uh, not withdraw my motion. Well, Mr. Malista said he would need a minute to figure out what the checkpoint four portion of this would be. I've got Again, it. All the oh, he's got he's the got the number. Reason. He's got the number. It, yeah, the split there based on the cash flow was three hundred thousand to checkpoint four, one point two five to checkpoint five, and it's split over the two years. So it would be three hundred thousand to get to checkpoint four. Well, let me help you out, Councillor Banga. I'll move an uh, amendment to. Um, uh, reduce it to 300,000 uh, in 2021 and checkpoint four um, instead of checkpoint five. I'll second that for you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Nichol. Okay. Are you Thank donating you. the money in 2022? Strike the 2022. Thank you. Yeah. Construction would, would have to come later. So, okay. Um, Funding source, uh, Mr. Mayor. It's still listed as the pay as you go. But let's just, let's, uh, uh, Councillor Banga uh, was going to take it at pretty much as friendly to go down to 30 there, or 300. There can still be a discussion about timing or funding source or postponement, but this is just to change the scope first. Other amendments could follow or postponements could follow. So. Is there, maybe I'll just check, is there any objection to, to a friendly amendment to 300 and checkpoint four? Not hearing any, okay. Uh, so that's now the motion that's before us here. Any further questions? Debate? Mr. Mayor, I think Councillor Paquette is uh, looking. Is locked out of East Grab. You might want to jump in. Oh, no, I don't have any objections. Um, so, okay. Um, if there's nobody else to speak, Councillor Banga to close. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for uh, uh, helping me out with uh, the schematics of this thing. Uh, again, uh, I just want to um, say that uh, Iver Dent Sports Park uh, is uh, uh, three um, multi-purpose facilities with uh, 
which the re residents of the city with sports such as soccer, um, uh, rugby, and other ethnic supports, uh, especially kabaddi and baseball, uh, sorry, basketball, and uh, uh, other sports. Um, and also frisbee tournament, it was held in that park. Uh, that was a national frisbee tournament. Anyway, um, this is a resource that we have already. We are not putting any money into into building anything other than maximizing our investment. That is uh, uh, basically keep this thing going, uh, planning at least, uh, and then see how to move it to checkpoint four so that uh, this eventually, if it uh, somehow fits into the plan of uh, um, stimulus and then either level of the government, then it would be ready to go. Right now, it's a small ask. I know uh, we're tied for dollars. Uh, I totally um, understand that. But uh, I know there is barely any room, but I think uh, uh, we can adjust this small ask and uh, I know it's three hundred thousand dollars, but uh, and this is an effort to um, make sure we are maximizing the usability of our own assets. And uh, I am hoping that, uh, and actually urge my colleagues to please support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Please vote. No. Yes, for me, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katerina. Councillor McKean? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton? It is not accepting my vote, but I'm a yes. Thank you, and Councillor Cartmel. Yes. Okay, thank you. We have all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried 10 to 3. Okay. Um, those are the capital changes. Um, so let's now uh, take just a moment to uh, repopulate the speakers list here and uh, get ready for resuming operating questions. Mr. Mayor, can you put me on that list? I can't get through my easy card here. We, th we will, the original list from the operating should still be live. So Tracy's just going to go and load it back up, but it should all be there. We'll just take a week. If you could just. How are you? Are you next up? Cool, I have all my Councillor McKean, your uh, some background noise there. There we go. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Councillor Walters, you'd selected this. Did you have questions on the operating? I, I don't need to go first, though. Okay. Uh, Councillor Nickel, then. I can go first, if you like. Tony, Tony selected it, really. <laughs> Councillor Katarina, go ahead. Uh, well, okay, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, but I did call in at 8 o'clock this morning, so um, I, I have two amendments that I'd like to put on the floor right now, Mr. Mayor. Okay. So uh, uh, the first one is uh, uh, that the reduction strategy uh, number 35 to 39, facility closures uh, 1.2 million included in attachment three of the November 16, 2020 Financial and Corporate Service Report to FCS 00078 be added back 
to the uh, 2021 operating budget and be funded through an increase in the 2021 tax levy. Second. Seconded by Councilor McKean. And okay. McKean, yeah. And uh, the second one I have here is uh, that the community standards and neighborhoods uh, expenditure budget be increased by $297,000 in 2021 on a multi-year basis for two years to provide funding for Alberta Avenue and Jasper Place revitalization with funding from a transfer from the appropriated financial stability reserve. And I believe Councillor Knack would second to that. Yes, please second. Okay, that's in order. We might need a little clarification on the timing of the, you wanna fund that over 21 and 22? Uh, the Alberta Avenue one, yes. Yeah. Uh, they basically rationale they lost this year. No, 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 no. I'm okay. not looking for the rationale. You can get to it when I speak yeah. to it. But just to be clear, the timing is 290 two in each yeah. year. Yeah, 290 so, over. No, it's over. It's over two years, I believe. So 140 right. something in 2021, 140 something in 2022, or there's a the total over two years is 290. That, that's what I understand. Okay, okay. so that's, a, that's an amendment to the 21 budget and a 22 budget on a one-time basis with the source from, from the thing. Okay, well, just, just that's enough to, to clarify and get the wording of the motion for you, but uh, that's all I need. Okay. I'll come back to you on the rationale when we get into debate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Um, uh, did you have any questions? Uh, no, no, uh, Mr. Okay. Mayor. That that was uh, just wanted to put those on the floor and uh, in due time. Cool, uh, Councillor Nickel. Thank you very much, uh, Your Worship. So, Miss Pearson, I have some questions regarding the EdTel Ed -Tel Endowment Fund. The last report we had on the EdTel Endowment, I believe, was December thirty first. In terms of our report, I have it here in front of me. So I would like some updated numbers with regards to the EdTel Endowment and its funds uh, that are contained in, in terms of their amounts. So I understand we have a money market fund, a short-term fund, a balance fund, a long-term disability, and a pension fund consisting of the EdTel. Is that correct? Have I missed any? I believe that is correct. I believe I have Sandy McPherson on who, could, Sandy, who can answer yeah. some of your questions. Is that correct, Sandy? It looks like he has to be messaged on, Councillor, but I will make sure. I just, I'm just missing Miss Badbury as well, so. Sandy, can you hear us okay? So while we're tracking them down, just I just wanted to clarify that those are those are different funds. They're not they're not within the EdTel endowment fund. So you have EdTel endowment fund, a balance fund, short term money market fund. So those are separate funds. Thank you. So yeah, can you hear me? Can so you hear me? If you could break this down for me, then uh, what amount of money are sitting in the, all those respective funds at present? What's our market value? Sandy, can you hear us okay? I can come back around, Mr. Mayor, because I do need the amounts. Okay. We can come back to you. Uh, um... Hello, can you hear me? Oh, there she is. Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear us? Yes, yes. Marvelous. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, my audio wasn't working. Um, Do you want to put the question so, again, yes. Council? Yeah, so yes, you're, you're quite right, um, Councillor Nickel. Uh, those are the various funds uh, that we currently have. So okay. there's the money, money market fund, short-term bond fund, balanced fund, long-term disability fund, pension fund, and EdTel endowment fund. So let's start with the EdTel. What is the present market value of our EdTel fund? 
So that one is hovering right around nine hundred million as of the end of November, Councillor Nickel. Uh, the money market fund. Um, that one, I uh, that that is fairly cyclical, but that one, it it, um, it it it's right around let's say seven hundred fifty million or so. Okay, thank you. The short term bond uh, short term uh, bond fund. Yeah, that one is three hundred and twenty five million or so. Balance fund. That one is right around eight hundred million. And just for the uh, just for information's sake, long term disability and the pension fund. Yeah, so those are obviously in trust. They're outside of you know the city's financial assets per se. Yeah. Um, so I, the pension I, fund is two hundred fifty million, and the long term disability fund is right around one hundred and fifty million. One hundred and fifty million. So, uh, and these are up-to-date numbers because we have not had a, we, uh, we were, I understand this was supposed to come to executive committee, uh, Ms. Pearson, but we had COVID, so that I guess this report has been in the wings with regards to the status of these funds. I, I thought we had provided an update by memo, but uh, that's fine. I could be wrong, okay, I could be wrong, but we got the numbers here today. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to make the following motion, and uh, so that the administration return to council in Q1 uh, with the motion. Yes, I'm making a motion, Councillor Walters. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'll, do I'll do it again. Carry on, Councillor Nicole. Jeez. That the administration returned to council in Q1 2021 with the necessary amendments to the EdTel Endowment Fund bylaw to draw down a total of 93.8 million, comprised of 64 million from the EdTel Endowment Fund, so as to fund the proposed operating budget changes to the 2021 operating budget, as outlined in Attachment 2 of the Financial Strategy Services December 7, 2020 report, FCS 00078 on a one-time basis and an additional $34.3 million from the EdTail Endowment Fund to be used to provide a 2% tax reduction in 2021 and report back to Council at the 2021 Spring SOBA with an ongoing reduction strategies of $98.3 million starting in 2022, future impacts, mitigation strategies, timelines to replenish the funds removed plus interest occurred in the reserve balances over the same time period. Um, I can't accept that motion in its current form because it makes ongoing adjustments to the budget using a one-time source. So um, I'm, I'm going to suggest that you take the m motion offline with Ms. Pearson to just, because there's some timing issues, we did this once before, you may recall, um, because you can't reduce the ongoing tax levy on an ongoing basis using a one-time source, um, unless there's a putback strategy for the following year. So, so I, I understand what you're trying to do, and there's a way to craft the motion. I just, I think, uh, I'm going to suggest that we move on, um, and and that perhaps over the break. Uh, or we can take a recess if you'd like some advice now on how to craft the motion. Well, I think that we have all these other folks here. That's fine. I did sit down with the clerk to work it out. But uh, if Ms. Pearson wants some comments on it, uh, I'd be happy to get that. But you understand the direction I'm going with this? Yeah, draw down, draw down um, the um, Ed the EdTel fund, fund uh, to create 90 million sum on a one-time basis to offset the cuts proposed by administration and provide an additional 2% uh, tax reduction on a one-time basis. Yes, that's my intent, sir. Okay, what's what's needed because it's a multi-year budget is what happens in 2022 for that motion to be in order. Okay. Uh, I'm just looking at Ms. Pearson. Do, we, do you have five minutes to do this? Why, why don't we take a recess? Why don't, why don't we take a five-minute recess and and uh, just uh, uh, I provide Councillor Nickel an opportunity to to confer with uh, the clerks and Miss Pearson? If there's no objection to a five-minute recess, okay, let's pause there.
I am. Super. Councilor Just Henderson. one moment, Mr. Mayor. I'm understanding Ms. Pearson and the clerk agree that this motion is in order. And it's for. Can I take attendance first and make sure everyone's uh, here for the procedural discussion we're going to have? Oh, I'm so, I'm, I'm so. I assumed we, everyone was still sitting here. Uh, Councillor Henderson? Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Knack? Yes, good afternoon. Thank you. Councillor McKean? I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Nickel? Obviously. Present. Councillor Paquette? I'm here. Councillor Walters? I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Banga? Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Councillor Car Cartmel. I'm here, yep. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Yes. Councillor Zadek? Yep. And Councillor Essinger? I'm here. Okay. So, uh, 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 Councillor um, Nickel, you were, you wish to challenge the ruling of the chair? <laughs> I did do this with, in association with the clerk and in discussion with Ms. Pearson. Uh, if they would like to provide comment, uh, I believe they both have also believed that this motion is in order. I haven't actually seen the wording, so I, I made some assumptions based as it was being read out. It's quite complex, so... Um, but I'm happy to see the wording up on the screen and walk through it. Getting it on the screen when it's not on the floor is a bit of a challenge, but we'll put it in the chat and I'm happy to print it. That'd be great. Yeah, no, it. if you can just throw it in the chat, that's all we need. And just a correction, Councillor Nickel, it's 98.3 million, not 93.8 million. Sorry. That was, that was my I had the wrong, yes, that was the old sheet. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I think there are several issues with the motion, but perhaps better to debate those issues than have a procedural fracas over, um, uh, yeah, and debate those on the merits rather than on, um, on, uh, on the mechanics. Um, so, but I, I, the problem is this amends this budget presuming an act of council in the future, which is the, the change to bylaws. Uh, so it's not it, it presumes the availability of funds that are only available if if there are those bylaw changes. So it's a strategy that could be explored between now and mill rate, uh, but to presume the, avail the availability of the funds and then to, to reinstate all of the other things on that assumption. Uh, I originally, the reason I was in, in a, uh, as chair, I'm in a bit of a quandary on this is that as I heard the motion being read in, I thought, oh, this is an interesting subsequent, and this strategy could be played out, and then the options could be considered. But as the, as the motion concludes, it says, do these things now, premised on this thing happening in the future. So, um, But I'm also very conscious of the fact that if I rule the motion out of order on procedural grounds, uh, how that will be um, characterized, So, uh, based on what happened last time. So quite honestly, I... Uh, look to the assembly for guidance. Well, Mr. Mayor, my 
my opinion is, is this. First, we have to start with the uh, willingness of council to uh, draw down on our EDTEL and our other reserves. And if I can get a seconder on this, perhaps we can get to that point. But if, if the council is not willing to do that, then, then everything is done after that fact, I would think. So I'd, I'd like to proceed forward to discuss it, uh, knowing full well that uh, you're seeing some mechanics issues. And so I'd like to get those out. You know, um, what I'll do is at this point um, um, accept the motion so that it can go into the queue and then it won't get debated until it comes up in the queue and that will give some further opportunity for uh, reflection, possible amendments, further questions. Um, and then at that point, if there are points of order challenging uh, um, the, um, the mechanics of the motion, those could come forward and, and council could test those uh, uh, as council rather than me uh, having to pro preemptively or proactively adjudicate that. So I will accept the motion for the time being and, and council uh, can opine when we get to it on, on what council uh, wishes uh, to do or any process questions council has. So uh, is there a seconder for the motion? I'll second it to get the debate uh, going at the appropriate time. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. Okay, so that will be op three. Thank you. Uh, next up is Councillor Walters. Thank you. Uh, so firstly, I think I, I erred and missed something in capital, but just to confirm, uh, Mr. Malista, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. The, I, I mixed up and thought the LRT winterization service package was a service package and was an operating, but I guess it's a capital profile. <laughs> back in capital and that was 65 grand for planning and design and then a certain amount 300,000 or so to uh, do the uh, uh, work yeah this is essentially the work to enhance the the waiting shelters to ensure the right. proper heating controls and right so this is the winter proofing when we discovered as they get busier and busier and more people it's just yeah so we saw the report at committee. So maybe Mr. Merrill just talk to you offline about some advice on that. Well, um, we, it will be winter again window. next year, so. Yeah, it's something that could wait till spring. Yeah. To discuss and get ready for winter as opposed to, it's not a summer project. Well, it would be good for it to be done next summer, but I'll think about that. Um, well, technically we didn't, um, <laughs> I forgot to ask for a postponement motion or a, or whatever it is to take capital off, and we haven't voted on capital yet. But but yeah, no. I'd I'd recommend spring. Uh, and and we might have just ended up there anyways. Yeah. Uh, the transit yeah. peace officers pilot program. So that that coming to an end. That does I just want to confirm because it says in the report in the in the actual budget report that there's no effect in act. You know the number of people that will be working in the LRT stations isn't going to change police and peace officers. Uh, Councillor, we have uh, really worked a lot with uh, with EPS uh, on that piece and uh, believe now that we're at a point now where that that those funds are no longer required. So we believe that it's it's uh, a reasonable okay. And then the, because, you know, I think so much investment in our LRT system, if it isn't safe, we're throwing that, you know, it's just not getting full utilization of that math very large scale investment. So uh, maybe just give me some comfort that we're evaluating that very closely. And if it doesn't work out the way we hope, we're going to come, you're going to come back to us about that. Absolutely. We will, Councillor. Uh, we, we have a transit safety oversight committee. Right. That brings together our, our uh, corporate security with EPS and our transit officers and, and ETS, of course. Uh, so they're, they're monitoring this on a, on a rig on an ongoing basis. Right. So if there are any flags that do surface, um, we'll bring those. We'll bring those to council. Yeah, and, and I just a note to nod to Councillor Essinger that you know the Wave Committee I think stays pretty in tune with transit safety, and this change may be something they want to monitor as well. Um, when we talk about the community investment operating grants, you know we're going to have an opportunity through the community safety and well-being work to kind of look at all of these, the best way to deploy a whole bunch of resources, whether it be through those grants or in poverty, Edmonton or Reach. 
Um, so they do need to re be reviewed, but I wonder about keeping that alive for a year. Uh, what would be your advice on that? You know, Councillor, you know, we, we did a, a deep dive into all our lines of business and, and believe that, to, you know, to get to, you know, the 0% tax increase, right. that these, these are the options that, are, that we're bringing forward. Um, I got it. How much, uh, how much money are, is in, in Poverty Edmonton's budget annually right now? Well, Councillor, let us dig that up uh, and we'll, we'll get that to you over the course of the meeting. Okay. Uh, and then, so Councillor Katarina's motion, I think I, I didn't, it's just to confirm that it was for all of the, the rec, the East Glen, Oliver, Scona, and the two rinks. Uh, that, it? that, that's correct, Councillor. And it also includes the expenditures in the recreation branch, as well as in the fleet and facility services branch. So it's both of those areas that, that would have saved money. Okay, so that, I'm just confirming, maybe Mr. Mayor, the clerk, the motion is, I'm just, oh, I see you've sent it to us, Aileen, so I can answer my own question in a second here. Um, okay, well, hopefully there's a, another source of funding for that, to support that motion. Um, you know, I think that's something we should consider as we go through this debate. I think the value in those open is important, but... Um, and this council work very quickly before you close. Um, the end poverty Edmonton budget operating budget per year is seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Oh, Oh, seven fifty k. Okay, okay. And that's operating and in, in, in any ancillary programs, or that's just the amount. That's the allocation they get from the tax library every year. Is seven fifty. I believe that's the allocation they get. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Carmel. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go back to one of the slides that was put up uh, this morning in the presentation, slide seven, which spoke to operating impacts of capital. I uh, give you a, Maya, a moment to find that, Ms. Pearson. Uh, and I. I'm not belaboring any particular project, just to be perfectly clear, but the top line in that slide says Valley Line, uh, South LRT, uh, an increase of operating impacts of in 2021 of 7.6 million and in 2022 of 18.7 million. Are those additive? Is that being written like a, a profile? So that in, in actual dollars, it would be 7.6 in 2021 and uh, roughly 16.3 in 2022. Pardon me, 26.3 in 2022. Those are total annual operating impacts of capital, so not, not incremental. So that's, so that's the total impact of each of those projects in 2021 and a total impact in 2022, not incremental. Yes. Correct? Okay. Uh, and I, so that's the operating co cost of capital. And, and it says in 2023 and beyond, so the next line down, Valley Line West, it says not quite 26 million in 2023 and beyond. Is that annual or is that accumulated? That, that would be in some year beyond 2023? That's cumulative. So 2023 and any additional years after that, that's the lump sum. But at some point, it gets to several millions a year. So it's the lump sum for how many years? Let me look into that and I'll get right back to you. Okay, so I guess where I'm going with this is, um, and I, this may be another subsequent motion, but if I make a subsequent motion that asks for the operating imp impact of capital by year, each year until 2030 for, for the projects not yet in operation, you should be able to provide that in a subsequent memo. Is that fair? Estimated, of course. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. And then on page 149 of attachment three, we have a summary of debt and debt servicing. So we have uh, 
debt outstanding at uh, December 31st, 2019, and debt service requirements. I'm assuming the debt service requirement is at either 2019 or 2020. I'll get Ms. Padbury to answer that. Uh, we need a minute, Councillor. Well, I, so again, a similar question, If uh, whether it's 2019 or 2020, it, it looks to me like you've been able to break those out for each of those projects. So a similar question, you should be able to break out the debt service on each of those projects per year from now and until 2030. If I was to make a subsequent motion for a memo to be provided to provide that information. Yes, we could, Councillor, with a subsequent memo. Or so with a subsequent memo. With those subsequent memos, then, uh, one would be able to see what the operating cost, including debt service, is for each one of these projects each year for the next 10 years. And though I'm, re I'm picking 2030 because uh, that would encapsulate the next two four-year capital and operating budget cycles. That is correct, Councillor. Okay. So I will make that subsequent at the appropriate time, Mr. Mayor. I have one question about the budget reduction strategies, and that is with... Uh, park and road services uh, under, let's see, I guess it would be service reductions. And there's a number that are offered, naturalizing stormwater ponds. Um, and there's a couple here that I would like, I'm wondering if you can break out the numbers for me. Uh, elimination of one full trimming cycle, uh, condensing the turf season by, you know, starting midway and ending at the end of September. Those two items, if we, if you can identify what the savings are for those two items that are captured as part of item 68. Uh, Councillor, we can uh, uh, just take a look at that and give you the breakdown. Certainly, just uh, if you give us a little bit of uh, time, we can get that shortly. That's fine. Thank you. If you can just, you can shoot me a text or an email. I appreciate that. Thank you. Those are my questions, uh, Mayor Ibsen. Thank you. Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and just thank you for uh, putting together the, the budget and the detailed presentation. You answered a lot of my questions related to the management piece, so I really appreciate the, the detail. I'll have a bit more follow-up, but I just want to cover a few smaller items. Actually, I'll wait for the JAPS replace revitalization for Councillor Katarina's motion. Uh, Mr. Smythe, I wanted to ask uh, briefly about uh, Orange Hub, and, and maybe this applies a little more broadly to any of our city facilities where we uh, lease out space. There's concern that I think we've budgeted for no decrease in revenue, so no no parties sort of moving out. Uh, my understanding is a lot of nonprofits uh, might not be able to survive financially, so. Is there an opportunity to, to look into that differently what, and get an idea of what, what might be the best way to tackle that? Uh, we can, absolutely, Councillor. Uh, but the, 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 certainly the, some of the tenants in the Orange Hub are at a crisis situation, and, and there will be some that will, will not make it through to basically early next year. Mm -hmm. so and we, but we budgeted for them to be, be paying all of next year right now. So, so if they actually were to leave, we would be short a projected revenue amount right now. That's correct. Although we've been trying to work with the group, and they're certainly yeah. willing to work with us, but there is no real financial information that's coming to the yeah. table at this point in time. So, okay. Councillor, the other thing I would add is that we are working with all of our groups and all of our tenants to access other orders of government's uh, funding mm -hmm. resources as well and making those connections uh, to make sure there's some equitable access to all Edmontonian businesses with respect to um, some of those supports. And I take your point about lease loss, but we are trying to use those avenues first. Oh, absolutely. That that would be preferable. I, I just want to make sure, and I might, I think it'll likely be a subsequent to this conversation to our budget, but I want to make sure if we lose tenants from our spaces because they couldn't access other resources and we've budgeted to collect that full amount, would it in fact be better for us to look at negotiating and working with each of those tenants to keep them on? Because chances are we're not going to fill those spots if they leave. Um, so what what's the best way to maximize total revenue? So I, uh, I think we have a subsequent around that. I just wanted to to double check and make sure there's an opportunity to go and work individually 
with these various tenants um, to, to figure out what the right way to help address their concerns is. So Mr. Smythe, if we have, I think there's, uh, I think um, uh, Mr. Jevney had helped put together subsequent, but I just want to make sure that's sort of what you were thinking, having those one-on-ones to understand what's happening with tenants in our spaces. Absolutely. We, uh, we can move that forward, Councilor. That's what's okay. in our work plan for sure. Okay. Uh, I know this is the, the incredibly small one, but I just want to double check again. My understanding is that, uh, again, for the uh, Office of Mayor and Councillors, we're projected to get a $7,000 increase, but in fact, we're the only branch with an increase. So to remove that, you need a motion uh, so that we do not experience an increase, correct? Correct. Okay, so Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll do that one. It's I know it's uh, pretty inconsequential, but uh, it, it would be that the 2021 operating expenditure budget in Mayor and Councillor's offices be decreased by $7,000 total, just $7,000 on an ongoing basis with funding released to the tax levy. Second. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, whew, there we go, tax decrease. Um, we did it. <laughs> Point zero 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 one. Um, <laughs> Uh, want to ask hey, that, about EPL that again. motion is set you aside. Thank you. Carry on to the next. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Uh, EPL, uh, they've offered the $1.1 million decrease on a multi-year basis for two years, correct? That's how it's, how it's been presented? That is correct. So the motion would be that the operating expenditure budget in Edmonton Public Library be decreased by $1.1 million on a multi-year basis with funding released to the tax levy? That would be correct. Okay, perfect. So that's that's the other motion uh, that I'll make uh, right now, Mr. Mayor, and then I'll come back around to ask some other questions. Uh, seconder for that. I'll second it, Councillor Nickel. Could we possibly state what it is that was just made? Because we're still trying to catch up uh, from the last one. I'll I'll email them to you uh, right now. Yeah, two uh, one point one million. Um, tax levy reduction for two years to uh, the EPL budget and release to reduce the tax levy. Yeah, and I'll have that emailed over t uh, to the clerks uh, right now because I'm out of time and I'll come back on for a second round. Thank you. Um, Councillor Henderson. Uh, yeah, just a whole bunch of smaller questions just so I understand the implications. Actually, the first one was in the report you gave us today. Um, the smart fare operating impacts. I had my, my memory may be incorrect on this, but I actually thought there were operating benefits to the smart fare that was going to save us money in the long run. So that would be, uh, Councillor, when we talk about smart fare, this is the actual operating cost payment that we would have uh, in the event or when it's operational. So because it wasn't operational this year, um, that expenditure didn't happen. Okay, but there would have been offsets to that. I mean, ultimately, that's going to save us money, not cost us money to operate, correct? Correct, yes, because we are, are achieving some savings through having a third party deliver uh, a different type of service, and we reduce some of the maintenance costs and things like servicing, uh, collection, uh, uh, coin processing, and that type of thing. So, so there's probably a net negative to that this year, then? Uh, we can we can look at that number in a little bit more detail, but again, this was the amount that was budgeted uh, as a contract. Uh, okay. Yeah. Item. okay. Um, I'm interested uh, uh, the chemical control of weeds piece, um, and I'm just wondering how that lines up. It says it lines up with our policy, but our policy says that we do the least invasive choice first. That's that's the principle behind our policy. So. This would tend to suggest to me that we're actually going to do the cheapest first rather than the least invasive, which, which is strictly speaking, I think, in contravention for, of our policy. And I just wanted to think that through with you. So, Councillor, we did uh, consider the policy and, and made sure that the interpretation was in alignment with the policy. But certainly, um, you, you know, there, is a, there are two methods to control weeds and certainly the manual method um, is one that uh, doesn't use any chemicals whatsoever, but it does uh, have labor and additional costs. So we were trying to balance the two given um, the, the situation we're faced with. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I have worries, though, that that's a perm that becomes a permanent condition. This is ongoing, correct? This is uh, in the base, yes. So this that would mean that we would go back to the habit of using chemical first. Um, I think right now the the way we're trying to operate is to do things uh, in, in a way that's environment first and. Mm -hmm. Uh, if there are other opportunities to consider them. And because this was a spe specific situation where uh, we were trying to look at ways of doing something differently to achieve a cost savings, um, we took this as a one-off. I think our fundamental basis is still uh, um, a process of looking at the environmental methodology first as opposed to uh, the easier way. Yeah, but but if it's ongoing, it's not a one-off. I mean, that's what that's what's, you know, I can... Because it's not being forward, it's not being put forward as a one-off. Being put forward ongoing, is it not? It, it when I when I said one-off at one program uh, only, I'm, we're not talking about doing this for uh, for other programs. For example, like dandelions or anything like that. This is specific to uh, to the flower beds. Okay, I, I'm 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 nervous about that because I know that there's been friction and tension over the interpretation of that policy already. And this seems to me to to uh, to push it forward. Um, uh, my, my next question is about the REC certificates and what the implications is to that um, to our uh, goals in in um, in, in achieving. Because uh, I mean, we have a commitment. Whether that slows down the, the power purchase agreement piece that we're we're working on right now, or is it separate from that? It's separate from that. It does not slow that down at all, and that's out in the market right now. And the reduction is a modest uh, decrease. It's We're still going to be able to uh, offset 81% of our electricity uh, through uh, through the through the RECs. It, but that those funds were also as a way was also parking parking the resources we would need to do the power purchase agreement. So that's not going to impede that, is it? It's not going to impact the power purchase agreement work at, at all. But we'll still have the resources to do that? Yes, we will. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm interested. I, am I out of time? Sorry, I, I have no way of knowing anymore. My screen yeah, lost no, the timer. I, I, I'm, I'm going to say yes. Okay, I will come around <laughs> for a second round then. Thanks, uh, Councillor Henderson. Um, we, uh, we've got uh, time for two, three more before the break, uh, but I also lost the speaker's list. I'm not sure who is yeah, next. Councillor Zadik is next. We're just refreshing everything. Okay. Councillor Zadik, go ahead. And then Councillor Paquette let me know he couldn't click on, so we'll go there next. I think I was next after that. Okay. All right. Well, we'll go Zadik, McKean, and then we'll see where we're at with the list. Councillor Zadig, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, and I'll be quick. Uh, I think the report and the presentation were great. I just have two amendments, and I'll just read them in. Uh, one is, uh, the first is, the reduction strategy number 58, elimination of spay and neuter services for $0.1 million, included in attachment three of the November 16th, 2020, financial and corporate services FCS 00078, be added back to the 2021 operating budget funded through an increase in the 2021 tax levy. Second. Thank you. <clears throat> and then the next one. Thank you. That's accepted. Okay. Thank you. Um, from the, the one-time COVID uh, book of business here, I'll read that it is that the 2021 operating expenditure budget for the community recreation facilities branch be increased by $1 million dollars on a one-time basis for funding to be provided for the YMCA of Northern Alberta to reopen the Castle Downs family YMCA in 2021 with funding from a transfer from the appropriated financial stabilization reserve. Second. Um, maybe just, I mean, we can get to it under debate, but maybe that should be an up to because they ain't going to open January 1st at the rate we're going here. So that would be very friendly. Okay, I imagine so. But yeah, if we could just put that in up to as the authorization, but not, not a given yet. Um, okay, uh, thank you for those. Um, Councillor McKean. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I might need your advice because I was planning to do something on uh, Tipton and Oliver Arena but I think Councillor Katarina's motion has already dealt with their funds. I believe so. Yeah, so would it be a subsequent 
to ask administration to work with community partners to look at some potential new operating model? Yep. So a subsequent though, not right now. Uh, well, you know what? We can make subsequent motions at any point during the debate, but perhaps when that motion comes up and once we see what the outcome of it is, have a subsequent ready uh, just so that any folks who are watching along can sort of see them happen in sequence. So we can take them whenever in the process. That would be my advice as to the best time. Thank you. Um, and I did want to ask some questions now uh, on work for strategies. Um, and Mr. Mary, you'll jump on me if I'm asking anything that would be better dealt with in private. And I'll, I'll tell you, I want to, and I, Kim Armstrong, I'm sure is on. There she is. Hi, Kim. Um, this, this is a bit of an old bias of mine that came out of a private sector uh, situation where there was, um, there were co cost-cutting measures over a number of years. And what I watched happen was the actual frontline people we would have, maybe they're called content producers now, were cut. Maybe some low level supervisors were cut, but senior management was left untouched largely for years until finally uh, they got to the point where even that was starting to be touched. Um, that seems to me to be a bit of a, well, to be a, a less than, um, fruitful way to do it. And can you assure me that the senior ma management structure of the city of Edmonton was also looked at and maybe there was even some shared pain in our workforce strategies involving senior, the senior level. So I think that would be director on up. I don't know how you'd describe it, but. Uh, yes, I can absolutely assure you of that. And I'm going to try to find quickly the, exact percentages um, um, so sorry I'm trying to manage here okay firstly I can tell you that um, when we talk about senior management we have reduced uh, the percentage of senior managers by 8.7 percent in this round of um, recommended reductions we've reduced the middle management layer by 5.1% and frontline supervisors by 6.8%. So you can see that the highest percentage reduction is in fact in the senior management ranks, um, including some branch manager positions, um, Councillor McKean, as well as director positions. I can also tell you, oh, sorry. Do you have that boiled down into FTEs? Because percentages of a small group is not as significant as a similar percentage in a large group. I will get you the exact number of FTs. Uh, someone's just chatting it to me. I can also tell you that we were cognizant of the need to reduce in scope and out of scope in what I would call a respectfully proportional way. And so we ran the numbers a couple of times and this is an approximation um, because the numbers shift a little bit all the time, but approximately 15.6% of the reductions are in scope uh, employee, sorry, out of scope employees, my apologies, 15.6%. And as I've said a few times, 13% of our workforce is out of scope. So we have reduced the out of scope proportion of our workforce by a higher percentage than their um, percentage uh, of our overall workforce. Um, so senior management, it's four FTEs. Um, middle management, it's 33 FTEs. And the number is coming in a sec for frontline supervisors. There's a frontline supervisor could be uh, doing uh, essentially frontline work a lot of the time, 75, 80% of the time. and be a supervisor for 20% of the time or something. Am I right? Well, I would suggest to you that frontline supervisors do the majority of their work uh, or a, a significant percentage, more than 50% of their work being supervision. However, the key point here is some of those frontline supervisors are in scope and some uh, therefore unionized and some are out of scope. And that's because of the way the auditor did uh, did his work. And it's 84.5 FTEs in that 
lost group. Four and 30 and 84.5. And I don't know what my time is, if I have any time left, Mr. Mayor, I can't tell. I, uh, one last question, let's say. Um, please respond then quickly to the very um, strong allegation or, or suggestion by our union partners that we're leaving a lot of money in, on the table by not uh, rationalizing this um, in, a, in a way that is fairer across the spectrum. I will respond quickly by saying this, just because you believe something does not make it true. We have conducted significant examination of every single in and out of scope supervisory position at the city. Our work has left no stone unturned and we have not privileged or, or not privileged. In other words, we have not differentiated in our work between whether a position was in scope or out of scope. We looked at the work we're doing at service reductions that make sense and the corporate strategy transformation project is examining redundancies in the organization, creating efficiencies, several position eliminations are associated with that work. So I can only say to you, Councillor, I have not seen the evidence to back up that claim. And I've provided you with an enormous amount of detail today so that you could see the rigor that we have undertaken uh, in order to do our work. I uh, always appreciate your answers, Ms. Armstrong. Thank you. We are closing in on 3.30, and I think uh, we should break here so the clerks can do the system reset. Let's come back at try for 3.45 and, uh, and then carry on with whatever the speaker's list is. We'll work to, uh, to rebuild that as best we can. So uh, uh, let's pause there and come back in 16, 17 minutes here. Thanks.
Councillor Hamilton. Hello. Hello, Councillor Henderson. I am here. Good day, Councillor Knack. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you, Councillor McKean. I'm close by. Thank you, Councillor Nickel. Good afternoon. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Thank you, Councillor Walters. Present. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Good to go. Awesome. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadik. Good to go. With my own eyes. And Councillor Essinger. Good afternoon. Cool. So what we were just debating here a little bit, and we don't have to decide right now, we can decide when we get close to 5.30, is uh, the merits of continuing tonight versus uh, pausing where we're at uh, towards dinner, and if we're confident we can finish that we've only got a few hours worth of work to do, less than a day full's worth of work to do on Friday, we could come back then rather than work into the evening. That's an option. We've been going hard the last little while, so something to think about. On the other hand, if we are very close and wish to finish, uh, uh, eat into the dinner break and, and get it done, uh, that's also an option for us. Um, I suspect it won't move that fast, but um, I'm notoriously bad at estimating these things, as, as, as you know. So anyway, just something to bear in mind as we work through questions uh, and then potentially starting debate on some motions. We'll see how far we get today. So um, um, who did, did, were we able to recover a speaker's list there? So um, we've been able to augment a system and so okay. right now what's on the screen what we're going to do is after each of you speak and I know you probably can't see that so right now it, it reads uh, Mayor Iveson, Councillor Banga, Councillor Esslinger, Councillor Knack, Councillor Katarina and I can't see who's beneath that. Um, after each of you speak we'll delete it and then that way you'll okay. be able to see the name and that way you can actually see the, the clock. We're on with eScribe right now to reset the whole system. Sure. So um, Councillor Paquette is still on the first round as well along with Councillor Banga and Councillor Essinger. So I will go to Councillor Banga, Councillor Essinger and Councillor Paquette. Uh, then I'll go and then we'll get into the second round there. So uh, Councillor Banga. Thank you Mr. Mayor. Um, I, my first question is for uh, for the administration. I know uh, it is uh, recommended that the community investment operating grant be discontinued and uh, the savings uh, applied to tax savings. Uh, my question is, uh, what are we doing with the $11 million that was uh, I guess uh, saved uh, earlier last month from the police budget. Councillor, we have that uh, uh, in the F set aside right now uh, for determination of what the committee will do. The task force will will recommend. Okay. In the meantime, I know. Uh, uh, C O C I O G is uh, is recommended for uh, I guess uh, termination till we develop some kind of community wellness strategy. Is it possible to fund, or can can we use those funds to continue uh, C I O G for another year? And then we reevaluate again. Councillor Benga, that that would be a possibility with the reevaluation, acknowledging you'd be using a one time, potentially a one time funding source for an ongoing program. But yes, that is an option. Yeah, that it will be one time, Mr. Mayor. When the time comes, uh, I would like to make that motion that we use uh, 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 that three point. Seven five million from the police saving budget for one year and apply to community investment operating grant. Second. Councillor Paquette has seconded that. I um, had been working on some wording with him to that effect, so I'll put that wording into the chat along with a possible subsequent that uh, perhaps Councillor Paquette can, can put forward on that. Um, 
so uh, thank you for that. That's uh, that's accepted. There's a little bit uh, slightly different wording in the chat here, but the substance is understood. So thank you, Councillor Banga. You're welcome. Um, Councillor Knack. Oh no, you're on the, uh, I'm on the, you're on the second, second round, round, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Councillor sorry. Pa Councillor Paquette. Yeah, actually, I was going to make a motion pretty much identical to uh, Councillor Bangas. I, I do have a subsequent on that, and I'm just wondering when the appropriate time to give that would be. Uh, you could um, read it in now, and what we'll do is understand that it's attached to op whichever uh, that uh, Councillor Banga just did, and we can potentially tether them together uh, when the time comes. Okay, so the uh, subsequent... Subsequent would be that administration work with the Community Services Advisory Board and reimagine the Community Investment Operating Grant for 2022 to create an operating subsidy that aligns with and advances the goals and outcomes of city plan and the social priorities identified by the Social Development Branch and create a service, uh, service package uh, for the same. Thank you. I'll second that. Um... Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Did you have any other questions on the on the budget? Um, yeah, I do actually. Um, previous to today's discussion, I, I was asking administration about taxation and assessment, and uh, I feel like I didn't get a robust answer on the risk analysis. And I understand that may be sensitive to discuss here, but I would like to know if this maybe needs a slight readjustment to ensure capacity is available. What's your question, Councillor Paquette? Uh, I, do we need a slight uh, readjustment on uh, how we are approaching the uh, taxation assessment uh, branch to ensure capacity is available? Uh, for example, in the event of uh, um, uh, appeals, will we have enough staff to properly address those appeals, or does it look like we may actually uh, end up foregoing uh, much needed revenue that type of concept we feel we can manage on the basis of the adjustments that have been put forward okay well if you are confident then uh, there's no need for me to make a motion okay and um, I did have another question and uh, this is more for comms and uh, you know I am just curious um, we set aside, I recall, a chunk of change for comms on, uh, on the housing uh, front. And since Pekawewin and, uh, and the pandemic and the massive realization in the public that we actually do require uh, this housing and the fact that we're moving forward, I'm just wondering if any of that would now be available to go back into the budget. Or if, it, or if it's felt that that is still needed. Uh, thanks for the question, Councillor. Maybe we'll ask Jackie Ford to weigh in on that, Jackie. Thank you, and thank you, Councillor. Uh, we have that money set aside, and it has been carried over. Some of it was the pandemic. Some of it is the fact that we just didn't get the right mix of uh, uh, from the first RFQ. Just didn't get a right the right solution to the problem. I would say the money is still needed, and I think if you listened and you you were at the public hearing yesterday, there's still quite a resistance in the community for affordable housing units or uh, projects in neighborhoods. So while I would like to think that most of what has occurred this summer and what's going on this year with uh, the high profile of homeless people, I don't know that we're there yet where we can say that the city is going to be welcoming to affordable housing projects. Okay, and and so I understand the need for comms, absolutely. Um, are there, and I hate to push on this, but this is the time, the times we are in, but uh, is there any way to uh, make sure that that is done in-house or like to you know, basically stretch every dollar in that effort? The vast majority of that funding will go directly to advice. So the, the money for the design, the strategy is a, is a relatively small piece of that puzzle. Most of it will go to advise. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I think all of my questions have been answered by the ex several excellent presentations and the material that was put in place. So I'll just move uh, that the 2021 net tax levy operating requirement for Explore Edmonton be increased by $3.2 million on an ongoing basis with funding from the corporate expenditure and revenue financial strategies. That the 2021 operating center uh, operating expenditure budget within corporate expenditures and revenues financial strategies be reduced by 1.75 million on an ongoing basis with funding released to reduce the tax levy, and that the net operating requirement for Explore Edmonton be increased on a multi-year one-time basis by 9.9 .9 million in. Uh, 2021 and 7.1 million in 2022 with funding from the appropriated financial stabilization reserve. Second. Thank you, Councillor Walters. That's the true up on Explore, frees up 1.75 ongoing for the other stuff. Um, uh, that's all I got for now. Uh, on the second round, then. Uh, um, I'm still in the first round. Oh, are you? Oh, pardon me, Bev. I, I shouldn't have jumped ahead of you. I apologize. Councillor Essinger. No worries. Uh, and I want to follow up something uh, that Councillor Walters asked about, which was the reduction in transit peace officers, because it says that there'll be no impact to patron safety, but in the remarks it said there will be some impact to citizens including slower response time for enforcement issues. So it seems contradictory. Could you help me why there's little impact on safety? Uh, Councillor, uh, the overarching story with, with, uh, with that though is that we have dramatically improved our, our integration with other, uh, with, our, with our security group, corporate security group and with EPS to, uh, to move down uh, making sure that transit's as safe as possible. So at the end of the day, uh, there's there's two packages we put in here. You'll see the one, the contract dollars that we we had provided to Edmonton Police, and then and then a small reduction in our TPO workforce. Um, but but we do believe that um, with the changes that have been made over the last two to three years, that we're as, as, you know absolutely on it. And, and as I communicated initially with Councillor Walters, if things do evolve, um, then we'll come back to council if, if we if, if we need to. Okay, I'll put in my worry and then you'll watch for it. Is we just launched Transit Wash, the new tech service for people to get response. And if we don't respond, people will stop using the service we did to help them. So I'm, I'm that's my worry. And so I'm saying it out loud and you'll watch for it and I'm watching for response too. Absolutely, Councillor. Uh, I, 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 we, we hear you loud and clear and we'll, uh, we'll do everything possible to make sure that, you know, we don't, we don't miss a beat in this, in this file. Thank you. Um, I don't know who this might be you as well, Mr. Smart. Um, I noticed that the Central Lions uh, support person was gone and I'm not sure why the Central Lions senior support person is gone. And I didn't see other senior centers losing staff. Could you speak to me about the rationale? Councillor, we've been working with the seniors organization there for, uh, for the last quite, quite a while. And they're very much um, um, willing and able to, to, to basically provide the, this, this function within their, within their own operation. And maybe Mr. Jevney, you want to weigh in on that one as well? Sure, Councillor. This was the last of the three senior centers that we were supporting by doing the programming in. The other two that were involved with the associations already do all of their own programming. Okay, I just want to make sure that we weren't uh, stifling them. My other question is around uh, security hours at City Hall are reduced. Does that mean public access will be reduced? Uh, no, Councillor Aslinger, that's just a, um, an efficiency that we're finding within our budgets. Okay, I, that's great. Um, committee operating group, okay, I think all my other questions have been asked. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we're into the second round now. I'll just call, is there anybody else on the first round who I missed? Again, with apologies to Councillor Aslinger. 
Not hearing any, then we'll start the second round here. Councillor Katarina. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And this might not be uh, the right time, but uh, uh, to Mr. Smythe, uh, I, I needed to uh, clarification or maybe a correction on uh, uh, my amendment uh, put forward. Uh, you had mentioned something about uh, the asphalt plant. That's number 40. Uh, I didn't put that in the motion. That was not the intent. It was. 35 to 39. Did you understand it differently? No, that's what I understood as well, Councillor. It's the five facilities, uh, recreation facilities that are part of that of that particular re potential reduction. The good okay, news so it's is not, that we're not uh, considering the asphalt plant. That's not included, which I don't want to include. Uh, not in there. Bad, no, you're correct. So the numbers, okay. the numbers smaller too, then, right? Because the, the, the numbers, yeah, the numbers will have to change, Mr. Mayor, yeah. because uh, of that adjustment. And then, uh, obviously, uh, uh, with that, I just wanted to clarify that I heard heard it incorrectly. That I, I misunderstood what uh, Mr. Smythe uh, had said. So we'll we'll confirm uh, the we'll confirm the numbers, but the one point four zero includes the asphalt plant, so it would be around one point two. But we'll make sure that we've got the correct numbers in that motion. Okay, and also a correction, uh, Mr. Mayor, on the uh, uh, Alberta Avenue Jasper Place. Uh, you'd asked about uh, yearly. Uh, the 297 uh, is per year. Mr. Smythe has confirmed that. That's correct, Mr. Smythe? That's correct. 297 right. per year for two years. Okay, because I, I misspoke and uh, said otherwise. So okay. That's correct. Well, we'll get Thank those, you. We'll get, those true, we'll get those trued up in the... Um, and because that that was your intent in both, we'll get those those trued up by the time we get to debate on them, which could be quick here. Actually, we'll see how we're we're getting there, Councillor. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Just one one more clarification, um, Mr. Smythe, uh, on the uh, uh, transit security. Um, the uh, uh, the program with EPS and uh, transit uh, security. My understanding is that EPS has uh, wishes to come out of that program. Can you give me some indication on that joint uh, uh, operation, wh where it sits? Councillor, that was basically a contract we had um, to hire uh, e EPS officers to uh, do some additional patrols on, on, the, uh, on the LRT. What they've done now um, is they've, they've created what they call disruption teams. So they're no longer providing that service and we're, and we're okay with that. Um, but that, that, that the level of service, they're not dedicated to the LRT, but when required that they, they will scope that into their, into their work basically. So uh, really we think, I think it's a good model that we have right, right now. Again, we'll stay on top of it though. And I, I understand the sensitivity with, with the, with the questions from a few counselors, but it's certainly something that we're going to be on top of. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm a little disappointed in that, uh, but okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A few questions left still. Uh, first, just quickly on uh, next gen item number 44. My understanding is that the community is actually looking to take over responsibility of that initiative and that they are in the process of um, putting together a business plan that they could then come to council in the spring to look for a sort of a one-time, call it a send-off, I don't know what you want to call it, but, but essentially one-time funding to get themselves up off the ground. Is that correct? Uh, Councillor, that's certainly what, what's, uh, what we've been talking to the group about. Okay. Um, and they're certainly, you know, as you're well aware, you more than anybody, uh, willing and able to go down that path. You may need a bit of seed funding, as you say, and that would obviously be in council's wheelhouse to to go down that path. Perfect. So the the last question, because I, I what I do worry about is is this has been a long standing initiative. I mean, I think started by uh, at the time Councillor Cruchel and, and Mayor Iveson, uh, and I, I just don't want to see an sort of unceremonious. Uh, removal of this initiative. I, I want to make sure we're supporting them up to that point as best as possible. They, they just need to make sure they have the ability to access information to help develop the business plan. So we're going to do that even if we pull out this money. Is that correct? That's true, Councillor. We'll work with the next-gen leaders okay. to uh, find a suitable solution that, 
that is reasonable for all, for all parties, basically. Okay. And I would hope that, you know, and just this is more commentary, but, you know, I would hope we would almost think of a send off event versus a thanks for everything, you know, but, but I'm just, I'll throw that out as, as us being thoughtful about how we want to transition that to a community versus just sort of say it's done. Uh, that this has been a long standing initiative and I think it deserves a, an appropriate send off from the city. There's a number of staff on the call who are listening, so I'm sure they're taking notes. Okay, great. And I've had, I've said that, but I just felt I needed to say it out loud again for, for everyone who's put in so much time and effort to that. Uh, Item number 63, which is the transit service uh, reductions. Um, there has been no motion related to that yet, as far as I understand, correct? We haven't had, I don't see any on the ops. So correct. Yeah. Uh, so, Mr. Mayor, I think my motion would be that the reduction strategy number 63 included in attachment three of the December 7th, 2020 financial and corporate services report be added back to the 2021 and I guess actually and 2022 operating budget funded through the savings in OP5, which is the okay. EPA. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. And I don't know if that's the right wording. I'll send it over to, to the clerks and we can update it if needed. Uh, I do have a few other questions, just more general. So when we went through the presentation, uh, the last year's question, this is probably Ms. Armstrong, uh, who again, thank you for, for such uh, excellent detail on this. The remaining question I have really relates to slide number 13 where there was this, the point that was read, the bullet point that says 42 supervisor FTEs are currently vacant, 10 are critical and active in an HR process, 32 are paused. I, I am guessing, I just, and I wouldn't mind your, your feedback because it's a single slide, you're not necessarily suggesting those 32 aren't important, but maybe a little less important than the 10 that, that you've actually defined as critical. And I wonder if you can maybe elaborate a little bit on what that 32 consists of, because if it's not as critical and we're, we're holding them, is that something that can actually be coming out of the budget to help deal with some of the funding challenges? Thank you, Councillor Knox. So when I want to just go back to go forward. Sure. When we talk about criticality of the positions that are currently in recruitment, we have a, got a framework that we're using right now to manage every single uh, vacant position and the decision-making process around whether to put that position to recruitment or preferably hold it vacant uh, as long as possible to achieve the cost savings through the vacancy. So one example of one of the 32 is a Muttart um, service person whose role it is to uh, be in the facility working. Because the facility is closed and that position is vacant, we don't need to recruit to it right now. However, we will be needing that position once COVID is over. One can hardly wait for that. And Matart reopens. So of those positions that are not in active recruitment, they are being held for um, re, re, uh, sorry, for recruiting once we are in a position that we can return uh, those facilities or those areas to full uh, operations. Great. I'm out of time. I'll have a few more questions about that, but thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, Councillor Henderson. Yeah, just continuing down my list, um, I'm interested a little bit more in the Community Facility Grants Program, um, which I'm guessing would be entirely gone if I'm reading this correctly, because we've already lost the piece that comes from the um, uh, from the ticket revenue, and this would take out the residual piece that was put in many years ago uh, to give us, I think, a couple of million bucks a year in there. Am I reading that correctly? That's correct, Councillor Guess. All right, here's my worry about it, and I'm just wondering we factored this in. Um, that program was put in to give some good policy around um, what we were doing on an ad hoc basis every time somebody needed the city to come in as part of a project to match money with other orders of government. So I'm, I mean, my worry about this is we put ourselves back in, into what was a very clumsy ad, ad hoc policy that involved groups coming directly to council um, and having no real policy to know how to respond. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure that this is ultimately a saving. Um, I think it may just create a different kind of problem for us because I can't imagine the applications are still not going to come forward in some form or another. So have you done any thinking about that? 
Well, Councillor, I mean, I guess from our perspective, certainly the the groups are certainly being challenged to raise their 66% of, of their projects. So that's, that certainly is, is a concern. Um, and there's also, as you're well aware, with the uh, traffic safety uh, automated enforcement reserve dollars being withdrawn from the from the grant program, there's only about one the 1.859 of tax yeah. levy will be left in the program. So we would have to get replaced by additional tax levy dollars, and then in this this time is 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 not easy to do. Um, Understood. Um, the 1.85 is what the program started with. We topped it up with the other money. I mean, historically, I mean, the 1.85 was, was what was originally put into that program and how we got it going. Um, yeah. And and it really it really did it did speak to a need that we were answering in an ad hoc fashion. And I suspect that need won't go away. So if we want to go back to ad hoc, you know, by all means, I just thought it was worth flagging. The history of that um, because it because uh, I, I think the asks will still keep on coming they will just come in a different way and we won't have the same mechanisms to deal with them no I mean fair point we will we'll, we will continue to work with those groups and and if if it does align up with city plan and does line up with our overall goals as a, as a council as your council um, then we'll bring those reports forward and I think we will still use the same basic framework of, of 33% local government and, yeah. and and go from there. But, but, well, but I, I hear I'm, what you're I'm wondering, I'm wondering then, because like, a number of these, and I think I'm going to do the same with the, with the, with the uh, chemical control of weeds, that there's a subsequent that probably needs to be, for both of these, that brings us back a report on how we're going to deal with these questions, given these cuts, because I'm not sure we have enough information, and I think this is one that probably needs to be thought through a little bit more. I mean, I, I, I'm not inclined to put it back in right now, but I do think thinking that we can just take this out without creating a different kind of chaos is probably naive. So I, I will maybe do a subsequent so that so that we can get a report back to think through this issue more, because I'm not convinced these asks are going to go away, nor nor do I think we're going to stop funding them. We'll just end up funding them without good policy in place. Um, a quick question on the understanding the civic precinct uh, year-round program decrease. I, it's, it's lumped in with a whole bunch of other stuff. I just, I don't know the how much that is or what that is. And I only ask because, again, remembering what it was like before we had that programming in place is we had a whole bunch of fairly good facilities that were very difficult for people to use without that support. So I'd hate to go back to that again as well. Um, the co comment I would make, I mean, this is the animation in the Civic Precinct Councillor. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so some of the, uh, the big big events of fireworks are going to stay and so on. Yeah. It's just it's just the animation piece that... I. It was things like providing the skates and providing, you know, I, I raised them as an example. If we don't do that, it doesn't get used and it doesn't get used by the people that can't afford facilities in any other way. Um, I mean, you know, this there was a lot of work went into this when we originally built the square. Um, it became clear without the programming, we were not getting full value f of a huge investment we'd made in that facility. So I wouldn't mind a bit more breakdown on specifically what we're taking out of this. It, it doesn't look to me to be the whole amount. Or if it is, then I have even greater concerns because we learned that lesson the hard way 10 years ago. I can provide a little bit of clarity here. So it also includes the uh, elimination of the fireworks in Mill Woods. Yeah, no, I, I, it's, I'm only really worried about the, the, the animation of the square sure. piece, the, the, the casual stuff, the stuff that we do during the summer and, and during the winter, you know, that I think is mostly handled by the Arts Council. Roger, do you have that, that number on the top of, your, top of your head? Not the number, but it is the full program, Councillor. We would, we would continue to work with partners, um, festivals and others to animate the square, but we would not have any funding remaining to do the direct programming other than I, the I would I would like to have that, I would like to have that number back then because I think that's an error that we're making that will re, we'll relive a mistake we made 10 years ago so if you can get sure. me that number I'll do a motion thank we you. will do thanks I'm out of time I'll have to come out around for another round thank you Councillor Carmel thank you uh, I would just like to move an amendment uh, Mayor Iveson okay uh, I'll read it in and then I'll send it to the clerk uh, so my amendment is as follows that Reduction strategy number 68, uh, park and roads services turf maintenance, included in attachment three of FCS 00078 be reduced from 1,750,000 to 185,000 through an increase to the tax levy to reverse the one time 
pardon me, to reduce, reverse the one trimming cycle reduction and keep the turf season from mid-April to the end of October. Second. Seconded by Councillor Nichol. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Carmel. That's uh, all I have. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Paquette. Yep. Thank you. Um, yeah. All right. We'll just continue. Uh, so just a, a quick question for administration. I'm trying to get a little more information on what this looks like when we're talking about the uh, uh, the Green Shack program, basically. So um, reduction strategy number 54, $0.13 million to attachment three. Um, discontinue program support for Central Lions Senior Association, no longer staffing spray parks and skateboard parks from June to August, eliminate fall, winter, spring, green shack programming and YAG youth drop in programs. So um, are the green shacks going to be closed for the uh, entire year or is there an option for community leagues to use them? No, Councillor, this would be eliminating the uh spring, winter, and fall uh, Green Shack program? Yeah. Okay, so, and is there an option for community leagues to use them and just not staffed by City of Edmonton employees? Uh, we haven't really explored that as an option, Council. Um, we, could, we could explore that to see if that was an option and become a, basically a shelter for the community league. I'm not sure that would, but we, we, we can think that through some more. Okay, and uh, regarding the uh, YAG youth drop-in, will there be programming available to youth on an admission basis, or is this an elimination of all youth programs? Well, certainly from an admission perspective, they can certainly participate, and there's lots of drop-in still, um, sort of uh, un unlet programs that are not led by staff, and further to, further to that, we'll work continue to work with uh, you know some of the community organizations. Um, Big brothers and big sisters, and those kind of those kinds of organizations, to uh, to do that kind of programming. This is kind of the direct youth programming that uh, that we do in the branch. Okay, and so back to the Green Shack program. I I, I would appreciate some advice, I, I suppose, um, because I could make a motion that we add it back into the operating budget funded by an increase to the tax levy, uh, because I feel like it's such an important resource for youth, and it definitely helps to uh, um, curtail, I suppose, some of the social disturbances we're worried about. Um, but if there's a possibility of working with community leagues and finding a solution there that would uh, defray those costs, I mean, I'm, I'm just curious, would you, if we could find a way to keep those open, even if it's not uh, to the full extent through partnerships, how how would you suggest we move forward on that? Well, we can take that away, away Councillor, but just to, to let you know, I mean, the um, the participation of, of children in those um, those periods of time in the year is, is quite is quite low. Um, it's four, basically our data shows that it's about four or five children per hour, whereas in the summertime, it's probably 12 or 12 to 13. So the, the numbers, in our view, really don't justify the program because they're you know the kids aren't aren't really coming, um, so I just leave that leave that with you. We can certainly um, explore some options with uh, with with community to see if there is an interest in in running some programs in those in those months, um, but really it did not take off in those nine months of the non summertime basically, you know as we might have expected. Yeah, I understand. So, and that's why I'm hesitant to make the motion because if there's a way to do this and maybe uh, a little bit of funding for community leagues to help them and they wanted to run these programs, um, I mean, I feel like I'm a, a little bit stuck here, kind of forced to make a mo uh, an amendment here uh, without any sort of surety that we can actually get something moving. But if you feel we can and it's not required today for an amendment, um, I'd love to hear that. Well, our, our uh, NRC certainly work with community leagues and really, really, you know, enter into partnerships with them to offer a variety, a variety of programs. So we can begin to socialize that with uh, our, or direct our, our staff to have those, to have those conversations with, with, with the leagues. But there's no, 
no dedicated funding for providing any extra any extra programming. Okay, well then I will I will put that forward, and I guess we can debate it. Um, and that would just be that reduction strategy fifty four, uh, including attachment three, um, FCS zero 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 seven eight, be added back to the operating budget funded through an increase of tax levy, and then I'm happy to take that. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor McKean. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Banga is next. Thank you. A uh, couple more questions about community investment grant and uh, other similar programs. Um, I know um, in the report it mentions that uh, this was a low impact. I guess to the community wellness. Could you be able to tell me if uh, any of those other programs were evaluated? I, I for example, Green Shack, um, whatever else, everything. Sorry, Councilor, the the impact of the CIOG grant on on the organizations? No, on the on the community wellbeing. I think that was uh, in the auditor's report. I guess mentioned. I think where where one of previous councillors, um, you know, made comments about aligning with our city plan, and you know, this grant in particular didn't really align effectively with our social development branch or with any kind of city building goals. Um, so the the notion of of um, how would how would you reconstitute that grant to ensure that all the multicultural groups, the social groups, and the sports groups, um, and the funding they get are helping helping the city achieve its goals? Basically, um, that that is you know, and that really was a, a finding of some of the, of some of these of this grant program in particular. Okay, so is that being replaced by anything, or uh, are we just slashing it all together? No, we're reducing. The recommendation is that it be eliminated altogether, Councillor. I should point out, as it says in some of the information, that on average, this grant program makes up between five and six percent of these organizations' total budget. So, we believe, you know, and you know, recognizing the challenging times we are in, that you know it'll be an impact, but it and groups will. Will will go on. They'll have to, you know, determine where to, how they move forward without this funding. Okay. Uh, could you comment on uh, some of these organizations? Uh, they also get uh, provincial grants, etc. But without the city supporting them, would they be able to get those grants? I would say probably no. Comments, please. Council, I don't believe uh, the grant that the city provides to these organizations is has very, very few restrictions. And it's one of the few grants that these groups do get where they can allocate it to programs, they can allocate it to salaries, they can allocate it to the buildings that they may be in. So it's very um, open in terms of how those dollars are used. Basically, it just as the name of the grant suggests, it's just to help them operate their, their affairs. Um, and I don't, you know, they may or may not use it to, to show other orders of government a matching portion, um, but that would be totally in their wheelhouse. Okay. Yeah, there were a lot of concerns about, uh, uh, from the speakers and uh, emails I got that uh, in the absence of their grant, they would not be able to qualify for uh, provincial funding. Thank you. No, fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knack? Uh, I'm on a third round. Oh, but I guess Councillor Anderson would be too. Uh, Councillor Essinger is on the second, though, so I'll come yeah. back to you. Councillor Essinger, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to follow up on that conversation you had on the Community Impact Operating Grant. Although some organizations, it's 5 or 6%, there is many small ones where I think it can be up to 25% of their total budget. Is that not correct? I think for some of those smaller groups, it can be up around that range, Councillor, yes. And for many of them, it's their lifeblood. They are really dependent on that to operate. 
I, I guess um, my worry when I read about it was the lower <laughs> um, social development impact. I mean, I think, you know, St. Vincent de Paul, there is many organizations embedded in that group that are probably aligned with where we'd like to go. But they're getting caught in that brush. Oh, yeah, you're a fair enough, Councillor, but that that assessment has not has not taken place and it's not part of our processing of those grants at all. I know it was just a comment that was made in the why we would de delete it is they had low impact and I think um, that that's probably not quite accurate. Coming from the nonprofit world, I, I think every nonprofit feels they're making an incredible difference in their community. So we better be careful on how we say that that was said. That was all my comments. I was just a little reaction to that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, just a few more. So uh, just going back to Ms. Armstrong uh, with, with the discussion that we had a bit earlier. So my understanding based off what you've shared uh, and, and the presentation is that so if we take slide 11, we've reduced, made a reduction of 6.4% uh, overall. And what, what I understand is that you're not suggesting you're going to stop there. There's, there's already a couple of positions identified for 21 and 22. But so if you were hoping to hit that, you're not necessarily saying you need to get 10% removed, but you're, you're also not going to end at 6.4 through the reimagine work. Is that correct? 100% uh, correct. Okay, right. Is there a dollar amount associated to that 6.4% out of curiosity? And if you don't have it handy, just later would be fine too. Yes, I'm sure I'll be able to get it for you. Just give me a couple of minutes. Sure, no rush on that. And that can even be emailed separate. It's more of a curiosity than anything else. Uh, so so closing the gap then, that, that additional, uh, let's call it 3.6%, there will be opportunities. The next council, the, the next supplemental operating budget adjustment would get to see the continued progress on the reimagined work on any changes that has had within staffing. I just don't want to lose the, the auditor's recommendations and know that there's still points that either this council or next council will be able to, to monitor how that's gone uh, since the audit. You are absolutely correct in both your assumption that we it, it is a work in progress and we are continuing to track and monitor and work toward uh, increasing the number and that we will, secondly, that we will report back to you on that uh, at the appropriate times over the next year. Appreciate that. Uh, right. The final Councilor question Nack. just relates to... Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, go ahead. I, I just, just want to flag that that comes with decisions from council. Because when we talk Absolutely. about reimagining services, it, it's kind of some of the tough discussions that we're having today about um, decisions on service and service levels. So it, it's, it's our intention, but it does still require a council conversation. Of course. Yeah, thank you. That's, I appreciate that clarification. The final questions that I have just relate to the, the final slide on that presentation on slide 15. Do we have a... So I, I appreciate, and I think Ms. Pearson had suggested we and we have the discount rate that we apply. Is there a, a certain point when positions have been vacant for, I mean, considering we have 202 that have been vacant for more than 12 months, is, is there a certain timeline we, we take a step back and say, this isn't, I mean, we've managed this long, more than a year without it. Should that not be coming out? So, I mean, how, how long would we be willing to keep a vacant position? Maybe I'll ask it that way. Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, we use the term latency to describe positions that are vacant over one year. Um, through what we call position management, we bring a list to ELT uh, periodically of those positions and work with each individual deputy to understand why the position is being held vacant. With the presumption, if you haven't filled it in a year, perhaps we should look at eliminating it. And so you'll see that a large number of the positions we have eliminated that are vacant came out of that exercise, but it is an ongoing exercise, Councillor. We regularly review positions that are on hold to challenge each other as to whether we really need that position and whether we can be considering a position elimination. 
That's great. So, so you, you would say then, and I don't want you to go through them, but, but essentially I look at this list, there's 202, 12 plus months. You would be able to, you've already done that work and engaged every associated branch or department about each of those positions, why they're still there and, and feel comfortable with them being retained as a latent position as, as your definition. That is absolutely a correct statement, and it is also something we're continuing to do uh, periodically at the ELT table. It is a quarterly topic at ELT where we challenge each other about vacant positions that are late. And that would also apply to some of the, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about the reimagined work for management, but the reimagined work also might apply to some of these positions, which may not be management. You're correct. Um, in fact, the majority of the vacant positions are uh, in scope. In scope. Okay. All right. I think that's it. I'm pretty much out of time. Thank you for all those answers. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Um, Councillor Henderson. Yeah, I'll try and hopefully I can get these in uh, quickly. Um, just to clarify, the staffing of the skate parks for for and spray parks for June and August, that's not going to affect the operation of those parks. It's just the supervisory personnel we've been putting in, correct? Uh, that's correct. So the, so it doesn't mean we're opening spray parks late? Uh, not this package, no. Great. Good, thanks. Um, the the outdoor pools, uh, I'm, essentially this would mean they'd only be really open July and August now. Am I Co reading that correctly? Councillor Henderson. Yeah. Could we just go back to spray parks? Because we did identify yeah. in spray parks uh, condensed season. Um, just want to confirm that with Mr. Smythe. Well, that's what I'm checking because I, I was puzzled by that. I couldn't find that elsewhere. All I saw was to cut back on the personnel. No, uh, uh, item 54 is just the, uh, just the staffing piece. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's no there's no hour reduction. I mean, they're, they've become part of the Similar, similar to a playground, basically, as okay. to when right. they're is when they're open. So they'll still be turned on, though, earlier. Well, councilor, we had a strategy this past year based on COVID. Yeah, and understood. Yeah, and the, and the budget piece, but that is not part of what this package is. This is just the Got you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so just to just to do the outdoor pools, then, because it, it strikes me having these facilities we only have open for two months um, uh, is is getting a little bit absurd, especially given that we're getting hot weather earlier, and that was one of the things that was in our in the report we got back on 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 how we deal with climate change um, that we needed to be wary of. So. Um, what what's the actual cost to us? I mean, I understand that May may be a bit dicey, but June seems to me got to be what what kind of usage do we usually get in June? Uh, Council, I don't have that those attendance numbers in front of me. Roger, do you have those numbers? No, sorry, I don't have the specific numbers in front of me. Certainly, July and August are better. Um, the days over twenty one degrees, we're busy. The days below that, we're really not yeah. busy. Well, so it's really weather dependent in those months and. But we must have days over 21 in June, do we not? We, we do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I, boy, I, I just, it seems at a certain point, you know, why have them at all, which I know was something that was debated 15 years ago. Um, the bus fare issue, do we have any numbers on what we think that may do to ridership if we go with the bus fare increases? Because that's the trouble with these bus fares is sometimes it's a self-defeating strategy. Uh, Councillor Henderson, we have, uh, you know, the, the fair model that we use. Um, we do see typically a, a, a bit of a decrease in ridership when we increase fares. But I think right now the challenge is that uh, that model is is dependent on, on some um, consistent conditions. And right now with uh, the impacts of the pandemic, we're really in a kind of a state of a lot of unknowns. So while we have revenue projections, they're really uh, thrown up in the air by the fact that we're in the pandemic and we have, you know, ridership that is, you know, right now below 40% of what it normally would be. I mean, I, I know it's a significant hit money-wise, but it could be a significant hit money-wise. Um, you know, I worry a little bit that we're shooting ourselves in the foot at a time when we can't afford to do so with those fares. Um, 
but the impact, the, the dollar impact is significant, but the dollar impact will be significant as well if it, help, if it pushes ridership down, I presume. Uh, I believe the number that we had projected initially was a 2.7 million uh, revenue increase. But again, that was a projection that was done uh, in the model when we were preparing the 2018 to 2022 budget. So again, it's... Um, so that's 100% ridership. That's not 47% ridership. 37%, correct, yes. Yeah. So what would the number be if ridership stays down? Um, again, it would be a very rough estimate. We, we, we don't know. It would likely be, a, you know, half or, or less than that. But we, again, because the, the way that things are fluctuating, we saw this summer we were, you know, below 40%. Then we went in September, we went up to above 50%. And now we're back down below 40. So, um, it's really, uh, it's really rough to say or tough to say given the state we're in right now. Okay. My one other question, uh, well, two other quick ones. Uh, the reduction in service levels on alley, pothole repairs, cracks, lean, that whole piece. Was that not going to just jack up our maintenance budget in the future? Is that not exactly, you know, what we're trying to avoid is allowing things to deteriorate? Uh, Councillor, the intent of, of those reductions are really to be better coordinated with some of the rehab programs we have and, and with the intent of trying to maintain condition uh, and not sacrifice that. So by some coordination with, uh, with the alley rehabilitation as well as uh, the other rehabilitation programs, we believe that we can still maintain our condition targets uh, and achieve some savings. Okay, I'm out of time. I had one more question, Mr. Mayor, but uh, I don't see anybody else on the board. Um, well, strictly speaking, I needed a motion for a third round a while ago, um, but... Uh, I, I moved that, Mr. Mayor, with Councillor Zion. Well, and I then believe. I actually need a fourth, but let me just see if there's <laughs> unanimous consent to allow Councillor Henderson to ask precisely one more question. It's about the Valley Line uh, Southeast Precursor Service which is unfunded right now. Okay, yeah, hearing no objections and now yeah. knowing what it is, um, Councillor yeah, Henderson. that's the question. I, I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled that that's unfunded because I'm assuming we're gonna need it. I mean, that's what, that's what, uh, that's what you know, once we go, once the BNR is put in place, that's a major link that will, if we don't fund it, will be, will be a gap until the LRT starts to run. So, Councillor, I believe that uh, that, that was tied in with the, the uh, reserve, but perhaps uh, um, Ms. Pearson can provide a, a bit of info on that. I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Rye, I believe. Oh, he needs a, a minute. My understanding, uh, Councillor Henderson, is it doesn't show up because it's actually funded through the Valley Line Reserve. Um, so, it, it okay. It's just showing up as an unfunded package in our in our book here. That's oh, all. But we'll get Mr. Rye to confirm that. I just want to make sure that we're clear on a previous question that you had. Um, item sixty nine in the reductions yeah. is a condensed. Um, it's a service level reduction on uh, splash park season to open mid-June and close mid-August. So I just wanted to make sure that we weren't um, missing each other on that. Uh, okay, that's not what the package says, but okay. that's, all right. that's why I wanted to get clarity on that. There, there's two packages, and I think it was a maybe a bit of a miss on our part, quite frankly. Uh, one from Parks and Roads that reduces the spray park um, um, hours, time, and one from CRF that that eliminates the supervision in the, sp in the spray parks. Okay, there it is. I've got it. Okay. So there's two There's there's two there. Number okay, no, number I see it now. Yep, yep, I see it. Four and, and 69. Okay. 
Uh, Councilor Henderson, on your Valley Line uh, unfunded service package, precursor services, so it's a it's a net uh, no impact. If you flip over to the next page, you'll see the individual expense and revenue impact, so an increase in expenditures of $4.8 million funded from the LRT reserve by the same amount. Okay, thanks. Just checking. All right, Mr. Mayor, that's all my questions, so I'm still waiting for a number to do one motion. Uh, do you want to make the motion, and then we'll... We'll true up the, the number uh, when we get to it? Uh, sure. It is, uh, it's around, it, it, um, hang on, I've just, I've lost, it's the, uh, it's, it's essentially to, uh, what I don't want to cut is the, the, um, the casual uh, programming that we do with the square between event. So it's not the event programming, it's just, and it, I think it's always been run for us by the Arts Council. We give them a package of money and they operate it for us. Um, so, the, uh, and maybe it hasn't been cut. I mean, that's why I may not be getting the answer, but if it has, I think we should be putting it back. I, I might, my memory is it's about the $60,000 range. Councillor, I, I should clarify, the Arts Council program will continue. This was the city-initiated program we were on Canada Perfect. Day and Family Day. Checking. Okay, then I'm fine, then no motion is necessary. And the answer to the question is zero. Right on. Okay, um, are there any other motions on operating? I will have some subsequent, but uh, I can yeah, do those we, after. We can uh, get those as we go, and we can also stack them up at the end. Councillor McKean? No, i just saying I have some subsequent as well. Yeah, uh, feel free to start working away on those. And uh, as they are, uh, as the motions come up that they pertain to, we can handle them then, or we can handle them... Um, subsequent to the main vote as well. But if we do them as we go, then when we're done the vote, we're done the budget. So encouragement to uh, begin to write them up. Um, okay, uh, clerks have asked for a few minutes to collate and tabulate uh, the, the motions. Here's a, here's a process question though. Um, we have said that the reduction motions would go first and that the um, uh, at the the add back expenditure motions would go second. Um, we can do them in the order in which they were presented, or uh, we can ask the clerks to randomize them while they're ordering them. Uh, does anyone wish to uh, uh, assert that they should be randomized? Mr. Mayor, just yep. a question. Yep. So we're off nine, if I read it correctly. Uh, put some money back in. So it seems to me that we should do. It's a net reduction. So Sorry. it's a net reduction Sorry. to the tax levy. Right. So that would go in the first batch. Okay. So that's already in the first batch. Yes. Okay. I got it. Great. Just confirming that. And then other motions could be amended to uh, with their funding source from that reduction. Correct. Bingo. That's the idea. Thanks for the refresher. Sure. Uh, so does anyone want them randomized, or can we just take them in the order that they've, they've been put? Mr. Mayor, would we do uh, reductions first and then ads? Correct. <laughs> yes, in the order that they were put? Yep. And would Councillor Nichols' motion be considered a reduction or an ad? I think there. we should discuss that before we discuss a bunch of the rest. Just my personal view. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it is, it is net a reduction, though, amazingly, it adds back all of the expenditure revenues and efficiencies that administration labored to find. So it really does straddle them. So I would suggest we could deal with them in between the two um, uh, as a special category of motions, which somehow does both. So... Uh, but but it's it, the spirit of it is a reduction, uh, so I would suggest we could handle it in the first batch. Um, uh, that it is net a reduction to the tax levy, so I think that is the spirit of it. Uh, so I, I would be okay with doing the reductions in the order in which they were presented, and then the ads in the order in which they were presented, unless someone wishes to have them randomized or someone wishes uh, has other advice or perspective on the order in which to uh, to do these. So we do the reductions, including Councillor Nichols, in the order in which they were presented, and then the ads in the order in which they were presented as well. Going once, going twice, 
Okay, let's give the clerks a few minutes just to set all that up, uh, queue it in the system, and then we can move into those and see how far we get um, in the next 45 minutes or so. And Mr. Mayor, just if any councillors are looking for the document, it's in the Google chat, and that's where you can find all of the publicly made amendments. And we do have a draft document we're working on the subsequent amendments, or sorry, subsequent motions, and we'll deal with those and get back to you on those if you're waiting for us after we start voting on all of the amendments.
modify Stacy and Harm before we actually call the vote to make sure we've got all the numbers correct, please. And there's a bit of chatter back and forth to see what we want to do around the 5.30 break. I think we're good to go, Mr. Mayor. Okay, hold on just a sec. Okay, uh, Councillor Henderson, roll call back into life here. Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knack? Yes, sorry, there we go. Wrong button. Thank you. Councillor McKean? Present. Thank you. Councillor Nickel? Is here. Present. Councillor Paquette? Present. Thank you. Councillor Walters? Present. Thank you. Councillor Banga? Present. Thank you. Councillor Cartmel? Present. Thank you. Councillor Katarina? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Zadek? I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Essinger? Present. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton? Present. Thank you. And that's everybody. Okay, so uh, I forget the order. Well, I suppose I can call it up on the uh, sheet here. Getting a little feedback from someone's mic there. Councillor Paquette? Just getting a little feedback from your, uh, there you go, thank you. Cool. Um, okay, which one's op one? Sorry, Mr. Mayor. So the first reduction that we have here, and everybody should be able to follow along at home, is uh, the first reduction is OP3, or sorry, OP3, and it's Councillor Nickel, seconded by Councillor Zadek. Okay. Uh, Councillor Nickel, uh, introduce the motion, please. Certainly, and thank you, everyone. Um, I guess this starts with, if there is a will, there is a way. Over two years ago, I argued that we needed to stop spending right size management structures and tap our existing reserves so we could get some tax relief. I argued then we needed to bring our spending under control because of collapsing oil prices. But I guess now with COVID, I don't think we have any alternative. And I asked the simple question back then, after 20 years of tax increases, when do we stop? And I guess that is the day, and today is the day where we have to stop. So I can't put this any other way. The options in front of us uh, that is presented to us are rigid. And frankly, I think, uh, to be blunt, uh, I think they're completely in the wrong direction. We spent more time and effort considering one $2 million reductions in several amenities and programs than the real problem that's in front of us. These cuts, frankly, put forward are a distraction. And I think the real problem we have is time. Now, there is a common saying that haste makes waste, and we need to buy some time so we can make good decisions, not rash ones. So the Ed Intel Endowment is a long-term savings fund, which we have done well in that fund. There is no question about it. But taking out our long-term disability and pension funds, which I would never touch and we cannot touch, the fund sits over $900 million. Our money market fund, which consists of T-bills and other financial instruments, is less than a year sits at $750 million. Our short-term bond fund, consisting of bonds or other financial instruments of five years or less, sits at $375 million. If you add those all up, that's over $2 billion. My argument is simple. We deliver a 2% tax decrease to begin to stabilize our residential and non-residential tax base and put administration's cuts aside for now and buy some time to properly put our strategies into place. What are these strategies? Well, we've talked about them. Right-sizing management, exploring operational partnerships, opportunities, and so on. 
letting our assessment base find a kind of post-COVID grounding and giving time to deal with funding level reductions from the other orders of government. What is important here is that I don't think Council should get mired into smaller decisions when the larger one still remains. We have the reserves. Not to draw on them should not be held up on technical arguments. <clears throat> to be blunt, again, we need to fix on a result. Well we, well, we have to make up for these decisions later, this decision later, yes, of course we will. But at least we'll have the time to make the right decision and not rush ones. You no doubt will hear that this cannot be done or this should not be done. No doubt, for some, the world will fall apart. But I've heard these objections before, being in politics. We, for example, we have never done it this way. We have always done it this way. Or if we let you do it this way, everyone will want to do it your way. My reply is also equally direct. You can fix the result and let the process vary, or you can fix the process and let the results vary. Administration should be sent back in order to put in the process to draw down on our EdTel savings. Every Edmontonian and business in this city is faced with the same sort of decision, a drawdown on their savings. With this reality, I think the city should be doing the same. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I get uh, maybe to you, Mr. Mayor. So this, uh, I am trying to figure out um, the process here in the sense that, uh, so I'm not opposed to having this discussion. I'm just trying to figure out, is this not more of a subsequent? Because we wouldn't actually finalize the strategy, the repayment strategy portion until spring. So I, I'd be happy to have that conversation and get what that might look like. But I don't know if that if this is actually an operating budget amendment. So can you provide? You've probably had some more time to reflect on it. So can you share your thoughts? The the tail end of the motion is an operating budget amendment because it re, it reverses all of the um, expenditure reductions, efficiencies, and service level changes. Um, and restores them um, into the base using a one-time uh, source of funds by drawing down the reserve. The, the challenge is the reserve is not, strictly speaking, an eligible funding source without changes to the EdTel bylaw. So a process would have to unfold which is imagined uh, or, or laid out in the first part of the motion um, to make available the funds that would be used in the second part of the motion on a one-time basis. And then um, a f I would still argue the motion is missing a funding strategy for the uh, ongoing expenditures beyond 2021. Uh, so in that sense, I, I believe it's incomplete. I, I ruled against a similar motion um, last budget for that reason um, and was tempted to do so today, but um, there, there are ways to, that, that, that prevented us from having the debate mm -hmm. on, the, on the merits of using a one-time source to achieve um, a reduction to the tax levy for a given year, which I think we need to have. So, um, but this, it, you are right, there is a challenge here because it presumes the availability of a, a source of funds that, that uh, requires, for good reason, bylaw changes to, uh, to, to, to make changes to the endowment policy. So, um, I mean, my, my advice is we just debate it. And, okay. And, yeah. but, so, okay, and sorry, my time didn't start, so I'm guessing I probably have at least two minutes gone at this point, um, but just to keep a track of that. Um, so maybe to administration, because I, again, I, what I'm trying to sort of close the loop on is that, that line that talks about uh, returning to council at SOBA, the spring SOBA, with the strategies to replenish that. So that's, that's the mover's intent, which is to replenish that which is, I think, the, the part we need to make sure is dealt with. So, um, in a way, we had that type of conversation back during the 20, 
uh, the, the four-year budget discussion when we had done a motion in September to bring forward reduction strategies to inform that four-year budget cycle. So how would you envision doing that work? I just want to make sure I understand how you sort of see that process going. Well, I think the first, the first, the starting point would be um, kind of baselining it against what it would look like from a tax levy increase perspective. Then from there, we'd uh, approach reductions to to accommodate that um, through some significant adjustments. If 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 the adjustments that we've identified, which I don't think were uh, insignificant, but if the reductions that were identified for this budget were not significant, we'd be going larger scale. So maybe a follow-up to that. So would it be safe to assume, because you've put together that list of reductions that totals $56.5 million, um, to replenish $98 million, we need, you would I imagine recommend what you've just recommended in this budget because you took the time to do that. Is that is that reasonable to assume? That's correct. And then you would go above and beyond that through other mechanisms, meaning either cuts or potentially an increase to the tax levy in 2021, depending on what you feel. We haven't provided direction in this motion, so you could come with a couple of different options to make up the remaining amounts. That's correct, and I think for for this de for for this degree of of reduction, it would mm -hmm. be uh, appreciated to have some direction on what would council consider as available for reduction. Okay, uh, well then maybe I'll just in my last few seconds go to the mover and ask uh, about that. Have you have you had uh, any thoughts around sort of where we would provide some guidance for administration to to make up the additional money as well? Well, Councillor Knack, first of all, consider this reduction replenishment or the replenishment of this reduction over time. That's the yeah. first thing that you have to put in put into your mindset. First, you're going to have to uh, understand that we need a bylaw amendment, and then we need a budget adjustment, and then we can come back with a longer term strategy for replenishment. And I pointed out, for example, you have in your other funds, right, and your money market funds and your T-bills and so on, you have well over a billion dollars of worth of money also to deal with over time to replenish these funds. There are options here. What I'm really asking for is that not to be rigid, not to be rigid with the policy and not to be rigid with, uh, with how we're going to figure this answer out because right now, right now these are extraordinary times and I guess I'm calling for an extraordinary measure. Uh, to deal with this. So we have to work this through and we're going to need time to do this because we have so much uncertainty. Okay. Thanks. I, I'll, I might have some more questions, but thanks for that answer. Thank you. Councillor Cartmel. Uh, thank you. So look, I want to, I'm trying to understand this and then so I'm going to take a stab at it in a, from a bit of a different perspective. So first of all, I'm going back to the presentation that was made on November 18th, I think it was. And uh, there's a chart there that says in 2021, the proposed tax increase uh, for 2021 would be 0%, for 2022 would be 1.6%. I've got that right. Nothing we've talked about since then changes that. We're still looking at a 1.6% in 2022. No, well, it depends on where you land with the various amendments that are on the... On the, on the table, on yeah. On the table but, today. Yeah. So I look at this slightly different. Uh, as I understand it, and perhaps either you, uh, Mr. Laughlin or Ms. Pearson can tell me if I'm off here. What's essentially being proposed is that we do not take the savings offered, the ongoing savings offered, which reduce not just next year's budget, but every budget beyond that by roughly $65 million. We take a, uh, an amount of money from the reserve, the Etel endowment to provide a one-time reduction in the tax levy of $64 million to match those savings. We take a further 
one-time removal or, or uh, withdrawal from the endowment to provide a 2%, a further 2% uh, property tax decrease. So that at the end of 2021, nothing else changing, we would have to make up roughly 3.7% tax increase for 64 million plus the 2% uh, reduction for 34 million plus 1.6. So we'd effectively be looking at a 7.3, 7.4% property tax increase year over year, plus looking for a strategy to replenish the $98 million taken out of the endowment fund. It, does that make sense, that analysis? That is, or that, that is correct. So we'd be looking at, like, let's just say for uh, discussion purposes, we take all of the savings that we've got presented to us this year and we apply them next year. We get 3.7% back. We're still looking at uh, 2 plus 1.6, a 3.6% property tax increase and a $98 million repayment strategy. Those are kind of two different, uh, those might be the options that we consider. That, that's correct, Councillor. That sort of makes sense. Um, I don't know if anybody knows this uh, for certain, but is this not essentially what Calgary did, was they started taking reserves to forego tax increases or to mitigate property tax impacts, and then found themselves with not a lot of reserves left and had to do some shifting? Am I, am I understanding that correctly, or am I off on that? That, that's my understanding. Maybe not out of reserves, but some one-time issues, uh, Councillor. One time to ongoing. That's why our budget principles are there. And so going, but then going back to my first premise, the, the next council is going to be presented with uh, a 7.4% year-over-year tax increase and be looking to administration for strategies and how to mitigate that, all things being equal. That, that's my understanding of this, but uh, Councillor Nickel did say earlier that it, under this strategy, it wouldn't have to be all in one year. I, I heard him say that, but that's perhaps a question that you need to confirm with the mover. Sorry, I feel like I'm in between. Yeah, no, I, I, and I don't mean to put you there. I just want to make sure that I, my understanding of the math and the profiles is, is sort of follows that way. On the basis of paying or covering it in one year, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just speak to it. <clears throat> there are many issues with this proposal. There are process issues, chiefly that the strategy presumes action not yet taken, specifically a decision to make rash changes to our endowments policy and the EdTel bylaw. Put plainly, it presumes the council would be willing to begin to sell the farm. But the Eldtail Fund is one of our carefully stewarded assets, essentially a civic sovereign wealth fund that we have nurtured, protected for inflation, and that Council has never once raided in a generation. And I, for one, would not support raiding that fund now. But the main problem with this proposal is that it would use a one-time proceed from selling the farm to cover ongoing costs. And to be clear, this proposal would reverse administration's carefully curated priority-based service cuts that generate ongoing savings to reduce the ongoing tax levy requirement. As well, curiously, as I noted earlier, this motion would reverse the $9.7 million in efficiencies and the $6.4 million in expenditure reduction that city staff have labored to find as well. But the main problem, as Councillor Cartmel has noted, is that this just pushes a 5.74% tax increase out past the election to 2022. The so-called bow wave problem of using one-time money to cover ongoing obligations. Now remember that, as was noted, 2022's tax increase is currently down to 1.6% after hard work. But layering on the rebound effect of using one-time money to pay for ongoing expenditures, Councillor Nichols' proposal would drive a 7% tax increase in 2022, which I think would be rather shocking for Edmontonians. And so, for all those reasons, I encourage Council to roundly reject this proposal in its entirety for its lack of financial stewardship and its lack of fiscal foresight. 
Next up is Councillor Walters. Thank you. So I I would have probably ruled this out of order, but I guess Mr. Mr. Lachlan or, or Ms. Pearson, the like to to understand this motion, you really need to understand the difference between ongoing and one time. So I guess maybe I'll let you and I try not to get too political about this, but why have you never recommended a, a rate or a, a dipping into our reserves as a financial strategy to deal with operating pressures in the past? I've been here eight years and that's never been recommended. So maybe from your perspective, why not? So um, Ms. Padry might help me, Councillor, but essentially my understanding is the fund was supposed to be an intergenerational fund and that we do use just the interest um, right. for that. And we are looking, we never recommend it because of ongoing to ongoing uh, money. The other thing I would like to correct, I know that there's the EdTel fund and I know that ca Councillor has brought forward the money market fund and the bond fund. The money market and bond funds, that's our cash management strategy. That is allocated to your budget. So that is money that is already spent. It's just the money in the bank at this particular time, and it is used for the budget. So I would hope that this gets restricted to the, the EdTel fund as the discussion, but it is one-time savings. Mm -hmm. But if this passed, because there's no guarantee that the necessary changes to the EdTel endowment fund would be approved, that's a bit of a hedge. But it would reduce all those efficiencies as it, and, and those uh, operating budget changes that are outlined in attachment two. We would require a tax increase now, would we not? Like there would have to be, and I know there's massive process challenges with this, but because you can't be assured that those amendment those those changes to the bylaw would be made, allowing us to even dip into it. That's correct. It's it's a bylaw amendment as well as a public hearing. Right. right. So that would have to happen. So we don't know the outcome of that because you can't presume the outcome. Uh, but because it talks about uh, putting the changes in attachment two back on the table, we would require the subsequent tax increase in this budget. And then if those changes weren't ag agreed to by council after the process, we would have to carry that tax increase or then make those changes. That's correct. So, yeah, well, uh, okay, well, I will definitely not support this. It just as, yeah. Thank you. Councillor Henderson. So, sorry, Councillor McKean is next. Thank you. Ms. Pearson, <clears throat> you mentioned the interest from the EdTel Endowment Fund. Uh, what, did, what does it generate for our budget or did, did it generate for our budget this year? For 2020, I'll ask Ms. Padbury to answer that. So um, the fund generates uh, returns, which are accumulated, and then that money is then used to pay the city a dividend, and that dividend is in the order of $41 million annually. Thank you. Um, I would add that <clears throat> that's an important number, I think, to remember, because that would, that would drop as well. Uh, for technical reasons that were outlined very articulately by Councillor Cartmel and the mayor, um, I would add one more thing. It would seem to me we would have to go to public hearings. And if we went to public hearings, uh, if we were back in City Hall chambers, I think those chambers would fill up with senior citizens representing people who are no longer with us, who fought against the sale of Edmonton's beloved telco. And there is a sacred trust here, I believe, in, um, in, in the way we engage with this money. And um, I cannot imagine the outrage uh, from Edmontonians. It's possible I'm wrong, but I think we would see um, 
a, a, a groundswell of opposition to this idea. Uh, it came very late in the game, I would also add. So it's a little hard for all of us to deal with this at the last moment, at the 11th hour. Um, I don't know what to make of that, um, but I am, if I could vote no twice, I would do so. But I can only vote no once, and I will be doing that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Henderson? Um, well, my, my concerns with this, and we certainly had this debate before over the years, um, and, and what, what I've always assumed, and I'm just consistent, doing this would be from ourselves, correct? C Councillor Henderson, um, maybe turn off your video just so we can hear you better and try the question again. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Yeah. No, so my question was essentially um, doing this would be borrowing from ourselves. Is that a good description of it? That is correct. And I would and and in doing that, we'd essentially be running a deficit budget, which is something we can theoretically do. Um, but there are rules about how fast you would have to pay it back, are there not? Under the MGA, that is correct. But the um, the motion does contemplate a payback. Yeah, but the payback would have to happen. I think my memory is the payback has to happen within three years. Uh, I believe it is three years, Miss Padbury. Am I correct? That's the payback of the FSR. I'm just double checking on the regulation. Yeah. So. Yeah, because I because this is not income. This is this is uh, you know this is on a different side of our balance sheet. Correct. This is an asset. That's that correct. Is, that is correct. And frankly, councillor, it's an asset that makes money at a greater rate than we borrow. Um, right. So we would lose we would lose that investment income in the meantime. But the, but the larger issue is. And I think this point has been made, but I, but I, the idea that we could pay it back over a long period of time, and I mean, uh, and not create a, a significant uh, hike, probably we won't have that. We will, according to the MGA, we wouldn't be able to do that. It would have to be a, a maximum of three year payback. Councillor, I just confirm that that is correct. Three years. Um, so, uh, which means we really, it's about. Um, uh, pain today or theoretically much greater pain tomorrow and that's the choice that's in front of us here correct i believe so councillor yeah okay i just wanted to confirm those things thank you thank you councillor banga thank you uh just a point of clarification it's uh we are already drawing 41 million dollar yearly even though it is from from the dividends uh, from Adel Endowment Fund, is that correct? That is correct, Councillor. Okay, and could you clarify for me that let's say if this motion is passed, all that work uh, administration has done over the last couple months, three months, whatever the case may be, is Basically, another fight. Uh, not, not necessarily, Councillor Benga. Uh, just in the answer to Councillor Nack's question, I, I said that that could be utilized for, if if this were to go forward, it could be utilized to address some of the some of the gaps associated with with this. Okay. Well, let's go with uh, with uh, the timing of this thing. Uh, I guess that question is probably for the mover. Uh, wouldn't the time for making this motion would have been when we sent the uh, administration off with a 
tax mandate? Well, Councillor Banga, as you know as well as I do, that the scope and scale of the uncertainty that we're dealing with right now because of COVID, the 12% unemployment number, bankruptcies, I have no idea where they're at. The fact is, is that I do know that I've heard a number of constituents saying they want relief. And before I had, go ahead and make reckless cuts to grass cutting, to laying off employees, I'm asking to buy some time by tapping our reserves. And I looked at the budget. These are the numbers I came up with. And I think this is why I put it forward today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knack? Actually, hold on. Uh, we're, I'm we're on the second minutes, round, Mr. Ram. We're three minutes from the break here. Uh, do we want to extend for this? Do we want to extend for the reductions? Or do we want to break now and pick up at uh, 7 p.m.? And, and go for either the reductions or just keep on trucking. Mr. Mayor, I'll extend orders to finish this item and then I think everybody can return on Friday. We're all pretty tired. Okay, so uh, uh, the motion uh, Councillor Nichol is proposing is that we extend orders to finish this item. Is there a seconder for that? I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Uh, I'll move to amend uh, to say uh, to complete the reduction motions. Second. Okay. So please vote on the amendment uh, to make it the reduction motions. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I was a uh, question, a comment on that. Sure, go ahead. Uh, I could amend the amendment to, com to go till 9.30 tonight. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll actually all we... All, um, strictly speaking, Councillor Nichols' motion just um, uh, on its own extends into the dinner break to finish this item. Otherwise, we would come back at, at, uh, at 7, actually, and, and keep on trucking till 9.30. So I'll withdraw my amendment, actually. And the first question can be, do we want to extend to deal with this motion? Then after we finish this motion, we can decide what we want to do next. Does that work? Yeah, that's fine. I'll be prepared to move. No, we're already scheduled till nine thirty. We right? we are scheduled till nine thirty. That's the default. So um, so we could break after this. That that's the proposal before us right now is to finish the vote on this or debate and the vote on this. Then, absent any other direction, we would break until seven and pick up where we left off. Great. Okay. So I'll withdraw the amendment to the change orders uh, if there's no objection. Okay, so uh, the proposal to extend into the dinner break at minimum to finish this item is before us. Uh, I'll just seek unanimous consent. Any objections to that? No? Okay, let's carry on then. Uh, Councillor Knack is on the second round though. Councillor Paquette? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And you know, they say there are no bad ideas uh, when you brainstorming. Uh, so, you know, I can understand why this was brought forward. Uh, you know, we've seen other other places try this out. It hasn't really been that successful for them. Uh, short term, it looked good, but long term, not very good. Uh, but I get it. I get the I get the the rationale. Uh, but uh, I do have a question for administration. So, pays to go is partially funded by the investment that we make off of Bed and Tail, right? That is correct. Yeah. Okay. So we would be, in effect, decreasing options for capital funding in the future? I believe so. It would depend on the payback period, Councillor? Yeah. Right. And, that's, and I think it was referenced that the scope and scale of the impacts of COVID are not known to us. So we don't really know what we can do for payback. I, I'll just speak to this quickly. If it kind of feels to me like remortgaging the house to buy furniture on a pay later loan, expecting to get a raise at your job when in fact you might get laid off. Uh, and add to that, it's not even our home. Uh, we manage it in trust. Um, I just, it feels like 
we can't do that when, when we can't predict our future and without um, a stable and predictable income. It kind of, it's like trading the cow for magic beans at this point in, in, in many ways. And I hate to say that because you want to see every idea come forward. You want to see everything explored. But uh, in this case, you know, we've had months leading up to this budget. And this is the first we're hearing of it. And of course, there's a risk that if we vote no, that um, some folks will be upset because maybe they wanted to uh, to raid the future of our children in some way uh, to get a break now. But And the reason I say it is because I'm thinking about the Heritage Trust Fund and how once that door was opened, it just got depleted to the point where there's not really... Uh, something that we can give our grandkids that we're, that we're going to be super proud of. So I can't, I can't really support this. It's, uh, it's almost a, a profligate spending um, to achieve a short-term gain in an uncertain world instead of stable and predictable moves that benefit us in the long term. Um, and of course, the risk is that uh, in the public, and in, in, you know, a person can go and say, "Hey, I tried. I had a solution. Everyone was a coward. They wouldn't go for it." I mean, a person could could go out and say that if they wanted to be disingenuous. Um, not that anyone would, but uh, this is where we're at. And like I said, you want to you want to encourage every idea, but. Sometimes when you get the idea, you've got to be able to, to say, you know what, that was a good try, but it doesn't work. And uh, this one certainly doesn't work for me. And, uh, you know, we can make claims. You know, we can uh, make uh, appeals to emotion, to populism. We can do that. Uh, I don't, again, I don't think anyone would, but uh, I think the best thing to do here is, uh, is to just proceed capably and somewhat conservatively with our estimates and, uh, and the way that we move forward. Uh, this is not a time for rash moves. Not at all. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Paquette. Um, I've just received a very helpful note from the clerk that the um, operating budget amendments are not on the, on the floor. And um, in a way, that's appropriate. Um, but <laughs> given, but I'll make that time. motion, Mr. Mayor, so, to put the uh, operating budget on the floor. Uh, yeah, I just point, yeah. I, I think we just need uh, uh, with with the consent of the assembly, we'll pause for a moment on this operating budget adju uh, uh, adjustment that presumes the underlying motion. And uh, with your indulgence, I'll take that motion from Councillor Katarina uh, for the underlying uh, operating budget, seconded by Councillor Essinger. So that is now before us. We can now debate amendments to it, of which we have several <laughs> stacked up. So, my bad. Sorry, I forgot to uh, get the underlying motion on there. Uh, it just feels like it's been there the whole time since we've been talking about this for a month. So thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, back to now, uh, Councillor Knack and Councillor Walters are uh, both on the second round, I believe. Um, uh, and uh, I'm, not on. I'm not on. Oh, okay. That's from something else. Councillor Knack, you have more questions or is this to speak? Uh, a few more questions and then to speak after. Really? Okay. Someone want to move a second round of questions for Councillor Knack? I'll move a second round. Councillor uh, Nickel has moved a second round of questions for Councillor Knack. Second. Uh, seconded by Councillor uh, Banga. Please vote. Okay with me, I guess. The vote the vote is just being sent to you now. Okay. We Councillor Zadek? No. We have all the votes. Sort you of. You can't no, you can't do that. <laughs> Would you like to reconsider your vote, Mr. Oh sorry, I hit the wrong button. I abstained uh, for reasons of personal privilege and sanity. Um, uh, I will 
I will vote no. I know. We have all the votes, Mr. Display the vote, please. Um, that is carried eight to five. Uh, Councillor Knack, on your second ground, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, I just needed a bit more clarity on Councillor Henderson's question. So, the FSR, if we borrowed from the FSR to do one time, that is a three year piece, but is the same three year requirement in place if you essentially borrowed from the EdTel Endowment Fund? That I was unclear on. So, we would do we have to pay that back within three years as well? It, because you're passing from the bylaw, you would have the ability to determine the timing at which you would replenish. I believe when we were talking earlier about the three-year requirement, that would be if you were to run a deficit. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to make sure I was clear that, that, that you could actually extend that out further. There's obviously interest charges and dividend impacts, but, but we actually would legally have the ability to do that if, if we wanted to through the bylaw, uh, authorizing whatever change in the bylaw, correct? So I'm not a lawyer, but that is my understanding. <laughs> sure. That's fair. I just want to get a general idea. The other financial factor, so Councillor Cartmel did a great job summarizing the financial impacts. If you take out that amount of money, that will also, and I think it was touched on already, the dividend won't be as high next year, which we have budgeted for a certain amount. So on top of that 7 plus percent for there, there would actually be another further impact because what we've budgeted for for the dividend would not in fact materialize for 2022 so it could actually be eight percent i don't know but it but it would be higher right the dividend would be higher counselor sorry could you no sorry question? the dividend would be lower but since we've budgeted for a higher amount you also have to offset that difference on top of the other differences that were already articulated by counselor carmel would, would that not be the case? Yes, Probably. If, yes, if you lower the principal of the fund, it impacts the dividend going forward, and we'd have to adjust future budgets for the reduction of the dividend. And I, I just wanted to understand scope and scale. So it's actually even more than a 7% increase if you didn't find measures because the dividend wouldn't be quite as high as we thought. Okay. Uh, those are all my questions, Mr. Aaron. I'll just speak to it whenever I can get the chance. I'd like to move to reconsider my position on the previous uh, the previous vote. <laughs> that was Too well late. done. Well done, Andrew. Uh, but we'll just leave it. Okay. Um, um, oh yeah, didn't vote on the prevailing side, so I can't uh, I can't move to reconsider. Okay. So uh, any further comments, Councillor Knack? Yes, I just wanted to speak to it, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So, uh, you know, I, I actually do appreciate having this debate. I know Calgary had similar debates, Councillor Cartmel referenced uh, in past years where they use their equivalent of the FSR to find uh, one-time savings, which in turn created a much bigger challenge for them to deal with. This is a slightly different strategy, uh, albeit with very similar uh, challenges. So the first thing for me that jumps out at me in the motion is, is actually something you touched on a bit earlier, Mr. Mayor, which was uh, this motion actually essentially undoes the reduction strategies. And I find that to be a, a pretty big challenge because uh, outside of a handful of items that council has asked to add back in through our amendments, it would seem like the fact, considering that council hasn't voted or put forward motions to put in most of those reduction strategies back in, we're actually pretty comfortable with most of what administration has found. Therefore, I, I would just uh, maybe dispute this notion that most of the cuts are being made are in fact reckless when council has not asked to put back the majority of them. I think a couple were not the best decision, and I'm happy to have those debates when that time comes. But I actually think most of the reduction strategies should be applied. So to stop them now, I think for me, even beyond this next point that I'll make, uh, I, I think that would be a reason that I couldn't support this motion. I would much rather the motion be use the strategy that's being suggested to fund those critical things that councils identified here today and then give us a 5% tax decrease versus a 2% and then not use these reduction. That, that to me just feels really odd as a process. So that's, that's my number one issue. 
I think the second piece for me and, and what I wanted to highlight is I, I think about when we're talking about these finances, I always like to go back to personal finances, right? And, and when we're dealing with personal finances and a personal financial emergency, there's usually a couple of approaches we should employ as individuals, one of which is find ways to bring in more income, go get a second job, a third job, you do what you can to pay those bills, and you also find ways to cut costs. Uh, and potentially, so you cut expenses, and then if you absolutely need to, you tap into the emergency fund that you've ideally set aside as an individual. Everyone should have an emergency fund. If you don't yet, there's my life advice. Please go set up an emergency fund because when significant situations happen, you might need to tap into that. But what I look at right now is that we're not in that absolutely dire position that we need to pull from our emergency fund. And I say emergency fund in both the FSR or in our investments, and in which case, you know, putting it, comparing it to personal finance is almost taking from our retirement. I don't think we're at a point where we need to take either of those two things to help ensure we have appropriate services for folks in the city. Uh, we saw the survey results. There is a percentage of people who would like to see a further decrease, but there, the majority of their, or the plurality of respondents said they're comfortable with no increase. Uh, some said they were comfortable with an increase. I'm not. But I, I think pulling from that is unnecessary at this stage. We have administration that went through and, and as mentioned, found, I think, fairly reasonable changes to the budget that will allow us to not have a tax increase in the middle of one of the greatest financial crises that we're in. But I would not feel comfortable taking those additional funds like I would not in my own personal finances, pulling from my emergency fund, pulling from my retirement, when we've taken the action necessary to cut costs. So for those two reasons, I can't support this motion. I appreciate the, the idea behind it, but uh, this will create a much more significant problem for council, the next council, uh, a far greater financial challenge. Calgary has been dealing with it and they've paid the price for their political ex expediency for trying to set something up in a way that made them look really good politically that one year. And the residents are paying the price because of that. That's irresponsible and I don't support doing it here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Nickel to close. Well, thanks everyone for the scathing comments. I uh, I take them in the light of constructive criticism that you uh, you give them in, but I'm not sure what economy you're looking at, uh, councillors. We have 12% unemployment, record bankruptcies, and to suggest that we cannot look at reserve funds in this time is to me strikes me as well a little absurd. I don't think it's reckless. So this is what I've heard. We can't do it because we can't make an exemption to the bylaw. We can't do it because we have to make it up down the road. We can't do it because it's an unheard of precedent and tradition. Well, to each of these I reply to, I am fixing a result. The process to that result needs to be varied. We must be flexible. And what all I've heard from each and every one of you is you're focused on a process, not the result. And to put it in context, we're looking for 98 pennies out of 2,000 pennies if you want to pile them all up in our reserves. And again, I will point out our real problem is time. It is time. Time to make the proper calls. Time to make a proper adjustment. And I take exception to, think to, to the assertion that this is reckless. What is reckless is this council's unwillingness to look at its cash flow and its reserves. That is reckless. This is a multi-billion dollar organization. But, like for every business and household that out, is out there, these questions come down to very simple fundamentals. What is our shortfall? What do we need to do to stop falling and stabilize our situation? And what resources can we tap in the short term and medium term that will have the least long term negative impacts? 
I think with this motion we are fixing a result and letting administration adjust the process to suit the needs of Edmontonians. And again, I do not make this motion recklessly or lightly. I have considered out the numbers. And I would argue probably more so than some. And at this time, I find it difficult, difficult to justify frontline cuts, cuts to services, and the level of taxation that we have endured for 20 years, constant, never ending. And I'm saying putting a hard stop to it is what is in order. If this is what it takes, this is what it takes. Now, another issue is I believe we've got to stop holding our hands out, expecting other orders of government to bail us out. That has to come to an end. We have to handle our own problems and we have to get a grip on them. Now, to be quite honest, December is about establishing a plan. None of this matters till the spring. And April is when we need the money. So again, I am fixing a result and asking the process to be varied so we can deliver on the outcome. But all too often I've seen in this council mired in process as you debate $75,000 for baseball fields, which is absurd. We're a $3 billion operating budget. This is an absurd discussion as you focus on process. We debate grass cutting, which is absurd. We're a $3 billion company. I just don't understand that thinking. I just don't understand that thinking. There's a big picture, and we got to grasp hold of that big picture. People need tax relief. Everyone does. And a zero does just not, it just doesn't cut it, to be frank. And to be honest, we need time to put in those strategies with regards to partnerships and so on that will get us to where we want to make up that money later. I'm not saying that we have to do it all tomorrow. That is just madness. But we have to set the result and over time we can meet that challenge. That challenge will not go away today, will not go away next year, and will not go away probably for the next 10 years. So don't think in the short term. Think in the long term. And that is what I'm asking for today. I hope council, well, obviously, I know council is not going to support it. Thank but you. Your time is up. Please vote. Well, that was rude. Just waiting for a couple more. Councillor Zadek? Yeah, it didn't come up. I, I wish I could do this sort of quietly, but no. Yeah, you can. You can. Oh, no, the answer is no. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the vote. And that has failed. Okay, what does council wish to do at this point? Um, barring any other action, we come back at 7 and carry on, um, unless there's another motion coming forward. Yes, Councillor Walters? Oh, no. Well, should we take... Uh, 68 minutes break here and then come uh, and then pick up where we left off yes okay I see nodding heads so let's do that we'll come back at 7 and carry on with uh, whatever the next uh, operating reduction motion is in the queue thank you
Uh, yes, good evening. Thank you, Councilor Paquette. I'm here. Thank you, Councilor Walters. Councilor Walters? Yeah, present. Thank you. Sorry. Councilor Banga? Here. Thank you, Councilor Carmel. Good evening. Miraculously. Welcome back, Councilor Katarina. Yes. There you are, uh, Councilor Zadek. Reporting from a new location. <laughs> An undisclosed location. Uh, thank you, Councilor Essinger. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Councilor Hamilton. In stereo. <laughs> Councilor Henderson. I'm moving from my old location. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, so that's everybody. So by my count, there are 11 motions left. Uh, there are also an indeterminate number of uh, s subsequent motions <clears throat> greater than one. Um, it is possible that we could get through the better part of that, or perhaps even all of that tonight, and then we'd have a choice at the end of that whether we want to break, depending on, because these folks will need some time to reconcile and double check all the tables uh, and the accruals and everything. Um, if that, if, so if it all moves very quickly tonight, not to rush the debate, um, we, could, um, we could get to the vote on the main motion tonight. That's an option. Uh, but we also have all, almost all of Friday because we have just a couple of other quick items to deal with on Friday. So we're, we're, till here, uh, we're here till 9.30 uh, unless something changes. Um, but I, depending on where we're at after all the op motions and whatever subsequents we get through, we'll check in at that point, see if we want to Go to, go to the vote, we'll need a bit of a break. Uh, um, not too long, they assure me. Um, so we'll play it by ear. Um, uh, Councillor Henderson <coughs> had asked a really good question earlier about the how to book the precursor service uh, timing issue and the, the uh, reserve transfer associated with it. Administration went back and looked at that over the dinner break and discovered that the transfer from reserve is in fact beyond their delegated authority. And so kudos to them for flagging that and, and to Councillor Henderson for uh, identifying the question. It does need a true up motion uh, just to give administration authorization to do what is already in the package here. Um, so wording has been uh, transmitted to that effect. Uh, and Councillor Henderson is prepared to move that. So I'll get that on as op whatever uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to seal things up. Ben? Uh, that the service package for Valley Line Southeast Precursor Services as shown in Attachment 3 of Report FC00078 be approved. And I, I, my, my understanding is it has no tax implications. And so, Mr. Mayor, it's my understanding it's not an amendment to the budget, but it's an actual um, approval. So you can do it so now. So it's a subsequent? It is. You already have a motion on the floor. So if the intention is that this gets approved, I would suggest it could just get approved after, after, the, after we've dealt with the main budget motion that's on the floor. It's well, a since we can approval. take subsequents during as part of our... Um, more flexible procedures, do you mind if we just do it now and it'll get, I mean, it gets minuted whatever point in the meeting it goes in, right? Sure, 100%. Okay, then we can vote on that right now. It's just basically a replacement attachment with council's blessing is about the size of it. So <clears throat> um, uh, so the seconder on that was Councillor McKean. Are there questions on that? Um, seeing none, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the vote. East Quad just needed a dinner break. <laughs> I think there's still pizza in the back uh, if anyone wants to come in for some. Um, it's cold now, though. That passes 12 to 1. Okay, let's go to the next um, operating motion then. So start drafting your subsequence is my uh, the upshot of what I was saying a minute ago. Um, which one's next? Op, op four, please. Is that one mine? It is not. It's so Councillor Nax. Councillor Nax? Yep. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Nax. It's a 7,000. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that big, one, yes. Big dollars here. 
uh, that the 2021 operating expenditure budget for the mayor and council's office be reduced by seven thousand dollars on an, on an ongoing, ongoing basis. basis. On an ongoing basis, with funding reduced to the tax levy. Um, Councillor Henderson. I have, oh, yeah. sorry. Do, do you wish to introduce the no. motion? No, okay. I don't wish to introduce this. Thank you. Very sage, uh, Councillor Henderson. Questions on this, or you were on from before? Are there any other questions on this? Anyone wishing to speak to it? Seeing none, please vote. Just good to go. Display the vote. That's carried. Uh, now on to Op 5. That one's also Councillor Knack, right? Yes. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Mayor, I am wondering, uh, with some new information, I believe this should actually be um, listed as ongoing. And in turn, I was potentially thinking of using that for the increase in OP 10. So I don't know if I should actually simply hold off on this one and and make that clear in OP 10 that we're going to fund that through the reduction here. I don't know if you have a preference. It's, it's tricky because they're not the same amount. If they were yeah. exactly the same amount, but I think your intent's clear. Um, I'd, I'd just let it roll because they are, I understand Perfect. your desire to tether them. Council's heard that, uh, but I think we have to book this uh, library reduction one way or the other. And then yeah. the, you know, scramble will ensue afterwards to uh, use the proceeds for other priorities. So if you are comfortable with it, uh, we can register it here and, um, and uh, work through it in order on the others. I'm comfortable with that. Okay. So the motion would be that the 2021 uh, net tax levy operating requirement for Edmonton Public Library would be reduced by $1,090,640 on an ongoing basis with funding reduced to the tax levy. So that would be the restated motion. Is that a friendly amendment to what was put forward before? Is there any objection to the restatement? Just clarifies the timing. Um, okay, not seeing any uh, objection to restating the motion that way. Um, so that's before us. Is there any debate? Anyone wishing to speak? I'll close Council. quickly, Mr. Mayor. Before I, uh, going once, going twice, Councillor Nack to close. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. The only reason I wanted to speak to this is, is just a reminder. Uh, I want to, A, thank EPL for being willing to do this. Um, and worth saying out loud that with the exception of the funding that we added to them for the Heritage Valley, uh, Valley EPL to go location, EPL hasn't seen an increase, I think, in eight years at least. They've, they've asked for no increases for almost a full decade. So for them to do that and now allow this increase, thank you. And I, I say this out loud to the future councils that be, please remember that when the next four-year budget comes because I think they've shown a remarkable restraint uh, and, and remarkable financial uh, skills to do what they've been doing uh, over the last eight years. So I will vote in favor of this sort of grudgingly, but I hope that their money is returned at some point because we, we want them to continue to do the excellent work they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Please vote. Well said, by the way. Good to go. Display the vote, please. Carried unanimously. Um, On to op nine. That is yours, Mr. Mayor. Great. So the, the wordings uh, before you, um, there are some efficiencies in the consolidation of um, uh, the economic development functions uh, between all of the different entities. Um, I believe there are sufficient resources on an ongoing basis for Explore. Um, Council will have to revisit that in a couple of years anyway once COVID has passed and the structural and and echo issues have, have been worked out. But this, this covers their base on an ongoing basis at 11.7. 
um, and, and that happens to free up 1.75 for us to use for other priorities here on an ongoing basis. To be transparent about it, that 1.75 needs to be then covered uh, in each of the next two years from a, 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 from a, a, from a one-time source, which we have available for dealing with these, these COVID challenges. Um, I am confident we will get a little bit of extra support. Um, uh, for operating to help us with these kinds of issues, which we've been clear with uh, senior orders of government will be a challenge for us into 21. Uh, nevertheless, this three and a half million uh, um, coming from one time and, and coming out of the base and instead freeing up tax levy room uh, uh, through this reduction, uh, that three and a half uh, will not overly draw down uh, the uh, appropriated FSR to cover precisely this type of issue. So uh, uh, with, uh, after consultation with uh, Ms. Pearson and Mr. Lachlan on this, I feel comfortable with this funding swap and, and then also again for Explore uh, to have the certainty going forward uh, uh, for planning purposes. That's much more valuable to them in the out years to know that they'll be clocked in at 11 million and change because um, uh, they're going to have a lot of heavy lifting to do. Uh, but the tourism uh, sector in, in this uh, city has tremendous potential. Really happy with the work that they've, uh, they've been doing at Explore to, um, uh, on, on relaunch and supporting our hoteliers in their, in their very difficult recovery. And the conference center will be, both of them will be a critical part of this. So need to be resourced accordingly. I believe this motion does that. And uh, again, just the, uh, the resources are then available to cover some other priorities while still uh, hopefully maintaining our 0% objective. So um, leave it there, happy to answer any questions. Anyone else wishing to speak? Can we see the motion on the screen, Madam Clerk? Councillor Banga? Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, uh, in this motion, uh, could I know um, Explore Edmonton on the next two years? Uh, why is it uh, 9.9 .9 million? And uh, for the 2021 and uh, 2.8 million for the next one? Um. Uh, does the administration have the slides handy from the presentation we received the other day? This is sort of the crossing over of the one-time issues with the conference center and the ongoing need for the uh, for Explore Edmonton. So I'm truing up those two things because you'll recall when we were presented in the one-time impacts presentation uh, on Monday that the conference, because of the conference center, but also the shortfalls from the destination marketing fund, um, uh, Explore Edmonton is short um, essentially uh, $9 million in, uh, um, or 9.9 .9 million in 2021 uh, f that they would otherwise get from conference center revenues and from DMF partnerships. So they need some one-time money to make up for that in 2021. And in 2022, they need 2.8 because they figured they'll be getting DMF revenues coming back up as well as uh, more uh, bookings at the conference centers. So, uh, and then the, again, the net effect of this motion is that Explore Edmonton winds up with 11.2 ongoing, which is what they've asked for on an ongoing basis. Um, and then we're only using the one-time dollars for the one-time costs. Just a, just a quick clarification there. So it's 9.9, uh, it's .9 they need one-time basis 2021 and 7.1 million on a one-time basis in 2022. This is just shown incrementally in the motion, so it's 9.9. Oh, .9. right, okay, okay. Just to make that Okay, it, well, it might be easier then even just if it's a friendly amendment to the motion to say 9.9 .9 in 2021 on a one-time basis and seven point whatever. If you guys can read it, that's fine, but, but it might be more transparent to render it the other way. We're happy to change it to provide more clarity. I was pleasantly surprised there for a minute. I thought it was a bigger number. Anyway, sorry, it's your time, Councillor Banger. No, that's all. Uh, that's all my questions. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, any other questions? Anyone wishing to speak? Not seeing anyone. Uh, please vote.
Well, three in a row ain't bad. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Caterina. I, I voted as well, but yes. Thank you, and Councillor Hamilton. I had also voted yes. Okay, thank you. We have all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you. Display the vote. And that's carried 12 to 1. Um, that's the second last piece of cleanup business from the EDC restructure. Um, so almost there. Um, last but, or sorry, not last but not least, we still have a few more to go here. Uh, which one's next? Op 1? Because we're Mr. done Mayor, with the reductions, right? Now we're back. We're done all the reductions. Now we're back to the additions. We go back to off one. Thank you. Councillor Katarina, and then we needed to uh, just double check the amounts because uh, the reference is not inclusive of the asphalt plant and the number. Uh, That's correct. Yeah, there was uh, the, the number I have here is 825 uh, in regards to uh, the pools and the uh, arenas. That, that's the number I have, so. That's just if, I, if I could weigh in, Councillor, we yep. have to add on to the 825, $400,000. For, for, for uh, fleet and facility services, yes. So that gives us the 1.2 million. 1.225. Right, okay, so that, that's the exact number. The asphalt is out. Correct. Okay, so 1.225, so with that adjustment, um, two, two, five, uh, on there. I don't know if you want to put it up or I can, I'll read it in, uh, uh, that the reduction strategy, th number 35 to 39 facilities closures at 1.225, correct? Yep. Uh, included in attachment three of the, uh, November 16, 2020 financial and corporate services report, uh, FCS. Uh, uh, triple zero seven eight to be added back to the 2021 operating budget and be funded through an increase in the uh, 21 tax levy. And there's also a point three in 2022 as well, just because of some timing issues. Um, right. So uh, One point two two five in 2021 and an additional point three ongoing in 2022. That's correct. This Mr. Mayor. Yeah. yeah. Point point three. Yeah. Any uh, uh, concern with the Restatement of the motion with these clarifications. Seeing none. Um, questions? Debate? I'll uh, maybe click in here. Councillor Knack? Uh, sorry, yeah, I did. I just it was delayed trying to get in for questions, and okay, um, go ahead. I was just wondering about um, funding sources, uh, particularly recognizing I think the the desire for subsequent to look at working with partner organizations. Um, so I, I'm just wondering, is there a way? Because I imagine what we want to try to avoid do, doing is is obviously net anything above a, a, a tax levy increase. Um, this wouldn't use up that with what we freed up, but there's a few other items. So are there opportunities uh, maybe to administration for other funding sources that might fit within this opportunity, within this, uh, within this funding or capital profile or uh, operating profile? Uh, Councillor, a couple points. Uh, first of all, is the reimagined services work that's underway. Uh, there's a big body of work um, that is underway to look at efficiencies in operating rec centers. So, in terms of you know, sort of like contracting out is a is a is a scenario in terms of how mm -hmm. that might play out. So, and this could be well scoped in into that. And okay. That that sort of end of first quarter into second quarter of, uh, of, of next year. It's a much more strategic, comprehensive look as opposed to just focusing on just one or two facilities. So this gives us something to do in the meantime. It's a, it's a, it's a way to fill the gap. And then if we can figure out a, another alternative, then we could potentially return that back uh, if we've come up with a creative solution. Very, very much so, Council. Okay, okay that, that's it then for me for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Essinger? 
I just wanted to understand uh, what this does in uh, our bottom line. We're trying to get to zero. Do we have room now from some of the other decisions we've made? Uh, Councillor Essinger, that was um, the earlier comment that if everything okay. else went through here, we'd be at 0.1%. Okay, and I just was wanting to know where we got to point one. So, all right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McKean. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just sort of in answer to uh, Councillor Dack's question, I have a subsequent waiting in the wings with the clerks about asking administration to reach out to interested community partners around the arenas. So I might, if, if I don't know, w that would wait till later or I could do it right after this item. That's up to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, we can do it right after this, actually. So that's great. Thank you. Um, thanks for the heads up on that. Councillor Henderson. Uh, yeah, I fully support this, but just as a, just to do a, a tidy up here, um, I, will we have to do a true up on the on the on the um, one off pieces this year? Because we're not obviously these will get added to the list of facilities we may be able to open this year, but at the moment it's not going to mean they open tomorrow. No. So um, in our COVID budget presentation, the item that we discussed on Monday. Uh, we identified the option of phased opening of the rec centers. Yeah. Um, this doesn't um, provide that. What this does is provide certainty that these are open ongoing. But, but they will have to go through that conversation, the phase opening. This this really just deals with them on an ongoing basis. That's correct. And we will, when when they can reopen it over the next year is still a huge question mark. That's just, correct. I just think it's worth saying that out loud so that we don't create false expectations here. The, the question of when we could open them is an entirely different question of whether or not they're funded ongoing. That's correct. <clears throat> and again, just flagging that the report on Monday, we identified a potential phased opening as it relates to the COVID budget. Yeah, and, and these would now get, these. if this passes, these would now go into that discussion and that conversation. They would. The I, don't, I don't think yeah. it changes administration's recommendation no, on the phase I, openings. No, no, absolutely. I just thought it was, we should say that out loud. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just, in speaking to it quickly, going to anticipate uh, what uh, Councillor McKean was saying, which is that uh, I do think we need to look at some different options for how to uh, program and, and market some of these facilities, um, even some of them potentially on an interim basis while we look at, at facility replacements. We've done that for quite a long time with uh, SCONA with mixed success, honestly. Um, uh, I think there's something interesting about the outdoor pool at Oliver, again, um, uh, worth perhaps trying to attract some additional use and revenue, uh, or at least uh, with a partner reduce the, the cost to the city. Um, both those facilities are near end of life, though, to be really crystal clear. So, I mean, I do think this question is going to keep coming up. There's a reason administration keeps bringing these forward, and that, that reckoning will come. Um, hopefully it is answered with a replacement uh, at Rolly Miles uh, to this uh, facility and, and a facility that can attract new users uh, as well with some growth uh, investments and, and co-located amenities. Uh, and in the case of Oliver, uh, I'm very interested in that same conversation on the Tipton site. Uh, for a four-season replacement uh, for the densest community in the city. And again, I think if we can get some um, uplift capturing tools, given the thousands of units of development uh, along the LRT line that is coming there uh, and the existing density that's there, uh, I do think the, the much-loved seasonal amenity should pivot to a much-loved year-round and much more cost-effective uh, amenity for us to run ideally in that case with with um, uh, perhaps mixed use affordable housing uh, above for example uh, with air rights so I think we can get quite creative at Oliver and and the challenge back to East Glen and I really appreciated the innovate East Glen group coming and their commitment and their their sincere desire to work with the city to drive more use and drive more revenue uh, and and 
in that case, I mean, really what's described is a fairly boutique facility that is a complement to the um, uh, very robust facility we built not too far away at Commonwealth. And I can see a situation where the, the business case strengthens to remain, to retain East Glen over the long term because usership goes way up. Uh, through those targeted um, uh, measures to, to, to either bring up revenue or, or attendance or ideally both. Um, uh, and that perhaps even in that case, the, the inclusion of uh, some other related amenities, different kind of partnership with the school, um, uh, that, that some creativity is required there. Otherwise, this question will keep coming up. Um, so so I, I, this is partly anticipating the... Um, the subsequent motion, but but really, in order to see any of those things materialize, we do need some some funds, and we've been able to find a few dollars uh, to keep these facilities going for a few more years. Recognizing COVID is going to have impacts on them in the interim here, um, and and that charge back to us to to be consistent with the city plan and say that we need these amenities to attract growth, in turn means that when the development proposals come along 118th Avenue and for, for infill, and there's quite a bit happening in the Highlands right now, the, the argument that those new taxpayers need to see some amenities maintained in their neighborhood rather than lost is not lost on me. Ditto for, ditto for Rolly Miles, uh, ditto for Oliver. Um, and I, uh, so I do think this makes good on that, but I do, I think that comes with a challenge and we've put this before, but I think COVID is the time where we can really reset on this. Uh, to try to find a sustainable path forward for facilities in these neighborhoods. And in two of the three cases, that, that will be different buildings with different uses ultimately. And the challenge back is to find a way to make East Glen the boutique uh, but thriving offering that for more people than it is for the people who came and spoke passionately to us to keep it. Um, uh, so... so um, if that, if that doesn't happen, if that challenge isn't met, administration will be, have no choice but to continue to bring these forward. And eventually a council in a pinch is, is uh, going to be met with a facility uh, that it just can't justify anymore. Uh, so the numbers need to come up on these, um, but communities have done remarkable things uh, to rise to that challenge. Uh, in other contexts, we talked about school retention and so on and so forth. So the challenge is out, and I'm sure the communities, these are high capacity communities that will rise to that challenge. So I'll leave it there. Uh, anybody else before Councillor Katarina closes? Tony? Yeah, no, um, and, and this was always uh, in, in mind uh, of a subsequent uh, that uh, Councillor McKean is coming forward with that I certainly support. And uh, uh, your, your uh, few minutes there, Mr. Mayor, has uh, done a much better job in, uh, in the reasoning for, uh, for this. And we've seen the passion from the uh, community. It's fresh in our minds. It, uh, quality of life uh, certainly is a big play here. City plan is a big play and live healthy is a big play. And the one thing that I've got to say that I haven't heard for a long time, Mr. Mayor, uh, as you recall, is air rights. And a number of years ago, I'd asked for a report on how we could actually achieve that, which uh, uh, applies to virtually everything we build, uh, especially in transportation, LRT stations, all those sorts of things that uh, air rights would be uh, another source of uh, income or uh, uh, definition of this city versus others. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Please vote. Madam Clerk, no luck on this end, but a yes, please. Thank you. Same here, Madam Clerk. Yes. Thank you. Bam again. Yes. Thank but Thanks, Councillor Bango. Did not my screen. Yes. Jim. Thanks, Councillor Carmel. Yeah, I'll have to be yes as well. It booted me out of the program. Oh, I'm back. Here we go. Councillor Esslinger? I'm a yes, it kicked me out. 
And Councillor Hamilton. I'm also a yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the vote, please. Did it? Uh... We think it's glitching. At least it appears to be. And I've got uh, the vote is 13 to 0. Okay. Yeah, that's what I've got here too. Thank you. Um, next up is Op 2, uh, Councillor Katarina. Um, yeah, Mr. Mayor, did you want my supple, uh, supplemental? Oh, oh, yes, yeah. let's get that right now. Thank you. Apologies. Go ahead, Councillor McKean. Uh, I'm hoping the clerk can put it up. I emailed it to her like, a couple of hours ago. But in, in essence, it's to reach out to community interested community partners uh, to uh, um, look at creating a strategy for operating uh, and maintaining. Now, I restricted it to the, uh, the two arenas, Tipton and Oliver. Um, if somebody wanted to amend that and include the pools, that's fine. I didn't with Oliver because the rec planning is already underway. And with Scona, with Raleigh Miles on the horizon, um, maybe East Glen should be in there. Um, when I raised the issue of uh, some sort of partnership private or whatever with the uh, <clears throat> with the Oliver community residents <laughs> they weren't quite as enthused as I thought they might be but they they did say there might be an opportunity for a a pool operator apparently in Calgary there's one organization that sort of operates all the pools so um, the motion which is not before you right now unfortunately uh, is as I say uh, limited at the moment to the two arenas because we'd heard from um, a number of people, but uh, Hockey Edmonton, uh, Mr. Hogel uh, in particular was uh, very optimistic that they could play a large role in operating those two arenas. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, was there a seconder for that? I can second that, Mr. Mayor, if uh, yeah. that's appropriate. Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, Councillor Henderson. Yeah, just really quickly. I'm inclined to support the motion as it stands and not to add the pools. Uh, Scona is already uh, uh, in a contract situation. Um, and uh, my memory is with East Glen, and Councillor Canarina may confirm this, is there was a look at a private partner a number of years ago that created a huge amount of concerns and angst because of the access questions that it raised. Um, so I think I think I think it makes a lot of sense to do Oliver and Tipton, especially since we've had an offer of interest. Um, and I think that's worth following up on. I think it probably just muddies the water to add the other and creates work that probably won't be fruitful for the other facilities at this particular time. Um, so I think the motion is as good as it stands. Um, the one the one issue that we'll have to keep an eye on that I know came up uh, the concerns with the Tipton piece is how um, if we do give it to something like the hockey organizations how we still make sure that there's public access for non-hockey um, and that is the one piece that that I think will get factored in here but if there's ways to transfer that that public skate that happens at Tipton to uh, to Southside or, uh, or some of the other ones in the neighborhood that may be a good solution as well. So I just flagged that. I'm happy to support this, though. Thank you. Councillor uh, Katarina? Yeah, I had slightly different uh, approach, and I, I respect Councillor Henderson's uh, 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 opinion on, um, on Scona, but uh, there has been interest in uh, East Glen uh, uh, outside of the one that maybe didn't go in the right direction, uh, but there is interest... Uh, uh, to look at a third party if uh, if that makes uh, the improvements uh, with the caveat that uh, uh, the public portion of it uh, uh, remain robust uh, that uh, we ensure that uh, the public portion of of a third party run facility still maintains that uh, 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 community access uh, 
to it. So I, I would prefer to include it into the sub motion if I can make that amendment, because I think it would be uh, received well uh, in uh, in East Glen uh, in that community. That's that's friendly to me, uh, Councillor, and to Mr. Mayor. Okay. Is there any objection to taking that as friendly? Okay. So adjusted. Anything further, Councillor Katarina? No, that's uh, that's all. Thank you. Okay, um, Councillor Car Councillor Carmel. I guess just a quick uh, question to Mr. Smythe that they would accept or or consider. Uh, proposals on some or all of the facilities, not necessarily in all or one. So this doesn't hurt necessarily. Eric? Well, I think scoping it in would be fine. I mean, it, I mean, probably different partners would be interested in different facilities. Yeah. And then this will have to dovetail in with that bigger, the bigger strategy that may have the same kind of perspective on some other facilities that aren't being discussed this afternoon. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Paquette? Yeah, just really quickly, I'm just going to, uh, uh, I agree with uh, what Councillor Henderson has to say. So um, I, I support uh, the pools, but I don't support uh, maybe contracting out the services. So uh, pretty simple. Thanks. Thanks. Um, any other questions? Any other comments? Please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. And I'm a yes to Aileen. Has the vote gone out? Okay, oh. thank you. Uh, display the vote. Sorry, we're, we don't have all the votes oh, yet. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, for me too, please. Thank you, Councillor Banga. And for me, please. Thank you. I'm a yes. It wants me to abstain, but I won't. Please don't. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton? Again, yes. It's, it just keeps cycling, I guess. Okay. Thank you. We've got all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Uh, carried 12 to 1. All right. Next, then, is Op 2. Uh, Councillor Katarina. Yeah, and uh, this is, uh, there was a, a revision in the... Uh, the dollar amount uh, I had stated, it was, I believed it was one year, but it's uh, two ninety seven for two years. So it's two ninety seven each year for two years. Uh, so if that uh, read it in with that adjustment, that the community standards and neighborhoods expenditure budget be increased by. Two hundred ninety-seven thousand in twenty twenty-one on a multi-year basis for two years, so I go into twenty twenty-two to provide funding for Alberta Avenue and Jasper Place revitalization with funding from a transfer from the appropriated financial stabilization reserve. And uh, I'll just make one comment now, and then maybe close on it if there are any questions. Uh, that uh, this year of uh, funding twenty twenty-one really didn't wasn't realized because of the circumstances that we're in. So that additional year in 2022, I think is uh, appropriate to make up for, uh, uh, for this one year that we realistically lost because they were funded uh, for this year. So uh, I'll leave it at that. And uh, Councillor uh, um, uh, Knack uh, uh, second this, I believe, yeah. Yeah. Councillor Knack? And I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just actually a question for, for Mr. Smythe. Uh, so I know I, I had been um, getting uh, some text messages from uh, Todd James from the Stony Plain Road BIA. And um, so they, they were working on an arrangement that might, and not them exclusively, but sort of more as a community collective, be the home for any spillover funding or uh, spillover funding, overflow funding. Um, so I'm just curious is that if we approve this, are there opportunities to work a little more creatively with the, and I don't want to speak for Alberta Avenue, but I'll so just look at Jasper Place. You know, if the BIA and some of the community groups want to come together and potentially be responsible for using that funding to help 
um, develop that exit plan? Or are we okay with uh, looking at alternatives like that? Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely, Councillor. Uh, this will this be the program money that will basically provide you know different kinds of events and services and programs that the groups want to do. What this doesn't include is the FTE, an internal FTE that was supporting them. So, so the capacity of the organization is. I mean, I think it's there in both cases. I can mm -hmm. spades actually. So they, well, they can then take that leadership role and determine how the how the funds will be will be spent. So I guess my follow up, because that that's sort of the thinking is that if they, again speaking just for the Jasper Place, feel like they want to have use some of that funding to hire their own half FTE to help put on and develop capacity, because unlike Alberta Avenue, which obviously had a lot of excellent folks who were doing amazing work, uh, we have some excellent folks in Jasper Place, but they still need a bit of an additional support. So if they wanted to, as a community sort of say, we'd like to use that money differently. Does this allow us to be a little more flexible? Yeah, it, it does, Councillor. I mean, we can okay. take that back with, with that kind of um, direction. It doesn't need to be a motion, but I think that that does make imminent sense that, you know, this is kind of resources for them to continue that revitalization work they've been doing and how that group sees best fit to, to do that would be basically, you know, their call. Now, we'll kind of keep a watchful eye on how that unfolds. Mm -hmm. um, and our point people will be our NRCs that will facilitate that conversation. Absolutely. That's great. No, thank you. So just uh, may, oh, actually, I see Councillor Essinger's on the board. I just want to speak to it at some point, but I'll wait for questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Essinger. I'll start there because what I heard from uh, the group at Alberta Avon it's predominantly in Councillor Katarina's area, but some of my communities are also involved in the Alberta Ave initiative, uh, is they wanted uh, a person to, to have that person to hire. And I do have a subsequent that we explore working with either EFCL or the BIAs to contract some of that work um, as a subsequent motion. But Mr. Smythe, uh, you just indicated that you saw that, I don't know if you see a need to have that motion, but you referenced they could hire someone if they wanted, but that's what they really want and feel that's their lack. You know, I think we've got to work, work, work that through with, with both of, both of the um, revite areas uh, in terms of what they see as, as, as the best way to move forward. I mean, they are, they're allocated. The amounts are a little different between the, between the two, marginally different, but what it's really just playing that community development role and, and allowing community to step up. Again, these organizations are in my head quite quite mature in their in their leadership in those in those in those areas. So, you know, and they know what the end goals are. So, you know, and our our NRC and their their director, Chantel, would would work with them to, to, to go there. So if they wanted to use some of those resources to hire a part-time individual to to be some of the legs of that of that of that of that work, you know, I think that would be perfectly in scope. Okay, so would a uh, subsequent help to do that? Because I think EFCL, the BIAs, there's a lot of interest in that role supporting this work. Um, yeah, I. Yeah, motion might be helpful. I'm just not sure identifying actual agencies, but I think our, our NRCs know know kind of who the main players are. Um, so we could maybe just take that away and you know and, and work without without identifying any any specific organization. I mean, you well, floated. Okay. Like I think it's important to put them in there, but uh, I do have that subsequent when we're done with this, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. That's all Thank my you. question. Noted. Thank you, Councilor Pricat. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm, I'm going to support this, but uh, with reservations. Um, I am hoping that what we see going forward is more uh, community collaboration, more capacity building. Um, obviously, this can't just keep going on and on and on. We have to see some so form of, uh, you know, independent action that takes us out of the city city's hands for the most part and into the community's hands. Uh, because again, they're going to be coming back for funding. 
at some future point. And uh, I'm just wondering, is this the precedent and is this the example we want for every other revitalization we ever undertake? Or do we need to have an exit strategy uh, that doesn't leave anyone high and dry? That's going to take uh, the community itself uh, in building a lot of these connections. And so if they feel they can do that in the next two years uh, on, on uh, Alberta Avenue, great. Uh, if Jasper Place thinks that they can take those learnings and really accelerate uh, the process, fantastic, because we're looking at other revitalization areas coming up, and I really want, them, want, to, want this program to be uh, successful. I want it to, to actually um, not become a never-ending sort of funding crutch because that doesn't help anyone. So if it means that uh, we target more on, on uh, community building and capacity and that sort of systems change, great. If it just means that uh, we have some more parties, which are always awesome, then maybe this isn't really... Uh, you know, the best use of ongoing year after year funds. And I, I know I sound a little bit like a curmudgeon here, but I, I think the point stands. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, just want to propose a mild amendment, a single word change, uh, that we strike uh, the word appropriated. Um, and, uh, and the argument, I need a seconder for that, though. Second. Thank you, Second. Mr. Nickel. Uh, so the argument for that is simply that in consultation with Ms. Pearson, uh, administration is trying really hard just to keep COVID draws out of the appropriated COVID reserve. And this, this is business revitalization, so you could kind of argue it, but it predates COVID. And our case for replenishment and support for the extraordinary COVID costs is, better if, is stronger if we're not pulling from that reserve. So I think the regular FSR is a one-time source of funds. It's above the, um, the threshold by a fair bit. Uh, uh, and, and I wouldn't want to go there for a large amount of money, but for this, to keep this going and transition it according to what's in the, um, in the uh, potential subsequent, um, I, I think works. Uh, and so uh, just move to strike um, appropriated, which might be friendly, but... It's very friendly. Uh, thank you. Okay. Is there any objection to making that as a friendly change? Not seeing any. Then, uh, with that adjustment, um, uh, we'll carry on. Councillor Henderson. Well, just a little bit in response to Councillor Paquette's point, which I have some sympathy for, and 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 am tempted by that argument. But I'm also aware, and we see this in some other areas, that there's a kind of assumption that we go in and do these projects with a timeline and when we're done, everything will be perfect and everybody graduates. And, and I think that may not be a safe assumption. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I, it, it's, it's somewhat, I don't want, it's not the same situation, but it's somewhat reminiscent of what I felt happened with some of the Housing First stuff, that I think there was a misunderstanding of what that program was about, that you could go in and give everybody a support for a year and at the end of it, everything would be fine and they'd move on. And I, and I think, that misunderstands part of what makes these programs work, and and we and so I'm obviously you're hoping to move uh, communities uh, to the point where they can uh, self-sustain, not need it anymore. But I think with an expectation that it has a fixed time, that you need X amount of years to do that, could waste a lot of good work that's been done. Um, so uh, and I think that's where this is at. How you make that judgment call, I don't know. How you make sure that you don't get um, uh, complacent and and rely on funds that shouldn't necessarily be there forever, I think, is the challenge. But I do think we need to be careful that in this belief that somehow that we can go in for a specific period of time and then come out and it'll be perfect, we may be wasting the money that we're putting in to begin with. Whether that's the case in this instance, I, I can't speak with huge authority, but I think that's the one thing we do need to keep in mind. So. I'm, I'm prepared to support this. I think all of our hope is that at a certain point, this is a neighborhood that will no longer need this support. But, but, um, but if we fix ourselves on the idea that, that you have to wean people off these things prematurely, we may undermine the good work we've done. Thank you. Um, Councillor Knack? Uh, just to speak to it. Uh, so Go okay. ahead. 
Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just uh, again, yeah, I, I want to sort of echo a, a lot of what Councillor Henderson just said and, and respond a little bit to Councillor Paquet as well and, and echo the point, which, um, and I'll speak specifically about Jasper Place, which is that what I hope and my challenge to those uh, who are already pretty actively engaged in this is that this funding I hope can be focused on helping to build up capacity in the area. So we've done some great events, as you've mentioned, like uh, I'm glad that we've been able to fund some really important programs that have helped uh, many families. Uh, we have some, you know, single parents, families working multiple jobs. And so a lot of the organizations there have helped support a lot of those families through events. And that's one piece and that's great to have. But frankly, we need more people engaged and involved to help build that up. So of the four communities that surround Jasper Place, uh, Glenwood and West Jasper Place are quite active. Their community leagues do quite a bit. Um, Kenora is active as they can be. They have a great park watch team that does some really fun events. Um, but they've had community league volunteers on their board who haven't lived in the community for 20 25 years at this point and they're staying on because there hasn't been that that new introduction of new people uh britannia youngstown has struggled to have fulsome boards uh, available to support so uh, my hope and my my challenge to the community league is uh or to the communities uh led by folks which will likely include mr james from the stony plain road bia including some of these organizations that have supported these families is we're going to use this funding to help really enhance the capacity to build up those communities the way we need to. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, this truly, I, I do think this has to sort of be the, the end goal so that we can see a clear end, uh, because I, I appreciate Councillor Paquette's point. I don't want to have that um, ongoing forever and ever. We want to build that up. So uh, that's why I'm asking folks to support this uh, from a Jasper Place perspective. Uh, these communities still need a bit of additional support. And uh, I, I, my commitment is to work with them as long as I can uh, to help get to that point where, where we feel we're comfortable, where we don't need that money uh, in the future. So thanks very much, and I uh, hope everyone can support this. Thank you. Councillor Essinger? I'm just speaking to it. Uh, I support this uh, initiative I, I think that where we're at is we're at a real crossroads for these communities. Um, we heard from them how through COVID they magnified some of their vulnerabilities um, and they're trying to react to that. There's a lot of folks trying to come together and what I heard really clearly was less about the programming dollars but more about a need for somebody to coordinate some of those pieces. And I think that's the capacity building they desperately need. So if we can use that funding to hire someone to help coordinate those pieces uh, and embed it into the community so there is sustainability. I think uh, they're at the point that they're at the cusp of coming into some great things, but they're not quite there. So I think this will hopefully get us on a strong path forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Banga. Thank you. Um, if I recall uh, correctly, last time we had the same discussion um, about uh, these two community leagues um, or communities. Um, and, uh, you know, the, my, I guess, perception at that point was that, you know, eventually they would be uh, self-dependent. But... Uh, for me, it, uh, it seems like the, this keeps coming up. Every year, it's the same thing. You can't leave it now because we got all this good work done. But again, uh, um, in my opinion, these, uh, these communities are, uh, I guess, sort of getting dependent on, on these, uh, uh, these dollars and uh, I don't think that was originally the intent, uh, intent of this. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I will support it, but I am definitely saying that, you know, I don't want to see it again and again and again. 
So I'll support it for now. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Katarina to close. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thanks for all the comments, uh, Councillor Esslinger and Councillor Knack, uh, on the rationale. And uh, just uh, a quick comment. This is not forever. This is uh, a two-year uh, uh, exit uh, strategy. Uh, the additional year in 2022 was because of the year lost uh, because of COVID. And uh, so I, I want people to understand that, that this is not ongoing uh, forever. Uh, something that I, I need to uh, stress is the fact that uh, when they came forward, we all heard uh, Alberta Avenue in particular is uh, their capacity has been built over a number of years and they are uh, very eager to share that their capacity uh, with anybody else, any other community uh, that's starting uh, in, exa for example, Baldwin, Belvedere, Englewood, uh, that they'd be willing to put in their uh, expertise and knowledge as sort of equity uh, that they would be contributing, uh, not different than, uh, you know, uh, Habitat for Humanity, where you put in some sweat equity. They're absolutely willing to provide that sweat equity in what they already have gone through, their expertise uh, provided to anybody that uh, uh, would like uh, their help. Uh, so I think that that's a, a really good uh, uh, point uh, on their part and uh, certainly uh, very, very appropriate. And they understand that this is to get them to the point where they can exit, uh, but exit in a uh, healthy, uh, healthy way uh, and still providing that uh, service to other uh, communities. Um, so with, with that, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, it can't be built into motion that, but the offer is there on the table. Uh, Mr. Smythe, you heard it uh, from Alberta Avenue and all the capacity that they have that at any time that uh, uh, other communities or you yourselves uh, would like to use them to uh, uh, provide that additional service that maybe a half FTE cannot provide, uh, I think that they would be quite open to, uh, uh, to doing that for you. So in saying that, um, uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Please vote. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor McKean. Display the vote. Uh, we're just waiting for two more votes. Oh, Councillor okay. Cartmel and Councillor Katarina, please. Uh, yes for me as well, uh, Madam Clerk. Thank you. And yes for me. Thanks. Thank you. We're good to go, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. Carried unanimously. <clears throat> Next up is... Mr. Mayor, would you like my oh, subsequent? Pardon me, sorry, I'm 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 too eager. Councillor Essinger with the subsequent. Uh, I would like to move that the administration explore opportunities for potential community partnership, example, EFCL or the BIAs to provide additional community support for Alberta Avenue and Jasper Place communities. Second. Uh, EFCL has been at the table and uh the, BAI, the BIAs, I know on Alberta Avenue and in Jasper Place have been quite engaged. And so they're doing it on the side of their desks. And so if we're going to look at uh, a person doing some of that coordinating work, it might make sense to look at either organization or another appropriate organization. Um, and that would allow capacity building within those organizations to support, to support future organizations. So I think we can grow the initiative. So I just want us to explore it at this time as a way to move it forward into a sustainable activity. And Councillor Essinger, apologies, but did you want that to come back to committee? I forgot to include that in your draft motion. Uh, it doesn't have to come back to committee. I was hoping they would explore it and uh, with those organizations. Okay, thank you. I, I think it would be good, um, but I would say perhaps even Q1 2022 because the, the next council needs to be brought into it and, and pick up the thread. Uh, maybe there's a different time, but I'd suggest that it's a sort of a succession thing we should flag and it should come back to committee, if that's okay, Councillor Essinger? It's fine to come back to but it would need to come back in early 20, 
20 in order to get the work underway. Well, there's two, there's two years of funding, or, or is the suggestion that we not do it for the succession, but do it in the shorter term as well? Uh, we may want to explore and contract either of these organizations to do some of the work of the two years of funding that's currently in place. Okay. Well, that, that I think would still also require a comeback to committee. But um, uh, so you're thinking, you're thinking. Um, Q I'm thinking that. 2021 yeah. sooner rather than later. Yes. Okay. So then, then the question back to admin is realistically. That's probably a little more than a 13 week given what's between now and then. What, um, uh, Mr. Smythe, do you want to have a t give a timeline for this to come back to committee? I think I would propose maybe second quarter. Yeah, you know, okay. we'll get the rules in motion early in the year and, and then, you know, let council know um, how we've connected those dots and where, where council Eslinger's motion is going. Second quarter friendly to everyone? Okay, we'll put that to committee uh, in second quarter. Okay, carry on, Councillor Essinger. Uh, that's really all I had to say. I just think that these are uh, looking at organizations so that we don't have to come back here with into the future and maybe we build capacity to do this in other places as well. Thank you. Um, anyone with questions on this? Uh, I do. I've clicked on, but it's not popping up. It says I'm. St there's still a vote in progress. Pickett as well. Okay, uh, Councillor Knack, then Councillor Pickett with questions. Oh, there we are. Thank you. Um, uh, just Mr. Smythe, I want to make sure, and I think I just heard it at the end. So to be clear, uh, so we'll go, for example, to the Jasper Place Steering Committee that is already in existence, and say we've got this money. How, and they've already been thinking about how they want to use it if they were sort of empowered to have that and how they'd want to distribute that. So so we wouldn't wait until this report back to essentially take action. You would you would let them take action and you'd just be reporting back on, here's what we're doing. Well, I, I know Todd is already at that table, but it's making yeah. sure that the FCL is there. Sure. And, and, and similarly up in uh, Alberta Ave. Yeah, and, I, and, and for me, you know, I have no problem with the EFCL being there. I, I would just say that I think the steering committee is made up of not just Todd. We've got uh, community mm -hmm. organizations. We've got some businesses. So I think they already have a pretty good indication of what they need to do. And, and I'd just like to make sure that they can, they can be empowered to go and start using this money in a way that will help accomplish what we've just been talking about. That's, my, that's what's in my head as well. Perfect. So happy to support this motion just to make it very clear, but I want to add one to make sure we were empowering the steering committee to get moving. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Briquette. Yeah, thank you. I, I love this amendment. I'm just wondering if it would be friendly to add nonprofits as well. I'm thinking of things like, like organizations like Bantero or C5 and their uh, expertise and capacity building as well. Would that be friendly to uh, add nonprofits? Potential. A partnership. I just put two examples in. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't think it eliminates them. I just know that they have been at the table and already. So, if there's other partnerships that are appropriate to explore, I think that's perfectly wide open. Sounds good to me. Thanks. Yeah. It's uh, it's not exclusive to the two that are listed as an example. So I think rather than getting into listing specifics. Um, but but on that understanding, I think I see no one else on the board. Uh, anything to close, Councillor Essinger? No, I think it's quite straightforward. Thank you. Please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thanks, Councillor Katarina. I'm a yes. Thanks, Councillor McKean. Yes. Thank you. Just waiting for Councillor Banga. Yes, for Banga. My Thank you. Computer we, we have hitting. all the votes. Have we, have we got all of them? 
and that's carried. And yes for Banga is my mood for the rest of the day. Um, <laughs> that's great. Okay, next up is op. Uh, I keep having to pull this up. Op seven. So pardon me, no, op six. Uh, Councilor Zadek. Thank you. Uh, I'll read it in first again. So it's that reduction strategy number 58. Elimination of spray, spay and neuter services for $0.1 million. Included in attachment three of the November 16th, 2020 financial and corporate services, FCS 00078 be added back to the 2021 operating budget funded through an increase to the 2021 tax levy. To introduce that really quick, I uh, commend administration for leaving no rock unturned in their pursuit to um, get us basically to a 0% budget, and they're doing basically what we informally and formally ask them to do. So bringing this forward, because there, there are some redundancies uh, with this service and uh, other services provided in the city, made sense on one level, but I think that this is um, not appropriate for, for various reasons. Uh, it's only $100,000, and um, perhaps our effort could be to build the capacity for spay and neuter um, services more so in the volunteer and private sectors in future years. But for right now, um, I don't think this needs to be cut and it's not very much money. Um, and we talk a little bit about exponential growth on, on different topics, really uh, with an uncontrolled animal population, feral cats and the like, um, that can really get out of hand and have a lot of costs downstream. So I would ask um, for a council's support with this just to reinstate the $100,000 and, uh, and move on. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Henderson. Well, just really quickly, because I didn't get a chance to ask questions while we were on the previous bit, but to administration, I'm suspecting that the cost of not doing this, although hidden, is, is significant. Um, that, that, you know, dealing with the cost of dealing with the feral cats and the animals that we know are already a problem for us, that this was put in to try and bring that cost down. Um, but have we quantified that at all? Uh, not specifically, Councillor. I mean, it's our view that this is really not a core service of local government. Um, rescue agencies and pet owners themselves and the Humane Society would then become sort of responsible for this. And it certainly is, as you say, a risk of, of, of uh, more pets that will not, will not be adopted. But... Uh, but really well, I, I guess my larger worry is it is a service, it is a core service of ours to have to deal with the stray, stray animals that are, have already been a significant problem for us and that this was one of the ways we had of dealing with that. Um, and, and my fear would be that that problem would get worse if we get out of this business. So although it may not be directly a core business, we pay the cost in, in responding if we can't put the prevention in place. But we haven't had a look at those. We don't have... No, that, no, that, that is that is a risk, and just as I communicated, I think when was, when this was first discussed, there is still some funding in the animal rescue fund, uh, thirty thousand dollars, and also funding in the prevent another litter subsidy program, uh, fifty thousand dollars. So it isn't that there's no no support. There is some funding that's it's been there for a long, and that funding is provided to agencies to provide some of those services. But you're right, though there is there is that that scenario that may result with this with this reduction. Yeah, and we and we already know, I mean this this time last year we were dealing with the issues with uh, with with um, uh, SPCA already, which um, so I you know their capacity must be problematic as well, I would assume. I think you're probably accurate, yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Thank you. Uh, first uh, question to administration is, uh, uh, I mean, the amount of emails I got on this topic, it was utterly ridiculous. You know how many, I think this was probably uh, appearing like it is, nah, it is uh, the biggest issue. I don't know. I'm not a cat owner. I'm not a dog owner anymore. But uh, I am certainly uh, feeling that it must be an important issue for lots of folks. Um, just for administration, is this a big problem? 
Uh, maybe I'll ask ask our acting uh, branch manager John Simmons to weigh in on on that. John, are you on the call? I believe. Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, a large problem with uh, we we do a, approximately a thousand surgeries a year uh, for spay and neutering animals that come in. And just to uh, the previous question, the the feral cats we do have our trap neuter return program uh, where we do deal with a, a number of feral cats uh, for that, but it's a, a relatively low number. But uh, the, the cats that we're dealing with here, it's, it's the majority of cats, and that's why I kind of mentioned cats. The majority of the cats that we're dealing with are essentially free roaming. Uh, they come into the center and then to move them onto an adoption agency, either a rescue agency or the Edmonton Humane Society, um, we do spay and neuter them as part, as part of a service to, to put those out to rescue. Okay, and uh, so what happens to these uh, animals after we do what we say we were doing. Uh, Councilor Banga, the, the animals that are, are spay and neutered, they then go on to a rescue agency. So one of the number of rescue agencies that we work with or we transfer them to the Edmonton Humane Society and then they go up for adoption. Okay. And uh, so that is actually deferred cost from the adopters, I guess, to, to the city. Essentially, that those costs would not be transferred on to those folks that would be adopting those animals from the rescue agencies. Okay. Well, uh, like uh, the mover said, it is uh, it's a pretty small amount of money in the bigger scheme of things. Uh, and uh, again, I was really shocked at how many concerned people were um, were involved or passionate about it and uh yeah i'll i'll support it but uh i was talking to uh, a couple of folks uh in my family there and uh they were actually uh, i don't know uh, making fun of me that uh, is that what city of edmonton is discussing but anyway uh it must be important to a lot of people so and uh I'll uh, support this motion, and uh, my friend for a hundred thousand uh, uh, dollars, Councillor Zadik. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Don't see anyone else. Councillor Zadik to close. I would just say the way dog parks are important to dog owners. Um, here we have, you know, issues with cats. We heard it's primarily about cats, but I mean, what's great about this beautiful city is we all have different interests and when we can accommodate them or satisfy some concerns, uh, especially for a, a low price, um, I think it's worthwhile and it's, this is really a citywide um, service. So that's all. Thank you. Please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you. I'm a yes. Thank you. Uh, yes for me. Thanks, Councillor Kurtmel. Councillor Walters. We're good to go. Thank you. Display the vote. And that's carried unanimously. Um, no subsequence on that one. Uh, so op seven, Councillor Zadig. Thanks. This is the one about the YMCA. I'll read it in again. It's the, the 2021 operating expenditure budget for the community recreation facilities branch be increased by up to $1 million on a one-time basis for funding to be provided for the YMCA of Northern Alberta to reopen the Castle Downs Family YMCA in 2021 with funding from a transfer from the appropriated financial stabilization reserve. <clears throat> to introduce that really quickly, uh, as the Community and Public Services Committee will note and subsequently reported to Council uh, and Council accepted it for information, uh, we, we heard from the YMCA at Committee um, we heard that their ask is, is a one-time 
up to a million dollars. And as the mayor pointed out earlier today, uh, it might not be required if um, to the full amount if recreation facilities are uh, closed into the new year for a while. I'm sure that administration can prorate this amount appropriately. Um, it's for the, the special source of funding, sorry, it's from the special source of funding for COVID related matters. Um, the YMCA really punches above its weight in an area where we don't have a, a city rec center right now. Um, it really is a community hub for those that haven't been there. There's three other or four other recreation facilities uh, for the YMCA across the city. Um, or one, two, three. There's three others. But this one at Castle Downs is a bit unique. Um, they don't recoup all their, their funds uh, through regular memberships because they offer very uh, many, many subsidized memberships. Um, and that's the consequences of, of having trouble paying bills. Is like, I mean, it's great that they're offering so much subsidies. And, and normally they can make it happen and make it whole by internal subsidies from their other rec centers. But because those other rec centers were closed this year for a, a, a large portion, um, that's impacted their ability to keep the Castle Downs one afloat. So I commend them on their business model, initially having a, a facility that is very popular and well utilized by the community, but offers so many subsidized rates that it, it can't pay the bills on its own. And then we see the consequences of this when the, the more affluent ones um, that char charge the regular prices more um, are, are closed and not able to subsidize it. So it's a one-time ask. It really is a community hub. Uh, what's also interesting about this is there is future talk and not presupposing any decisions by this council or future councils, but the city of Edmonton, uh, instead of building a standalone rec center in the Castle Downs area, could build something attached to the YMCA where there's all types of partnerships that were potentially explored about adding onto that facility. Uh, there's going to be, uh, hopefully, an LRT stop there soon, or soonish at 153rd and Castle Downs Road. Uh, EPL has expressed interest in possibly locating across the street from where they are right now in a shopping plaza. Um, and the, the Catholic High School completion centers in that area. But if the YMCA closes, if they can't justify it in, in their time of need right now, that could hurt existing membership. Many people are chomping at the bit to get back in there. Uh, so that, that could really impact the future viability of this whole important node on the north side. And um, so I think we should explore it. And for whatever it's worth, not to get political, but it's on the edge of Ward 3. And uh, if you take the argument that Ward 3 will be, you know, with different boundaries and different name, but for ta uh, Ward Tasca in Ewok, that's what would be kind of considered Ward 3. But this is going to be transferred outside of Ward 3. So it's really speaks to just how it transitions communities on, on the north side. Um, so for whatever it's worth, while I'm the city councilor of Ward 3 right now, it, it would be uh, existing in, in under different boundaries and different name um, in the future after 2021. But I, I think it's important just for the whole area. And I've heard some people say, well, Clareview is on the north side and it's close, but it's, it's not close at all. Uh, this is at 113th Street, essentially, and uh, Clearview is around 50th Street. So if you do the math, simple subtraction, you see it's very far away. And it'd be great if O'Leary Pool and some of the other ones were closer or bigger or whatever the case is. But uh, there's really no city facility in this area. This is sort of a small amount um, that I think will really keep this going. Okay, I spoke longer than I uh, anticipated, and I see there's some speakers. So I'll, I'll end it there. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Essinger? Thank you. This is sitting in uh, Canonic Ward 2 next time. Um, it serves a broad area. We do have the Grand Trunk on 113th and about 130th Avenue. Um, I do have a question for uh, Mr. Smythe, because I understand uh, for some time the Castle Downs Y has had some challenges financially, and COVID really brought it to a head. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. It was heavily or it was subsidized by their other their other facilities, so it's always been operating in the, as in a deficit position. Thank you. And uh, and I guess uh, my other question is um, a concern. It's the pool and the rec facility that's being opened because their other programming, their partnership, uh, community hub, and daycare are already open, right? So this will just be for the pool. Is that correct? I just want to make sure I understand. My understanding is it's the, yeah, it is a pool and the and the fitness area. That's correct. Okay. Um, 
rather than getting on again, uh, Mr. Mayor, would you like me to speak to it now or would you like me to go around? Uh, uh, it's up to you. Go ahead. You got three minutes, 40. I am, I feel great sympathy for uh, this facility, um, knowing that they want to serve many uh, subsidized families, but we have city rec facilities that we have not been able to fund yet. Uh, on the plan is to open old area in March um, and Grand Trunk uh, is going under renovation or is annual maintenance and could open later on. They are fairly close to this facility and for me I guess I as I struggle with it um, I'd love to have swimming available there um, but I think we have staff that we've laid off that I feel an obligation to hire first so for me, I don't think it gets supported at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Henderson. Well, and that's sort of along the line of the questions that I had, because without understanding, you know, I'm looking at, I'm looking at what's still unfunded for our own rec centers, not all of them by any means, a small portion of them. Um, we'd be looking at 7.5 million to do that. Um, and, I, and I, it's really hard to respond to this without knowing where this facility would sit in that order in terms of need. Um, I, you know, I, I don't, because essentially it's the same argument about whether or not we're going to be able to open these things this year. So, Mr. Smythe, do you have any thought about, I, 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 I'd almost prefer to defer this question to that discussion so that we can put it into the mix of all the rec centers if this is serving that purpose in that area, then I think we need to understand in that priority list and not as a standalone. So any thoughts about that? Just a couple of points, and then maybe I'll ask Mr. Jeffney to weigh in. Um, certainly, I mean, the data that we have shows the Castle Downs Y um, attracts about 270,000 people per year, and O'Leary is maybe uh, 140, 150 in that range. So it's, it's, they, they do have a, a larger kind of user base, if you will. Um, but it's, it's a point well taken in terms of how do, how do those uh, sort of weave in. The, the other point, I guess, is the, um, with city facilities, you know, it probably shouldn't be expressing exactly this way, but there is the tax levy to sort of backstop um, public recreation facilities. Um, the Y doesn't have that, that, that option. So they will be... Um, really in uh, in dire straits um, if they don't get this kind of support. Roger, maybe you want to weigh in. Sure. Councillor, we certainly see them as our partners in providing public recreation in that part of the city and then in the places where the otherwise are. Um, they do have fixed costs. And as a charity, they don't really have any other way to cover those fixed costs through 2021. So we think of them as a network. And I certainly appreciate the comments about wanting to hire our staff back and, and get them employed. But... Uh, as we look at trying to provide those recreation opportunities either directly or through our partners. Um, no, I'm not asking I'm not asking about wanting to hire our staff back. I would want to make sure that as we use the money that we have to reopen facilities that we would that we do them that we do them on a priority basis about the ones that make most sense to open first. So I it uh, my concern is actually more regional than anything else. Um, that understanding that we have facilities all over the city that are closed that we may or may not get to reopen, I'd prefer to make it part of that discussion um, than, uh, than do it as a, a one-off understanding we still don't know if we can open facilities in other parts of town. Quite apart from whether there are facilities or the wise facilities, I think the question is with the limited resources we're going to have this year to get facilities open that we that we, and you, you, you're you already using a priority list, I presume, in terms of which ones you're gonna to recommend to us when, um, that this seems to be to make more sense as part of that prioritization, quite apart from who owns it. And I, so I guess that's the question I'm asking. So we wouldn't, that priority list. When we identified the, the six f facilities that we would recommend opening, we certainly took in consideration that uh, the why being part of that list and where they're at geographically, the other facilities, um, not knowing what council would decide or not wanting to presume what they would decide, but it would rank up there. I mean, the other consideration was as our partner, and again, as a, as a charity, their ability to sustain this throughout the year uh, and not wanting to put them in a position where they're looking at permanent closure or turning, you know, having to sell the land and, and turn the facility back to the city. So trying to keep our partner whole 
was one of the considerations as well. And I think what it boils down to, Councillor, is when we look at Grand Trunk going down for a few months, as Councillor Eislinger said, um, you know, sort of comparing and contrasting O'Leary with Castle Downs. And and for the at least the initial part of the next year, which of those two facilities would we is best is best to, is best to um, open? And that's the question I'm asking. Uh, you know, that that's the question I'd prefer to be able to answer here. And then at such time as we this, at this point, none of them are opening. At this point, we haven't approved any of them reopening. That's right. So I, I would prefer to put this, and I'm not sure there's a mechanism to do that in terms of this motion, but I'd prefer to leave this question uh, to that discussion uh, and add it into the mix of which facilities we open when. Um, and I, you know, rather than carving it off right now and really treating it differently from all the other facilities in the city, all of which are closed, or most of which are closed. Anyway, I'm out of time. I'll listen to the rest of the debate. Councillor McKean. Yeah, I think I'm just going to speak to this. Um, first of all, I want to thank John for putting the motion on the floor. Um, I see this, from what I know, as an integral um, facility and amenity in the north side in that region. And, um, and what I think I know is that it serves a broad population, but particularly a vulnerable population and young population. The YMCA uh, has a historic record in this town uh, of helping vulnerable communities especially vulnerable young people and um, an amazing track record. And <clears throat> a recent motion we just passed was to look for community partners who might be interested in, in, in um, perhaps uh, partnering or operating some of our facilities. And the, and the Y has stepped up and done that in several parts of our city. And what I, what I've heard here is they've, already had to subsidize this Y out of the operations of the other ones. And so, um, and in my experience in dealing with them, I've never felt like I was ever being lobbied um, inappropriately or, or, or they're being pushy for bucks. They do good work. And when they come asking for something, uh, I listen intently and take it very seriously because, again, their track record in Edmonton is exemplary. And, and they do work that – and operate facilities at, at, at a cost that the public sector probably could not come close to. So a million dollars is a lot of money. But um, relatively speaking, in our, in our entire recreation budget, it's not a lot of money right now. And I think given the population it serves, I think it would be a tragedy to not uh, or to see the Castle Downs YMCA have to close because the YMCA couldn't afford to keep it uh, operating. So I'll, I will be voting in favor of this million dollar injection uh, of funds into a, um, a really trusted and valuable partner. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Banga. Thank you. Uh, I know that this uh, uh, Y sell, uh, serves uh, a community that's, uh, that has uh, demographics of, uh, I guess, a vulnerable uh, community, and uh, those people definitely need us. Uh, I guess some assistance, but at the same time, well, uh, YMCA is uh, helping these folks along to incorporate them into into the community, and a lot of them are newcomers to our city. And uh, I do have some the same kind of concerns as uh, uh, Councillor Henderson there. Um, that why are we treating one facility different um, than others? But uh, 
uh, I know that area pretty well because I did used to work in that area with uh, in my previous employment and uh, if uh, any area needs uh, any of these facilities that is one area and uh, before I yeah I would be voting yes for it and uh, again uh, my question about uh, probably to the to the administration is should it be uh, appropriated financial stabilization or should it be just uh, financial stabilization reserve this this one uh, is a COVID eligible cost, um, unlike the other one we were talking about. So, um, so I think appropriated is appropriate. Okay, fair enough. Then I'm good. Thank you. Sorry, I just realized that question was for administration. They're nodding and smiling. So, yes, I just need yes to for answer. Banga. I don't care who gives it. Okay, uh, Councillor Paquette. I'm smiling. Uh, yeah, so just to clarify, uh, we get made whole on this. Is that right? Sorry, Councillor, we get... Do we get made whole on this? Like, do we get... Uh, uh, we can use alternate uh, COVID uh, relief to uh, offset this cost? Well, we use the appropriated FSR, which is um, comprised of most money and other funding that's been allocated based on MSP spot. Uh, yeah. Whether it's, you know, made whole probably isn't something that I would say, but there is an available funding source that supports this. I think it's... In very different words. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. And it's, to the earlier comments, it's this in relation to the other considerations um, related to supporting um, different activities during the pandemic. Right. Okay. So what we're looking at is opportunity cost, and um, I got like maybe bigger questions than this uh, uh, requires. But um, is there anything stopping us from, uh, you know, basically focusing more on city-owned facilities? Because if we did, that would increase the attendance of those facilities and bring in YMCA to offer some of the same programming that they offer. Um, is that a possibility? And would that actually end up saving us money? A tough question, Councillor. I mean, I think where Mr. Jeveny was going in terms of they really are a, a, a valuable partner and have been for a, a long time in the city. So, you know, trying to, you know, attract their users into city facilities, we, we try to not compete. We try to harmonize and, and work together to, you know, get everybody everybody else in the system who aren't, aren't coming to any facilities. So, okay, but we're talking about um, this is a lot, uh, basically a lost leader for them. Like they have to subsidize this space, so they're pouring money into this facility, um, and now they're at a million dollar deficit. And we want to give them some some money, which is great. But the pandemic is going to be ongoing. Are we going to get another ask? Are they even going to be sustainable? Are we doing them any favors, really? And and. Beside that question is the question of um, the priority-based budgeting that Councillor Henderson raised. And so I'm just trying to weigh in my mind, um, if we were to focus on this just purely as a priority-based budgeting exercise, would this be um, elevated for Council's consideration if it was coming just from administration? I, you know, I, I, it, it would be, Councillor. I mean, if, if it was a city facility, I think it would be, you know... Not, if it was a city facility, yeah. I think it would be It would be a, a recommendation we would bring to Council as a suite of, you know, high-priority facilities to reopen as we relaunch all of our rec facilities. Okay. Councillor, I, I mean, the YMCA has been whole. Uh, this particular branch, because of the subsidies they provide to the low-income members... Yeah, uh, is about four hundred fifty thousand a year, and that's been offset by the other operations. Uh, and that's not unlike our facilities in the area. Our facilities, we have about thirty percent uptake on our leisure access program, which impacts our revenue. So their model has worked with revenues from their other facilities, their other family wellness centers to offset 
those members in this one who can't afford to pay. Okay, and I guess my question is, is this the very best model to deliver those same results? Yeah, we think it's a very good partnership model. Um, no, you know, but it's been going since 1997. The their, their attendance, you know, is very good compared to uh, other facilities in the area. Their, the subsidy that they're asking is less than we subsidize city facilities in the area. So I don't want to downplay our success and the, the value of our services, but they are able to deliver a quality service in a different model. And, and the model that we're looking at exploring for many other facilities right now. Right. And no argument there. Uh, like, I think that uh, they offer great things, but really what we have to weigh here, just like we do with everything else, is what is the best model to get the best results. And if this is not it, we should know that. If, it is, if there is no way to, to get these same results using a different model and saving money or being more effective or efficient at it, then okay. But uh, that's what's unclear in my mind. Um, but I'm out of time. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Hi. Um, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to speak to the item, if that's all right. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, I respect that the, you know, the councillor is bringing this forward because it's an important part of his board. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that's, uh, that's wonderful. Um, I'm, however, not inclined to support it. Um, I think for many of the reasons that Councillor Paquette has brought up. Um, I'm not entirely clear, for instance, on um, if there will be an additional ask in future and what the outside impacts uh, of COVID on our own recreation facilities will be. Um, and I don't want to sound too defensive of that. I just, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think a lot of people would have liked to ask us for money this year and a lot of groups have been affected by the pandemic. Um, and, and I, you know, I'm conscientious that they provide a great service, but at this time I'm inclined to keep, um, uh, not to, not to support the funding request, um, because we very well may need that money for our own, for, for our own city facilities. Um, and it pains me to say that, but, uh, you know, we're not looking at a short term issue here either. So, um. Yeah, I, I appreciate this being brought forward and the request and the value of the service, just that it, it you know, it's, it, there's a lot of things to consider going into the spring as well. So that's all for me. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll just speak to this briefly. Uh, I, I think we could hazard a, um, a bit of a subject two on here, which sort of goes to the earlier point of up to 1 million because uh, what the actual number will be, I think, needs to be negotiated. I think it needs to be negotiated in the context of what's happening with our facilities. Um, I trust that that would happen. This is authorization to release up to. I think we know that there's a reserve in place for our facilities for something like $7 million worth of restart costs. We haven't appropriated that today because it's already appropriated. When we pass the budget, it's all in the appropriated reserve. And uh, so just because we haven't made that motion for the other uh, um, city facilities just yet, because it's a mugs game trying to estimate those costs, especially in light of the last 36 hours, um, I, I, think, I think we'll come back to that. And I think at that time, we would come to the conclusion that we need some money for uh, the Y, which is a longstanding partner for this site. I don't know what the number is, but this essentially appropriates up to a million within the appropriated reserve. And I think that signal uh, that sends a signal to our partners at the Y that we're going to be there for them with the reopening of the, this facility and be there for their customers who are our citizens at the same time. Um, maybe there's a subsequent motion to get a report back, maybe even a hold in abeyance on this until the release, subject to some of those other fair questions that have been asked. But uh, I think we're going to end up giving some amount of money to the Y anyway at some point to do this. And I think we're, unlike our own facilities where I'm confident that administration's already set the money aside, I can only imagine the folks at the Y with everything else that they're dealing with right now going, I really hope we get this uh, same kind of support the city's going to need to restart our facilities. Um, so I think... Um, 
I, I'm not going to put any wording on this because I trust the administration is not going to give the why more of this than is is really justified relative to the rest of the facilities, and that the any that isn't used would be released back to the the balance of the appropriated uh, essentially COVID reserve uh, uh, for other COVID related costs for the city. So I'm going to urge members of council to support this um, uh, so that the Y has a measure of confidence from the city that money has been set aside for them. Um, and uh, uh, because they, that is an organization with, with much less, much fewer options than the city has. Um, but as a partner, I think we need to be there for them right now. So um, if, if a subsequent to uh, get a report back on disposition, release, caveats, amounts, equity with other city facilities is helpful to folks or an amendment to that effect uh, helps folks have some security around this, um, I, I, I would urge that to come forward um, rather than have this go down. Um, I think that would send a, a, a very unintentionally... Um, draconian signal to our partners at the Y. Um, Councillor Paquette. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, really quickly, I just want to say that your words have uh, persuaded me. Um, I do think that it's a conversation for the future. Thank you. Thanks for that. Any other comments? Councillor Zadek to close. Yeah, thanks. Good discussion, and I'm I'd want people to be critical. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I was trying to oh, click on. Sorry. Okay. Pause. Oh, yeah. Pause. Apologies. Yeah. Um, yeah. My. Yeah. Sorry. I tried to click on, and it just was. I wasn't quick enough. I'm. I'm. I'm wondering if we could add something um, to allow for reopening at the appropriate time. If that would, as an amendment, um, I think clarify would allow us to put it into the hopper with our own reopenings and understand that we. This is a regional question as much as anything else. Um, and it, which is my concern, you know, that, that, that all the rec centers, because of this trade-offs about which rec centers we open with this money, I'd, I'd like, yeah, I think absolutely the Y needs to be part of that, unless I'm missing a piece of this puzzle. Um, I think, I think if this is a critical facility for our citizens, it should definitely be part of that discussion. Is that, but, is but that we're a not friendly... going to be able to open everything. So that that would be, and I don't know if it covers it, but that would be my suggestion for an amendment. I I, th I think it I think it does after this discussion. Um, I mean, we could check with Mr. Smythe, but let me just see with the assembly if that wording would be friendly to connect. Well, can I comment on that? It might not be friendly. Uh, okay, it sounds sounds like it's not then. So. Um, it might be, but but we're not sure. So we'll take it as a formal amendment, just so we can debate it and and keep it neat and tidy. So, Councillor Henderson, you'll move the addition of those words. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, to allow for an opening at the appropriate time. Okay. And do you want to speak to that instead of to reopen? I, I think Sorry, I already have. I you know I, can I we think take, can we yeah. take a pause, Councillor Henderson? Something is yeah. We've we've lost our connection. Can you just give me a two seconds, please? Sorry, I was sure. just trying to plow right right through it.
Come on back. Counselor, uh, uh, let's take a roll call. Just make sure we can connect with everybody again. Counselor McKean. Are we muted in here? So, yeah, we probably are. All right, looks like we're back online. Um, we'll take a roll call again and uh, carry on. Just had to reboot uh, a system in here, but we're back now. Thanks for your patience. Councillor McKean? I am here. Groovy. Councillor Nickel? Still kicking. Thank you. Councillor Paquette? I am here. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Walters? Uh, present. Thank you. Councillor Banga? Thank you, Councillor Carmel. Present. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Essinger. Present. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Present. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. I am still here. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Good evening. And Councillor McKean. Did I start with him? I am here again. Yes. Okay, still here. <laughs> awesome. Um, in, in the little downtime that we carved out there, little side conversation with administration, one option here would be that um, uh, we would have to at some point do something about the seven and a half million for the other civic rec centers. It's appropriated, but not authorized for expenditures. Uh, so it's set aside, but would need to be authorized by us because it's also like the precursor service a little while ago beyond admins delegated authority. So one way to clean up this motion that we discussed would be to uh, potentially set it at 8.5 for the reopening of up to, pardon me, up to 8.5 for the reopening uh, of civic rec centers and the YMCA uh, Castle Downs. Um, at the appropriate time. Uh, and then administration would work on the whole portfolio, including the Y. This would give the Y some certainty uh, that they will be looked after up to a certain amount. Uh, and it would allow us to signal that it's in the context of the reopening uh, strategically and as appropriate of all of the facilities. So that might be a cleanup that, that satisfies some of the other questions here and gives administration authorization to draw those funds at the time is right without having to come back to council for the other rec centers. Mr. Mayor, that, that certainly satisfies the intent of my amendment. Okay. Um, Councillor uh, Zadek, would it be friendly to you to uh, uh, take a fairly hefty amendment to, uh, to authorize all of the expenditures or would it be better to put a part two on this for the seven and a half uh, for the city portfolio. Can I make a comment first and then respond to the question? If you must. <laughs> okay. Just my hesitation and uh, what Councillor Henderson was proposing, the words made sense, but I think the intent I was having a bit of issue with and that it gets into maybe what you're proposing, Mr. Mayor, it's, it's that we have a strong partnership with the YMCA and they're saying that when COVID rules are allowed, they're ready to open and they know that there's many people that want to come to them and they just will be losing money if they open the doors right now, but they're ready to open when they open. So the idea of tying it into some grand city of Edmonton recreation scheme seems to make sense, but it's a bit paternalistic being like, well, we'll give you this, you charity, the YMCA, we'll give you your money, but we'll tell you when you can do what you want to do with it. It, it was just a little bit of like, they're ready to go. There's a community to serve. And as much as we talk about how uh, recreational opportunities are important during a pandemic, when you can safely safely go to them, I, I, I don't want this process to hold it up by a couple months. If they're ready to open, if the rules allow for them to open in February or March, I don't want this to wait till the summer. That's my thoughts. Now, I'm happy, I've got to play ball with all council. I heard some concerns. So I will accept this as friendly, but I just wanted to state that. And I, I would still prefer in a perfect world that it's disaggregated um, from this discussion about other rec centers, but that's okay. Okay, that, I, think, I think given that, uh, what I'm going to suggest then uh, is uh, that rather than up to 8.5 for both, that we uh, add a move. It, someone move an amendment to add a part two, which is parallel wording 
up to 7.5 for civic facilities uh, and that the words um, when appropriate to open uh, be added to both just to be consistent um, which would be probably a separate amendment but if it's friendly to add based on uh, have all the discussion if it's friendly to add the when appropriate uh, Councillor Henderson's wording to this and then if I can just to make it parallel but crystal clear um, someone can move the 7.5 well, I'll move the whole thing together as part of my amendment then okay so Councillor Henderson will put the uh, the 7.5 on as a part two to run in parallel Second. to this seconded by Councillor Cartmel okay we'll give clerks a moment to catch up with my freelancing <laughs> We can make it up, but if you wanted to say it again, it would be super helpful. Uh, so. Oh, hang on, Harm. I think just that up to 7.5 million be appropriated in the financial stabilization reserve for phase reopening of recreation facilities, as discussed in the report. 7.5 million, when appropriate to reopen the facilities. Yep, and when appropriate to reopen is also in in needs to be added into the uh, Castle Downs one and that that would be a negotiation and, a, and an engagement with between the city and 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 the why is the implication of that but but sensitive to what what John is saying uh, from the perspective of partnership Uh, so do we want to take Councillor Henderson's as friendly or uh, should we, is there any objection to adding that as a part two and the change in the wording? Not seeing any, then thank you for that. Um, what's before us now is uh, the two-parter with up to a million for the Y subject to working together and up to 7.5 uh, authorized by council. It's already in the budget's revenue neutral uh, for our facilities. Councilor Mayor, can we split that for voting? Yep. One, yeah. Um, okay. Um, Councilor Zadek to close on the amended yeah, motion. I think it's been a, a pretty thorough debate and um, not being influenced by the fact it's 857, but we have other business to talk about. I, I think a diversity of opinions have been expressed. I'm, I'm hoping for support on all this. I'm, I'm gl glad to where we got to, but uh, I won't speak any longer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so point one is the uh, million for, up to a million for uh, Castle Downs YMCA reopening from the appropriated financial stabilization reserve when appropriate. Please vote on part one. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you. We're just sending the vote out. We've got yours, Councillor Katarina. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor McKean. Uh, yes. Thank you. Yep, we got all, we've got all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried 11 to 2. And then on part 2, uh, to um, authorize the use of the 7.5 from the appropriated reserve for restart of the civic facilities at the appropriate time. Please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thanks, Councillor Katerina. I'm a yes. Okay. The, has the vote just waiting for two more. And one more. Yes. Thank you. We've got all the votes. Display the vote. Carried unanimously. Okay. Uh, op 8. That uh, Councillor Banga. 
the CIOG motion, or pardon me, community investment grant. Councilor Banga? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I move that the reduction strategy number 42, elimination of the community investment grant program, uh, 3.7 million, included in attachment three of FCS 00078, be added back to the operating budget in 2021 on a one-time basis, funded through the amounts set aside in financial strategies as a result of diverting monies from the EPS budget through previous council decisions on July 7, 2020. Thank you. Uh, did you want to speak to it any further? Yes, I, I'll uh, briefly introduce it. Um, these uh, organizations, even though they don't have mega budgets, but they do uh, do have a very critical function in in supporting the communities. Uh, this is uh, especially the communities where it's a uh, low socioeconomic. Um, Areas and also in uh, helping the uh, helping out uh, the newcomers and uh, by taking uh, uh, the money that is uh, I guess made available by EPS uh, that we still need to figure out how and where to use it. It's sitting there and. Uh, in the meantime, it would be helping somebody, and it's only one uh, one time for uh, 2021 until we actually figure out how we are going to, uh, I guess, bring those changes as far as uh, EPS and uh, community is concerned. Uh, till then, I am. Uh, uh, these are organizations, uh, especially this year, they um, they had uh, reasons, uh, uh, they almost had triple whammy for, uh, due to the uh, COVID-related issues. Uh, they lost most of their donations uh, because of uh, economic conditions. They lost uh, uh, their uh, smaller uh, amounts of uh, a return from uh, uh, from the registration, etc. Th those are subsidized registrations, and finally, now uh, they 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 were just told, uh, I guess, uh, lately that uh, they're not going to be getting this money. So, and this is for them, a lot of them. It is such a short notice that if they shut down for now, they will never be able to uh, start them again. So uh, we uh, we need um, uh, these organizations. Uh, we need to support them, and they do valuable work. And I'm uh, asking everybody to support it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McKean. Yeah, uh, Councillor Banga did a fantastic job of explaining um, the need for this uh, program. Uh, and we heard from people in the community about the, its importance at a real grassroots level and some of the important work that's being done. My only concern is the, uh, the EPS savings. And uh, maybe I'm wrong but I wondered if it was being directed at some point towards our supportive housing goals. And I wondered, uh, I think I heard that, but um, I wondered if anybody had an answer to that. Councilor, I don't, I don't believe there's any specific motion in that regard. There might be a, a lens around the task force that was set up in terms of them 
um, providing some perspective on, on on that funding, but I don't believe in my files there are, there's any direction or perspective that it that it be earmarked specifically in that area. Jackie, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, I'm just uh, it's a good catch, Councillor McKean. There was a list of things that that money could be used for, and affordable housing was one of them. But it wasn't an, it wasn't exclusively for affordable housing. And I'm frantically trying to find that document, but it wasn't just for that. Yeah, yeah my, my memory of the motion, yeah, yeah. Councillor, is that it included a, a list of, of things, including community capacity building, which arguably these grants do. Uh, and there's no one, because it's one year, and, and because there's a request for the Community Safety and Wellbeing Task Force to give advice on what to do with the money, uh, and really it's up to the next council next fall to determine what to do with the dollars on an ongoing basis. I, I think this is not at odds with that previous direction, um, uh, and, and I don't think it fetters the task force on a go-forward basis, or even more importantly, the next council to determine on a go-forward basis what to do with the full 11. Uh, thank you very much. That, uh, that gives me comfort. Appreciate it. No problemo. Councillor Henderson. Yeah, I, I have a slight concern. I, I completely, wholeheartedly support this, um, but I and I do think there's a subsequent coming because I think this only deals with one year of this issue, and I don't think this is. I think we need a longer term solution to it. Uh, just to give a little bit of a history to this program, uh, it used to be way back before the creation of the Arts Council and certainly before the creation of the Heritage Council that all of that money came out of this program as well. So what you still have in this program is our way of supporting sports organizations as we support arts and heritage organizations, of supporting social service, uh, social, social agencies as we support those, uh, how we support our multicultural groups. Uh, th that all remained in this program um, and continued to be handled by the, um, the, the, the Community Services Advisory Board. So I, it's, you know, I think we, we had certain presentations. There's a lot that sits in here and a lot of groups, um, I think, for which it's pivotal funding that do a lot of things in the city. It is a bit of a catch-all, which is maybe part of its problem, that it's, it's making it hard for people to grasp what's in here. But I don't think that means it isn't needed. And I think, uh, we, I think there's some work needed to be done here. Maybe the sports piece should be carved off as the arts piece was 20 years ago and given to the sports council. There may be other ways of dealing with this that can make it a little bit clearer, um, everything that's in here, and that may make it easier for us to understand. But I, I completely agree with Council Vanga that I think we could be kicking a number of very diverse organizations when they're down. Um, and uh, I think they need, will need the ongoing support. This is, I mean, whether or not it's time to carve the really big organizations off and say, look, this is such a small part of your budget, you know, let's use the money. But those are all conversations that perhaps are overdue and need to happen. Um, so my only concern with this motion, understanding that, uh, that this is really money that can only be available to get us through this year, is that this doesn't mean that, that we're assuming that a year from now we can get rid of this program because I don't think that's the case. I think a lot of work has to be done to really understand what we're trying to achieve here, um, carve it out, understand that they're all different, and maybe and either say the program is working with 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 uh, with the, the, the advisory board still still doing the adjudication of it, or say we need different mechanisms to deal with this and different policy behind it. So I'm assuming if there isn't a, if there isn't a subsequent already coming up and asking that question, I believe there is, but if there isn't, I will certainly bring one forward because I think we need a longer. I, I fully support this as a one-year solution to this issue, but I think, but we will need a longer-term solution as well. And that longer-term solution, I don't believe, is getting rid of the program. I think we could do a lot of damage. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Um, just speaking briefly to this, uh, I'm, I'm glad this came forward. Uh, I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, I'll just supplement that I think it's important that we do this on a one-time basis. Uh, uh, for next year and not leave organizations in the lurch, you know, a month from now uh, who have come to rely perhaps or, or perhaps expect this funding um, while also sending a signal that that, that can't be counted on beyond 2021 because this program is uh, uh, overdue for uh, an overhaul for the reasons that have been suggested uh, and, and there's a subsequent motion that will 
uh, clarify uh, some of the uh, uh, the intents for that, and Councillor Henderson's outlined a number of those considerations too. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure it's as efficient a program as it should be for the amount of money that's in it. Uh, but I do think that the premise of community investment is critical, and we heard testimony from a number of organizations in the public hearing about uh, how much leverage the city does get out of some of these grants. And I think we need to make sure that uh, uh, further a good conversation at the audit committee the other day that we can really demonstrate that that leverage is happening for uh, most, if not all, of the dollars that are going out through this program. And and one other thing I would say is that um, sort of base operating is is gold because it's like pay as you go. It's super flexible for these organizations, and I get why they why they have come in some cases to rely on it, why it does produce leverage. Um, but but on the other side, I think we do need to look in in a space that is quite fractured in certain sectors, uh, at whether we are propping up um, organizations that could benefit from some consolidation and some efficiencies uh, and some synergies, uh, both on the sports side and on the community side. And, and that's not for us to, to mandate, but it's also not for us to unintentionally perpetuate um, uh, the current situation. So I think the, the annual review gives a chance for that, find the right amount, find the right program. Maybe it needs more investment. Maybe the uh, reappropriated dollars here are a good on, ongoing funding source. I think it's too soon for us to say uh, that without hearing from lots of other folks who have their work cut out for them um, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the subsequent motion. So uh, uh, thank you for bringing this forward um, and uh, I'll certainly support it. Any other comments? Councillor Banga to close. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you summed it, up, uh, summed it up really good. And these organizations, uh, uh, they do that important work that sometimes is probably not fully exposed uh, to either to the city or to the uh, near to the out to the I guess mainstream. Uh, but they do uh, definitely a commendable job. And uh, sure, um, uh, I agree that uh, this uh, uh, issue has to be looked at. Uh, I guess the uh, subsequent motion would uh, address the overhaul of this situation. But in the meantime, they only found out about a month or so ago that uh, these folks were not getting that money which they for some reason uh, or well, I guess obvious reason they they come to rely on and uh, I would say uh, with the 